The story begins hard. A bruised boy runs, staggering. Every breath he takes is pain. Tears roll down his cheeks, but he doesn't give up, forcing himself to keep going. He stumbles, falls to the cold ground, each blow reverberating with pain. One word echoes in his mind, mother. This word becomes a force, causing him to rise again. Completely exhausted with clenched teeth, he fights the pain. He finds the last strength to continue the journey. The night and the cold forest only increase the horror. The body screams in pain. The legs do not obey. Everything blurs in the eyes. Falling down again, he mentally searches for an answer from his mother, but she is nowhere to be found. The eyes are almost closed, but the figures near the tents are visible ahead. The only thought is to tell the elder about the terrible injustice. People notice him and immediately rush to help. They lift him up and drag him to the elder, trying to save him. The boy, having gathered the remaining strength, shouts about the offense, ignoring the pain. In front of the elder, he stands, and the pain pierces him with a silent cry. All he wants is for the older man to soothe his heartache. By the lake, people rest, catching a moment of silence. The son sits opposite his father, desperately seeking forgiveness. He explains that he had no idea who that girl was, the culprit of everything. The father mockingly said that it was a shame for a young man to bow his head to a woman. Other people supported him, advising him not to worry about such trifles. They said that the young manager still has a lot to learn to be a leader. Suddenly, everyone was drawn to the rude word freaks thrown around. A boy who had survived the cold night stood in front of them with a look of complete determination. He begged for the life of his sister, whom these people had taken away. The chief, with a mocking smile, asked if they were so helpless that they couldn't handle the boy. One of them grabbed his sword, promising to deal with him now. The chief stopped him, noticing that the boy had not come alone. Kang Jin stood behind him, his eyes burning with determination. He was searching for the truth. Jin approached, his presence stopping everyone, and he calmly asked for no delay. The boy resolutely climbed the stairs without stopping for a moment. His gaze was confident, and Jin behind him was ready to clean things up. When they entered, their powerful energy filled the space. The chief stood up, introduced himself as Mr. Mora, head of the Ten Thousand Fist Clan, and bowed. Jin asked the boy if this man was to blame for his suffering, and he looked carefully at the people present. Suddenly the boy recognized the culprit and pointed to him. It was Mora's son. The tension grew, and the air felt the pressure of all eyes on him. Jin stared intently at his son, realizing that the problem was coming from him. Mr. Mora spoke first, asking Jin who he was and why he was interfering. Jin calmly stated that he represented the Li Dynasty Criminal Police and was investigating. At first, Mr. Mora thought that Jean held an even higher position. He explained that it was just a family conflict, about which he had already informed the head of the entrance. Mr. Mora tried to smooth things over by inviting Jean to join them for a drink. It was now up to Jin to decide whether it was a small thing. The heir now had to go with Jin because the matter had become serious. Enraged, Mr. Mora hit the table, recalling the rule, The crown and the wall are inviolable. This rule symbolizes an alliance where the warriors of Murim and the Crown do not interfere in each other's affairs. Jin smiled, admitting that he enjoyed these challenges. His calm caused cold horror in those present. Tension was felt in the air. Some thought that Jin seemed almost insane. So cold was his reaction. Jin came closer, asked the little one if he was happy, hinting at the escalation of the situation. He noted that these people deliberately ignore the law without even hiding it. And if they do so, others may follow their example. Jean once again turned to Mora, asking if she did not consider his words to be a dereliction of duty. Mora felt that the police detective was not worth his attention. Jin agreed, and bluntly said that he usually doesn't hang out with the likes of Mora. These words caused an immediate reaction. Everyone drew their weapons, preparing for action. They thought that Jin had lost his fear and brazenly crossed the line. They should have been more careful about throwing insults because they didn't know who they were dealing with. Jin calmly asked them to bow their heads, drawing only sneers. Drawing their swords, they taunted, believing that Jin had finally lost his mind. One of them charged, firing a discharge in front of Jin, but Jin remained steadfast. Not only were they interfering, but they were openly trying to harm. So Jin acted instantly. He stood confidently, holding out his hand to the swordsman, ready for an answer. With a wave of his hand, Jin released a wave of energy that rushed at the enemy. A stream of wind engulfed the swordsman, controlling his movements, stopping his every step. Jin lifted him into the air like a marionette with no effort. He directed it towards a wooden post, where the swordsman crashed with a deafening crash. The swordsman flew straight into the pillar like a toy soldier smashed into solid wood. The impact was so strong that the pillar almost broke apart from the impact. The sight was stunning. Everyone who saw it froze in shock. Mora understood that the situation was critical. 
and Jean was not kidding at all. He rushed to his warrior, who lay powerless like a shadow of himself. But Jin wouldn't let him go, continuing to maintain control. He made the swordsman fall face down to the ground, literally kissing her. As he fell, the swordsman caught Mora, hitting him on the arm. Mora looked over and saw his fighter unconscious on the floor. Jin coolly stepped over the body and approached it. But the worst thing was that his smile, which increased the threat, did not disappear. Mora, in a panic, ordered all the fighters to destroy Jin immediately. They rushed at him with various weapons, swords, spears, ready for battle. Jin stood calmly in the center, waving his hand and concentrating his aura. The wind rose around him, as if nature was preparing to support him. A moment, and every fighter flew out of the gazebo like leaves blown by the wind. Those who were closer to the lake fell into the water, receiving unexpected refreshment. Others fell to the ground, beating their lungs out and screaming in pain. Mora trembled, not knowing what to do next. His son was standing next to him, silently wondering, is Mora going to not give him up? Jean gave him a choice, give up his son or fight to the last. Father and son looked at each other, both confused, not knowing what to do. They were at a stalemate, but Mora tried to distract him by saying that Jean had gone too far. Jin emphasized that it was time to choose, betray his son or continue the fight. Mora took up his sword, the situation gained new tension. Jin asked, how can you call yourself a father raising a sword against the innocent? And Mora, holding the sword, realized that he would not defeat Jin. Suddenly, people appeared who brought a new twist to events. A short man with a funny expression walked in front, followed by warriors with spears. It was the head of the entrance, who was immediately happy to see Mora, blaming Jin for the chaos. The head of the entrance, Hyun, approached, greeting Mr. Mora as a senior in rank. He said that if Mora had just sent one man, he would have met him and asked for forgiveness without bringing the situation to such a conflict. Hyun's appearance turned everything upside down and it seemed that the situation was finally starting to resolve itself. It was a bit sad, because Jean could have shown the kid a real grand spectacle, but unfortunately he didn't have that opportunity, because he could have gone to jail for that. Jin calmed the boy down, explaining that even under the law, killing his older sister was punishable by death. The heads of the culprits will surely fly off their shoulders on the guillotine, and justice will be done. Watching the boy, Jin realized that Hyun was actually in charge of the entrance, as the head was kneeling in front of him and begging for forgiveness. This time, Jin agreed to believe his words and accept the apology. Suddenly a man appeared and informed Jin that he had received an urgent letter from his home. He handed the letter straight into Jin's hands without a moment's delay. Jean opened the letter and began to read, carefully looking at each word. Suddenly, the expression on his face changed dramatically. Something in the letter really confused him. Jin immediately asked this man to find everyone who was involved in the case and bring them all to court and he himself promised to check everything carefully again. He patted the boy on the head once more and explained that there were urgent matters that he needed to attend to immediately. The boy sincerely thanked the elder for helping him and his family, and in the same instant, Jean disappeared in front of him, as if dissolving into thin air, disappearing quickly and skillfully. The boy shouted after him, promising that he would repay him for such mercy as soon as he could. After a while, Jin was already at home, his heart beating faster with worry. He entered the house where his teacher was lying on the bed, sick and weak. Jean immediately ran over to him, anxiously asking how he was, trying to figure out what was wrong with him. How are you feeling? He asked carefully, not taking his eyes off the teacher. Kang Jin, I'm really worried because you don't understand how this world works and you keep showing your teeth to everyone. The teacher replied with a slight reproach. Be more careful and watch out for those with swords, he advised, looking at Jin with concern. You must learn to recognize such people because it can save your life, the teacher added. He explained that the method is simple. If someone doesn't have enough money, it can still be a good person. But a swordsman who does not care about money has every chance to be dangerous and ruthless. Think, have you ever seen powerful people starve to death? Or that the powerful can't get what they want? The logic of this world is that the powerful have their way unhindered. But even powerful warriors who suffer from lack of money live fairly reasoned the teacher. Those who are not strong at all are only looking for money to rob the weak. Remember that, he finished, and Jin agreed, asking only to remain calm. The teacher smiled. Am I not a great teacher? Even though the human mind is unknowable, I teach you how easy it is to understand. Jin again agreed. But now he asked only one thing, that the teacher would not leave him. He begged him to live a long life. Long live so you can see me get married, Jin said with a smile, hoping for the best.
The teacher hearing this began to stand up and smiling asked, Are you serious now? But the question was about something else. Did Jin really think that his teacher was dying and would soon go to the other world? Ah, you insolent face. I'm still in the prime of my life, and you're already ready to order me a coffin, replied the teacher indignantly. Then Jin realized that he had been in such a hurry for nothing when he heard that his teacher was lying in a sick bed. He was shocked when the old man, who usually didn't act like this, suddenly took on a serious expression and began to ramble on about how worried he was. The teacher explained that he had just not slept for several nights and was very tired, so he decided to rest for a while. Besides, he spent too much time lying down. First the cards, then the dominoes, I see. You're not sitting here idle at all. And who is it here crunching the bones? Jin asked him jokingly. Then he asked an even more interesting question. Did the teacher really think that Jin didn't know who gave him four liana every month? Does he not know that such an amount can provide for a whole family for several months? The teacher's expression changed dramatically, and he literally shone like the sun. Oh, my beloved student, my gold! The teacher began to praise Jin, not hiding his joy. But John continued, I can tell my father about all this and prove that you are a real charlatan. The conversation came to the point where Jean asked him to stop sitting up at night without sleep and to think about his health. He himself said that he had to go on business and would return in a few days. He also asked the teacher not to do anything stupid during this time. Jin started to walk, but suddenly his legs began to shake. And I wonder why they trembled in him. Maybe it was because he was worried about his teacher. First, it was his mentor. Secondly, he loved him. Thirdly, his wife also loved the teacher. Fourth, if the teacher dies, it will be very bad. And, fifthly, Jin promised to provide him with a luxurious life. Jin's legs must have been shaking at the thought that if he didn't keep his promise, it would not only be sad, but painful for him, because he actually worried about every promise he made. He understood that at such an age, when years are already felt, one should be very careful and protect oneself. The teacher looked at him, reasoning that every day Jin became more dangerous, stronger, and more determined. Although Jin looked good now, the teacher knew that it wasn't enough to be a real threat in this world. He understood that he had to stay with Jin for a while longer, at least until he saw him get married and have a child. The teacher thought about the fact that Jin was still a frame, and probably his child would turn out to be as crazy and unpredictable as Jean himself had been as a child. The teacher's memories took him far back, to the moment of their first meeting, when everything was just beginning. Then he walked through the forest, and having made a wrong turn, found himself on the wrong path, due to which he had to overcome many difficulties. The road leading down was incredibly difficult, and he tripped over a stone and rolled down, unable to hold on. After falling, he slowly began to open his eyes, trying to gather his strength. All scratched and beaten, the teacher, grimacing in pain, shook off the leaves and branches that attacked him during the fall. He understood that due to his age, he would have to lie still for several hours, giving his body time to recover. Suddenly, he heard a strange sound and thought for a moment that a tiger was lurking somewhere nearby, but it was only a wounded hare. Little Kang Jin stood above the hare, holding a sharp knife in his hands and staring intently at his prey. Jin swung the knife and his hand didn't even flinch a moment of determination that surprised the teacher. Then Jin began to carefully process the hair, skinning it, preparing to satisfy his hunger. All this was done quickly and harmoniously because he knew that he needed to eat to survive. The poor animal was only killed so that the genie could survive. It was a law of nature. Suddenly, Jin felt something strange, as if someone was nearby and watching him from behind the bushes. The teacher, lying behind the bushes, thought, This boy must be crazy. Why would he kill an animal if he is not even going to eat it now? He couldn't understand why Jin would do this unless there was an immediate need. At that moment, Jin turned his head, sensing the presence of someone nearby. The teacher quickly pretended to lie still and not breathing, trying not to give away his presence. But his eyes were running in different directions, as if looking for a way out of this situation. Jin slowly moved closer to the bushes, wary of what might be there. And sure enough, he saw a man lying on the ground, all scratched up and looking very awkward. The man began to moan, pretending that he was very sick, although the pain in his back was real, as if his body was being electrocuted. He really felt a strong pain in his lower back, but at the same time he tried to pretend to be helpless. Baby, what are you doing here? The man asked, hoping to divert Jin's attention. But the boy slyly answered the same question. What are you doing here? Yes, I lay down to rest for a while answered the man, trying to justify his position. But Jin noticed that the man had his hand behind his back, hiding something. 
Then Jin, with a smile on his face, asked, What's it like relaxing with a knife in your hand? What other knife? Could not understand the teacher, whose name, by the way, was Guan Nora. He explained to the boy that his back just hurt, and there was no knife. Then he introduced himself as an ordinary collector of medicinal mountain herbs. This seemed suspicious to Jean, but he slowly began to understand what was going on. If you're a herb collector, why don't you have a marjungi? Jin asked, eyeing him suspiciously. Jean took a few steps closer to Nora, making him tense up. These mountains belong to my family. We know everyone who comes here to gather herbs, Jin said confidently, looking Nora straight in the eyes. Actually, you're no herb picker, Jean said calmly, noticing how Nora was getting nervous. You're just a person running from someone else, Jin added, further emphasizing his suspicion. Nora began to protest loudly, shouting that this was not true and that he was not running away. But Jin made important arguments. If you are really a resident of these places, you should know that these mountains belong to my family. Besides, Nora's behavior only confirmed that he was hiding the truth. Nora continued to stand his ground, claiming that he was here by accident. But Jean remembered that a few months ago there were rumors about a bandit gang. Because of this, the Jin family decided to send Imperial military forces to the area for seven days. Are you one of these forces? Jin asked suspiciously. But Nora assured that he knew nothing about it and called himself an ordinary man who never evades the law. But that's not the point, Jin continued, not losing his vigilance. He was concerned about only two things on which he focused his attention. First, you're a fugitive hiding from someone in these mountains, Jin said, keeping his eyes on Nora. And what friend? Asked Nora, lying on the ground and trying to understand what the boy was leading to. Jin didn't answer directly, but only asked, What is your real purpose here? Nora, finally gathering his strength, stood up, leaning his back against a tree. This movement helped him to his feet, but he felt weak in his body. Jean, for his part, was ready for any development, holding the knife behind his back, ready. Nora noticed that John seemed to hesitate, unsure of his actions. He's still a child, Nora thought, deciding to act quickly before trouble caught up with him first. But at that moment, Jean pulls out his knife and concludes, in front of him is a mountain bandit. What the hell? He's just a kid! The thought flashed through Nora's head, but the fear of the knife in Jean's hands grew. The knife in the boy's hands disturbed Nora. He felt a threat that could not be ignored. Although Nora was physically stronger, Jean, even as a child, looked dangerous with his huge knife. Realizing that he would lose physically, Jean decided to attack first in order to gain the upper hand and win. Jeanie lunged at Nora with a knife full of determination, but with one deft move, Nora knocked the knife out of the boy's hands deflecting the attack. After that, he grabbed Jin by his clothes despite the pain in his back and showed that his physical strength was superior. He twirled the little one around his body, showing his superiority in battle. Only Jin's loud screams could be heard as he found himself in a hopeless situation. Nora gripped Jin hard and started yelling at him. You don't know what you're doing, you little bastard. They both fell to the ground, Jean lying on top of him and trying his best to wriggle free. If you see someone in trouble, shouldn't you help them? Why rush in with a knife? Nora shouted. Jin, not giving up, replied, Safety is more important than anything else. Continuing to fight, Nora tried to explain that he wasn't a threat, but Jean asked, Then why did you try to kill me? Nora assured him that he didn't mean to, but Jean continued, Even if you're not a bandit, you've still seen everything. At that moment, Nora realized that he was not an ordinary child. What did you see? Nora asked, and Jean replied, How I caught a rabbit, and you thought I was crazy. And indeed, it seems that this is a crazy little one. A thought flashed in Nora's head, but he continued to make excuses. I skinned him not for mockery, but only for survival. They began to compromise, after a few more minutes of talking, realizing that the man wasn't going to steal the rabbit from Jean. Despite this, Jean continued to try to break free, but Nora, calling him a scumbag, apologized. I'm so sorry, mistress, Jean said suddenly, and Nora was surprised at how quickly he changed his character. Nora wondered what Jean wanted to say, but he replied that even if he told everything, nothing would change. Why is everyone pointing fingers at me for no reason? I want to be with others, but they specifically stay away from me. Because of this, I usually play alone, even though I want to communicate with others, Jean admitted sadly. Nora listened attentively feeling that deep sadness was hidden in these words. Still not sure if there's something wrong with those kids, or maybe something wrong with you, Nora mused as she listened to Jean. 
Jean shared that everyone around him calls him a monster and now also crazy, just like Nora did. At that moment, they both rose from the ground, as if ending the conflict. Nora took Jean by the shoulders and told him that those people were wrong. You're not a monster or crazy, Nora assured him. Looking into his eyes, on the contrary, you are special, the most special boy in this world, he added with warmth in his voice. If you think I'm going to be afraid of you after this, you're wrong, Nora said, encouraging Jean. Then he jokingly offered to look at the rabbit together, holding his stomach and saying that he was very hungry. In front of them was a sign above the entrance to the house where Jean had led Nora inviting her inside. The architecture of this place was amazing with its incredible beauty. Every detail was refined and kept in harmony. Every corner was saturated with aesthetics and sophistication, as if it were a real work of art. Of course, Nora was surprised when he got here, because such beauty was a rarity in his life. He was in awe of the grandeur of this house, but the place didn't seem that big or special to Jin. Well, since you live so much, why don't you let your teacher stay the night? asked Nora. And Jin asked in surprise, And since when did you become my teacher? Well, we were just talking about your training, Nora replied with a smile, hinting at their recent conversation. Jean remembered that conversation, which was why he brought Nora here, even though he knew his father might not like the idea. But Nora assured him that any father would do anything to make his children happy. Jin wasn't sure his dad was willing to do anything illegal, even for him. At that moment, right next to them, his father appeared, dressed in an incredibly beautiful outfit that emphasized his status. He turned to his son with the question, Where have you been? His voice was restrained but demanding. The father also asked, And who is this man next to you? My name is Ivan Nora, Nora introduced himself, trying to look calm. I'm Lee Jio Wan, Jin's father replied with dignity. Nora explained that he happened to meet his son today and that they ended up here together. And I'd like to stay with you for a while and train him, Nora added, turning to her father with the offer. Lee looked closely at Nora and asked, If you came with my son, and I have to admit you, tell me more about yourself. Nora began his story by saying that he joined the army at the age of 16, and things went well for the first few years. After spending over 10 years there, he never found the confidence to make a living doing it, so he decided to continue honing his skills. But ten years later, he was deemed unnecessary and asked to leave the ranks of the army. So you want to stay here and train Kong Jin? asked Li with disbelief in his voice. Kang Jin isn't as simple as he seems. I'm sure you've also noticed that he's a man with a rod, Nora added, trying to convince Li of his intentions. Nora also mentioned that he met many different people during his time in the army, and some of them were very similar to Jin, having a similar inner core. Are you sure you can do this? Lee questioned, eyeing Nora suspiciously. Nora answered firmly, yes, and explained that his desire was to set Jin on the right path. He meant that since there was nothing to do anyway, he could at least be useful by helping the boy develop. After a while, they were already standing together, teacher Guang Nora and his new student, Kong Jin. The boy quickly realized that Nora's words were not empty promises. Now, he would really be his teacher. Jin realized that this had become a reality, and now their training began. During their conversation, Jin told Nora about his father, his status and influence, which was already obvious to Nora. However, he did not expect that Jin's father would allocate such a wonderful house to him. My father is very good at people and doesn't waste money on the wind. But despite that, he gave you a place to stay and even sent a servant. That means you really have something, Jin said. As Nora continued to speak, Jean admitted that he only half believed him, because to look at you, you'd never say you're the type to teach someone, he said, looking at Nora. The word type visibly upset the teacher, and he decided to start with a lesson on manners. Nora warned that if Jean spoke rudely, it would be difficult for him to make friends among people. But I told the truth, Jean insisted, and then Nora simply patted him gently on the head. He asked, are looks that important anymore? People have a tendency to judge others by their clothes, but that's misleading. But Jean had his own point of view. If you don't know what kind of person is inside, you can only judge by the appearance and nothing else. Well, if that's the case, then you still can't say such things openly. Language should always be beautiful, Nora replied. After these words, Jin agreed to listen to the teacher and asked why he was going to teach him. Looking at you, it doesn't look like you've read many books, Jin quipped and Nora just laughed out loud in response. Nora explained that he would not teach Jean from books and tell stories about famous adults. Jean thought that Nora, as he had said before, would only teach him how to live in society. 
But Nora, squatting opposite, explained that in life it is enough to know your name, and he intends to teach Jean everything he knows. Although I'm not in the top five, the accumulated knowledge about the world is enough for several years of study. Jean began to suspect that Nora would live off his family for several years, like a vermin. Nora assured him that he wasn't that kind of person, but that was exactly what Jean saw in him. The teacher sensed that Jin did not trust him, but offered to prove it in practice by showing him what he would teach him. Let's see what I can teach you, Nora suggested. But at that moment, Nora once again asked where it was possible to eat here. After a while, they went outside, looking for a place to have lunch. In Jin's hand was a small chicken that was squealing softly as it looked at its master. This chick was looking at Jin, and he was looking at him. And at that moment, the boy had a strange thought in his head. The teacher turned to Jin, noticing his thoughtfulness. He explained that the chicken was a living thing and asked Jean to be gentle with him. Jin asked, But what's all this for? Not understanding why the teacher attached such importance to it. The teacher asked him to guess for himself. And Jean assumed that Nora wanted him to decide for himself how to dispose of the chickens as he saw fit. You fool! You're not even closing your eyes! Now you're going to drill this chick right through with your gaze, said the teacher, looking at Jean. Then what should I do? Jin asked, unsure of how to proceed. The teacher asked him to think and strain his coils. He explained that he didn't give him the chick so that Jean would finish him off. Jin tried to understand why the teacher gave him a chick, and his thoughts were reduced only to the fact that the chicken should be eaten. Watching this, the teacher noticed that Jin did not know such a thing as raising a chicken. Even Jin himself did not deny that he only saw the bird as a snack and saw no other options. The teacher got down on one knee in front of Jin and asked, what will this chick be when she grows up? A chicken, answered Jin, and then the teacher suggested that he raise a bird to become a chicken. At that moment, Jin realized that he hadn't thought about the possibility of raising a chicken, and it made him a little sad. He even asked the teacher if the other 100% of people would say that you should raise a bird and was a little upset at his inattention. The teacher explained that if you don't think like that, you can stay lonely for the rest of your life. Taking Jin's hand, he continued, If your hand is cold now, if you hold it a little longer, it will get warmer. Don't be in a hurry. The teacher invited Jin to think about it more deeply and not to make hasty decisions. Then he told Jin about one person who always told him, It's not weird to be special. But, even compared to this person, you look ordinary, said the teacher, confidently adding that Jin could find a common language with other people. This meant that Jin had the potential to be special, but also normal in his relationships with others. And the teacher was confident that he could help him find his way. Jin assumed that the person the teacher was talking about, just like him, could not find a common language with society. But this was not the case. The teacher explained that the man, on the contrary, got along well with people and was very intelligent. If such an unusual boy like him was able to live among people, then you can too, encouraged Jin's teacher, proving that anything is possible. To do this, according to the teacher, Jin needed to learn how to take care of a chicken until it grows into a hen and begins to lay eggs. It was a lesson in patience and responsibility. It is important that you are trusted with life, even if it is the life of a small chicken. Taking responsibility for someone is a big task, the teacher explained. This was the first teaching and task from the teacher, which Jin had to fulfill without fail. The genie was feeding the chicken, and it was happily running around, not paying attention to the food. He even spoke to him like a human being, asking, Why don't you eat? But of course, there was no answer. Looking at the cat running along the fence, Jean decided that it was the cat that was scaring the chicken and preventing it from eating. This was a mistake. In fact, there were many other factors around that John should have been concerned about. Annoyed and frustrated, Jin grabbed a rock and hurled it at the cat, trying to force the problem. But it only served to accentuate his impatience. Jin did not understand at all why he needed to do this not finding meaning in his actions. He thought, why should I worry about a bird that doesn't even eat properly? Why bother about such things at all? Very quickly, he got tired of all this. And the main question that arose in his mind was, what will I get as a result? Why should I do all this for some worthless animal? This thought finally drove him out of his mind. The genie, overcome with irritation, began to move towards the chicken, determined to do something about it. The defenseless chick just pecked at the floor and squealed, not suspecting anything. Jin burst into the room ready to finish off the bird. But at that moment, the teacher's hand firmly grabbed his collar, stopping him suddenly. What the hell? Jin asked indignantly, turning his head to look at Nora. 
Nora held him tightly, preventing him from even moving, and reminded him of what he had said earlier. You must definitely complete the task I gave you, the teacher reminded. His voice was stern but calm, and in a moment the bird was safe, protected from Jin's rush. The teacher showed by his own example how to treat a bird with care and understanding. This worthless creature kept squealing and discriminating against me, Jin thought, irritated by her behavior. I guess that's why you were going to kill her, suggested the teacher, looking carefully at Jin. But Jin objected and said that it wasn't, though his face gave off a different emotion. The teacher couldn't help but notice that it was all written on Jin's face, even though he denied his intentions. Jin repeated several times that this was not the case, trying to dismiss the suspicions. But the teacher understood that this was only the beginning and knew that Jean still had a lot to learn. The teacher asked Jean to take care of the bird seriously, to which the boy shrugged and said that he would try and do whatever was necessary. The teacher expressed his confidence that John will definitely cope with this task. After that, he asked to stop discussing this topic because it was already clear what needs to be done. Suddenly, Jin's feet came off the ground, completely catching him by surprise. The teacher lifted him in his arms, explaining that all his words were only for the benefit of Jin. I will do this every time you get annoyed said the teacher, picking him up again. Jin felt goosebumps on his body because it was unpleasant and caused him discomfort. The teacher, seeing Jin's reaction, said, On the contrary, it's great that you got goosebumps, because it's a sign that you're an ordinary person. If I teach you step by step, everything will work out, he added, hoping for Jin's gradual progress. Time passed, and the teacher was standing outside with a not very happy expression on his face, noticing that something had gone wrong with the growth of the chick. The genie sat holding a chicken with feathers flying off, clearly indicating neglect. The teacher shouted at him loudly, causing Jin to turn sharply. Jin pretended to forget that he had to raise a chicken. It became clear that verbal control alone is not enough for such a task. But the teacher chose the teaching methods adequately, realizing that the things that make people call Jin a monster remain natural for him, like eating or going to the toilet for others. But for Jin, these things seemed mandatory almost like an inevitable part of his being. The teacher realized that he needed to invent a new approach to his teaching. Time passed, and they found themselves in a forest among the mountains. Nora sat under a tree, sipping alcohol. Jin approached him with a question. Are you doing anything here at all? Surprised that Nora does nothing. Earlier, the teacher ordered Jin to run to the top of the mountain, but he sat there drinking himself while Jin's energy overwhelmed him. He wanted to know the logic in the teacher's actions but Nora reminded him of Jean's promise to follow his instructions. I won't tell you the reason, it's your punishment for not keeping your promises, Nora explained, leaving Jin guessing. But as soon as Jin began to get angry and protest, the teacher again reminded him of his own words and promises. Jin only gritted his teeth, realizing that he would have to do as Nora said. Then Nora ordered him to run once more to the top of the mountain and back. If he makes it in four hours, he will be able to ask one question. Otherwise, all questions will be banned. Jin looked up at the mountain, ready for the challenge. Unwilling to give up, he immediately ran towards the top, exerting all his strength. The teacher approached training with professionalism, keeping Jin in shape. After some time, Jean stood in front of Nora again, with visible signs of fatigue but ready for new challenges. Nora waved his hand, making it clear that Jean had to run to the top again. Although Jin protested and grumbled, he ran anyway, still having the strength to resist. Daily training twice a day including climbing a mountain made the teacher wonder about the boy's endurance. The next day, Jin stood staring ahead, not quite understanding what he saw before him. Nora stood with a stick over his shoulder, explaining that they were going to practice drawing lines. He drew a stick on the ground, drawing the character Chon. The hieroglyph was drawn clearly, and Nora explained its meaning. Just, right, straight. Jin, with a drop of incomprehension in his eyes, looked at this hieroglyph, trying to understand its meaning. What does this mean? He asked the teacher, still not fully understanding the purpose of this training. But Nora came back and simply said to Jean, Repeat after me. Jean was so eager to get his questions answered that he was willing to do whatever the teacher asked. He took a stick and began to draw a line, trying to repeat the actions of the teacher. However, the line turned out to be uneven, much to Jin's dismay. Annoyed, he began to beat the ground with his stick, but continued to try again and again. After a while, Nora, who was sitting under a tree drinking alcohol, heard Jean exclaim that he had finally succeeded. However, when the teacher came over and looked at the work, he called it nothing at all, much to Jean's dismay. Comparing his work to that of a teacher, Jean realized that his lines were indeed far from ideal. But, looking at how masterfully the teacher worked, understanding began to come to Jin. 
he picked up the stick again and continued to draw, not backing down from the task. After a dozen unsuccessful attempts, Jin even began to ask the teacher to have mercy on him. Then Nora lifted him up in his arms and asked, Do you know what this hieroglyph is? Jin replied that he only knew the name, Chon. And what does Chon mean? The teacher continued. Justice, correctness, directness, answered the little one. This was the correct answer, and the teacher praised him by patting him on the head. At the same time, he admitted that he himself is not very smart and only knows how to write the character Chon and two characters of his name. However, the people who came up with these characters were not that simple. Before writing the character Chon, they thought carefully about its meaning. Nora explained, stressing the importance of understanding before action. The teacher asked Jin to look carefully at the character for Chon and explained, This character consists of the upper stroke, which means one, and the lower part, which means the end, and think. After these explanations, John agreed with the teacher, realizing the importance of this hieroglyph for his life. If he wants to make friends with people, he should think about how his words and actions will be perceived by others. And this does not mean adapting to others at all, because there is no point in doing so if you are sure that you are right. Since Jin was an unusual person, he should have shown more concern for others, and that was exactly what the teacher meant. After that, he handed him the stick again. From now until noon, you will climb the mountain. And in the afternoon, you will write this hieroglyph with the right thoughts, said the teacher. Jean went down and up again and again, doing both tasks. While writing the hieroglyph, he noticed that his lines were not as smooth and beautiful as the teacher's. The teacher said, Your lines are a reflection of your soul. They are crooked and not very beautiful. But they are a part of you. The little one asked again, Does this mean that I am crooked? But the teacher explained that he could not know that. But I do know one thing. You're trying to make your line straighter now, said the teacher, adding to Jin's motivation. It won't be easy. You'll have to use all your lower body strength, which requires a lot of endurance, he explained. You need to reduce your energy level to such an extent that there is no energy left for strange thoughts. This is exactly what I am teaching you. Because when you spend your energy like this, you have time to look at yourself, added the teacher, revealing his philosophy. Over time, Jean will get used to repeated physical training, which will help him develop. This will allow the teacher to sip sake in peace and enjoy the moment while watching their students' progress. The morning came, and the rooster crowed loudly, sitting on the fence, waking everyone around. Nora, still not fully awake, was looking at him from the window, distractedly watching the morning commotion. Two roosters began to fight among themselves, making a commotion. Nora was drooling, although he couldn't understand the logic, because he ate chicken every day, and it seemed strange to him. Suddenly a voice from behind made him turn around. It was Jin's father who came to his window as if waiting for a conversation. And at the same time, the owner of the house where Nora lived came to talk. After a while, they were already walking down the street, talking about Jin and his studies. Nora explained that he was trying his best to teach Jin everything he knew, but he also recognized that simple exhaustion of forces will not bring the desired result. Up until this point, Nora had thought that Jin's father didn't care about his son, but as it turned out, that wasn't the case and it was logical because the matter concerned his son. At that point, Lee stopped and explained that Nora had misunderstood his words and that he meant something else. Lee wanted to express his deep appreciation for Nora's heart and soul for Jean and his teaching. It was a pleasant surprise for Nora, and he promised not to disappoint Lee. The conversation ended between them, and the day went on as Jin continued his training hard. As befits a coach, Nora desperately coached Jean, helping him move forward by showing him how to run and push up properly. But due to the fact that it was necessary to climb high and the slope was very steep, Jin fell more than once, unable to withstand the load. But every time he got up and continued to run further, not stopping at failures, the teacher, helping him, also fell more than once, but tried not to show his weakness. It was difficult to get up, his eyes were closing from exhaustion, and Nora almost fell asleep on the spot. However, the birds running nearby woke him up, and the smell of food wafting from the side woke him up even more. They were served incredibly delicious food, kinkali, fried chicken in sauce, and many other dishes that immediately made people drool. Why not work as such a coach, thought Nora, looking at the food with appetite. He ate with great pleasure, putting his whole soul into the process. Do you like it? Jin asked as he moved closer as he watched his trainer enjoy his meal. Jin was training, and his trainer was just sitting around eating, and it was a little annoying to him, but Nora invited him to join the meal. 
However, the food no longer looked as appetizing as when it had just arrived. To Jin, it looked like dog food, but the teacher did not think so, because he himself would not eat something so unsuitable. After another refusal from Jean, Nora did not try to convince him, thinking, I'll get more. And with an impudent smile, he quickly began to eat everything that was left. Jin watched in disgust as Nora ate, but his stomach grumbled loudly with hunger. After such fatigue, he decided to sit down and did not even pay attention to the appearance of the food. Hunger took its toll. When you're that hungry, any food is a dime a dozen, John thought, though he couldn't shake his distaste for what Nora was eating. But still, Jean said that he would like to have a separate portion of food collected for him, which Nora did not understand, because he thought that everything was so good. In fact, the teacher had planned this on purpose. Sharing a meal was the easiest and most effective way to teach Jean to share with others. During the meal, Jean raised the question, How am I going to walk the distance from the top to here in two hours? The teacher replied that it used to take six hours in the beginning when they first started training. But now, it takes about four hours. For Jin, it was all boring and difficult. Besides, he had no energy left for anything else. Hearing this, Nora just smiled, realizing that the goal was to squeeze more energy out of Jin. However, Nora understood that training should not become boring, especially after two months of non-stop mountain running. He was aware that it was important to keep Jin interested without letting him lose motivation. The evening had already come, and they were sitting under a tree. And Nora, as usual, continued to torment his student. They joked with each other, calling each other idiots, but it was all in good nature. At this moment, the teacher suggested looking ahead and enjoying the beauty of the night, when there was only a half moon in the sky, as if someone was fishing for stars from it. And of course, at this point, Nora thanked Jean for following his instructions and listening to his advice. But Jin replied, I just don't want you to start grumbling again if I do something wrong. Minds need to be trained too, Jin said, reflecting on his development. Of course you should, replied Master Nora, supporting the idea. Jin, tired from the hard training, said, It's all very exhausting and difficult, but whose hand, if not the coach's hand, will encourage and explain how important it is not to give up. Achieving your goal is always not easy, and not only you, but others are making the same efforts, the teacher encouraged. Hearing these words, Jin began to understand that he must continue to work hard. At this point, the teacher asked, Do you remember the story about my friend who was very similar to you? Nora decided to tell more, then my friend said, it was incredibly difficult, as if to death. But I learned the truth. To get one thing, you have to give up something else. These were the words of his friend. As his teacher, Nora promised, I will always be there to remind you of this and support you, even if your hands are down. Running uphill and making circles is also part of Nora's philosophy, which helps develop endurance and willpower. After that, Nora stood up and holding Jin in his arms proudly explained, Usually the brain controls the body, but when the body reaches its limit, the situation changes. Then it becomes a matter of endurance, and willpower starts moving you. In Nora's opinion, Jean lacked these two qualities, and that is why he is now learning the simplest method, building up stamina and will. Never get close to those who, instead of taking action, just lick their tongue, advised Nora. After these words, he began to laugh loudly and again torture Jin, lifting him up. Jin, desperately fighting back and kicking, begged for the tenth time. Don't touch my face. It was morning, and Jin was working out in his yard, doing his usual morning exercise moves. This workout could be called a simple workout, but it was an important part of the day for Jin. There was only one thought in his mind. The teacher is melting again. But he still made Jin come here every day. Despite this, Jin performed incredible stunts, surprising even himself. For his age, his skills seemed almost unreal. He stood on his hands with ease, demonstrating strength and flexibility. Sweat dripped down his face and onto the tile, but he didn't stop training. Even Jin himself realized that although it was difficult, it was ultimately more fun than boring lectures and vows. He mentioned his private school Bright Eye, where classes were held. Academician Jung and Moon sat at his desk, surrounded by mountains of books, watching Jin intently. Sitting across from him was Jin, who looked a little distracted and tired after his workout. You haven't read anything again, have you? The academic asked Jin, looking at him carefully. Jin only answered in silence, his head down. Why the hell aren't you doing this? Young and Moon asked sharply, not understanding why Jin was not completing the task. But Jin remained silent, not saying a word, and lowered his head even lower. He did not know what to answer, because his thoughts were far from studying, focused on other, more important things for him. 
The academic perfectly understood that if he had not placed such high hopes on Jin, then he would not have felt such disappointment now. It seemed to him that he had found an outstanding talent, but with the passage of time his disappointment only grew. Say at least something, the academician begged. But Jean was afraid that any word he said would only provoke another outburst of the teacher's anger. The academic asked Jin to try, as this question was not only about himself. If Jin didn't try, it would affect both of them, and people would think badly not only of the student, but also of his mentor. Jin didn't know why he should try, and he didn't even understand all the teachings which he honestly told the academician. Speak more specifically, demanded the academician, banging his hand on the table, trying to get a clear answer from Jin. Jin sighed and replied, that's all, that's all I can say. This enraged the academician, and he ordered Jin to go to the penance room to reflect on his behavior. The academic himself pondered whether to expel Jin from the school, as his behavior was destroying the spirit of learning among the other students. He understood that Jin was a bad influence on others, but at the same time, he was aware that he might never meet such an extraordinary personality again. The academic saw in Jina an opportunity to pass on his name to future generations, but his frustration continued to grow. All of Jin's peers discussed him behind his back when they saw him, but of course he noticed the whispers. It seemed like everyone should have gotten sick of it by now, but they still found new topics to talk about when it came to him. Jean was told that he should study, so he studied, finding nothing difficult about it. But he did not understand why he needed it. Because because of his studies, he could not even go out with other children. He kept asking himself, what is my problem? Why are they whispering and moving away from me? He couldn't understand what he had done to make people treat him this way. Everything they thought about him was written on the faces of everyone around him, and it only added to his confusion. They liked him when he bought glazed fruit on a stick or rice cakes. Those moments were fond memories, but Jin didn't understand when things went wrong. Is all this possible because of the incident when he killed the bird? He recalled the moment and the reaction of his peers, who looked shocked and scared. But Jin couldn't figure out what exactly was wrong. Wasn't that fun? He was looking at one of the boys and did not understand why everyone else was following him. Of course, there were always those who provoked conflicts, but this guy had much more friends. After a while, Jin returned to his training under the teacher's supervision. He continued to draw hieroglyphs trying to concentrate, but the task seemed endless. Jin asked himself, How much longer do I have to do this? I'm already tired of this mountain marathon. Will I be able to communicate with people by drawing hieroglyphs? Isn't that stupid? Jin often asked himself this question during training. But his thoughts were interrupted when Nora called out to him. The teacher offered a snack and got a ration. They had a delicious baked chicken today, which cheered Jean up. Sitting down across from the teacher, Jean wondered why the first thing Nora always said was, Let's eat! Meat was a real delight for Nora, and he loved it as much as he loved himself. Jean wondered why Nora wasn't gaining weight, given his foodie passions. He asked the teacher many questions, including whether such food was given in the army, and Nora patiently answered all of his questions. But at one point, Jean went from asking questions to declaring, I'm not going to run anymore. It's too hard, and there's no getting better. Nora tried to explain that the world is arranged in such a way that without perseverance in character, you can't achieve anything. You can't just fly in the sky and blow the wind with your palms, as it seems at first glance. However, Jin brushed it off, saying that his father was rich, and when he died, all the property would go to him. Awesome! Look how he talks! Nora thought in shock. Despite this, Nora continued to advise Jean to live a beautiful life, and if he wanted to make friends with others, he better learn to fly in the sky and blow the wind with his palms. But Jean found his answer to every argument of Nora, and then the teacher realized that something was clearly wrong with his student today. Nora didn't even know what to say in response, but that only proved that there was a reason behind what Jean had said. Without trying to find the right words, Nora just reached out to hug him again. As always, the boy replied that he was very disgusted by it, but Nora did not give up. How dare you call a teacher's display of love disgusting, the teacher joked, continuing to torment him. However, this time Nora asked seriously, what happened to you today? But in response, he heard only silence. The teacher, not receiving an answer, began to tickle Jin, who only begged to stop. Then tell me. You promised not to hide anything from me and to share everything, Nora insisted. Finally calmed down, Jean began to pour out everything that was on his mind, but Nora considered his problems trivial and explained that there was no need to worry about such things. However, for Jin, this was a serious question that had been bothering him for a long time. At that moment, he felt his body begin to fly in weightlessness. 
The teacher grabbed his leg and left arm, began to circle around him, trying to cheer up Jin. Jin flew around the teacher and laughed loudly, forgetting about his problems. Looking at that laugh, Nora realized that Jean was still just a child, even with all his thinking. Did you say you don't understand? Asked the teacher, smiling, and immediately added, Is it necessary to understand everything? Stopping circling? Nora stood Jean in front of him and explained, If you don't understand something, you don't have to try. You just have to obey when you're told to do something. Sometimes you just have to pretend to do something when you're told to, don't you? Nora continued. Jin asked in surprise, why? But Nora replied that it wasn't that important, but that Jin wanted to get along with others. He continued to explain this to Jin, trying to get the point across. Jin only moved his eyes in different directions, trying to understand the teacher. And, in principle, he understood partially, maybe not completely, but he knew for sure that in time everything would fall into place. The academician told the students that in any matter one should make maximum efforts and be sincere in one's intentions. If there is sincerity, then form appears. If there is form, there is manifestation. And if there is manifestation, there is clarity that leads to movement. He continued. Jin, listening to the lecture, was deep in his own thoughts, looking at the horizon through the window. The academician constantly emphasized the importance of sincerity, considering it the key to success. At one point, he turned to Jin, drawing his attention. After several repetitions of Jin's name, the academic finally got his attention. The academic pointed out that the content of today's lesson had been chosen specifically for Jin and asked if he understood it. Jin, surprised, honestly answered that he did not understand. The academician emphasized how important it is to think about the meaning of what is said, demanding attention and understanding. Jin was convinced that an academic should explain things simply instead of asking difficult questions. The academician only angrily called him uncouth, once again expressing his displeasure with Jin's behavior in class. Jean explained that the real reason for his lack of understanding was the lack of answers to the questions posed. The academic pointed him to the door, adding that such behavior could lead to his expulsion. In his mind, he decided that it was time to root out Jin's indiscipline, because without strictness, change cannot be achieved. When Jin got up and started to leave, it came as a complete surprise to the academician. According to the rules, the student must always respect the words of his teacher and not ignore them. Jin indicated that the academic's words had raised many questions in his mind, and he decided to take his advice. Since the teacher told him not to cross the classroom again, Jin decided to do just that, taking his words literally. The academic slammed his fist on the table, not understanding why Jin had suddenly become so obedient. It was pointed out to Jin that he often upsets the teacher, so today he decided to follow his words at least once and explained it to the teacher. The academic reflected, admitting to himself that he would like to get rid of Jin. But he was afraid of the shame, because it would look like a failure. He could not raise one student, although he received financial support from his father. In the end, he ordered Jin to return to his seat, justifying his position. Repeating the request once more, he asked Jin to take his seat. Jin reluctantly turned around and walked over and sat down at his desk again. Looking at Jin, the academician could not understand what kind of punishment he was serving for the sins of his past life. However, he calmed himself by looking at another student in the class. Looking at him, the anger of the academician subsided a little. This student's name was Vaughn, and the academician asked him to explain to Jin the meaning of what was said. Vaughn explained that only sincerity can change the world. All interaction between things is connected, and sincerity can even touch the heavens. Upon hearing Vaughn's answer, the academician clapped his hands, praising him for the correct interpretation. He asked another question. What did Confucius say about those who do not ask themselves how to act? Vaughn replied, then even I don't know how to deal with them. This answer pleased the teacher even more, and he was extremely pleased. The teacher's reaction irritated Jin, and he decided to voice his question. Jin asked if understanding came with age, and if it wouldn't be surprising if a nine-year-old student understood everything at once. The teacher replied that it was because of insufficient understanding that Jin came here to study. Jin, not lost, argued that the teacher was only punishing him for not keeping up with the material. Classes ended, and it was already getting dark. Holding a stick in his hands, teacher Nora decided to conduct the training in person. He began to move, trying to remember the feeling of the past training. However, the speed of his movements did not bring joy. He was panting and tired. Nora realized that training cannot be neglected in the future. At that moment, Jin, who had just returned from school, approached him. 
Nora's teacher could immediately sense that something had upset Jean, judging by his demeanor. Entering the house, Jean began to complain that he was embarrassed in front of everyone because of that goat who turned him into a laughingstock. Nora, intrigued, wanted to know who the goat was, and if there was anyone weirder than Jean. Jean explained that when someone says nice things, the teacher pretends to be generous, but when they are bullied, he pretends to not care. All he does all the time is pretending to be someone else. Nora just laughed at this explanation and sarcastically called Jean good-hearted. This person was incredibly annoying to Jin, arousing anger and irritation in him. Jin did not hide it and explained all his feelings to the teacher. Nora began to figure out how to approach Jean to help him with his emotions. Jin emphasized again that he hated being around this person. Nora then reminded him of his promise to always tell the truth and obey him. Jean felt that his attempts to find a common language with others were futile. While that goat did nothing but received praise and trust, Nora suggested that there might be some who disliked the boy as much as Jean did. However, Nora also noted that there must be a reason why others value him despite his flaws. He advised Jean to learn pretend and master the skills he still lacks. It sounded like acting like a clown to Jean, but he figured it was worth a try if it would help. Nora emphasized that excuses do not indicate strength, but rather show an unwillingness to work on oneself, even when there is an opportunity to become better. In the conversation, Nora found even more arguments to convince Jean of the importance of his words. Finally, he came over and hugged him, trying to calm him down. Jean struggled to break free, outraged that Nora had done this again for no reason. Both knew that the road would not be easy, but Nora insisted that Jean listen carefully to his words. After all, it was in the interests of Jin himself, the more he wanted the teacher to pass on his knowledge to him. Nora suggested that Jean try to see the merits in that fellow, because only then can you learn new things. No one supports lies. Of course, Jean didn't like doing bullshit like that guy, but he tried to see it as a useful skill. Having finally understood Nora's point, John immediately rushed to complete the task. Nora, analyzing the conversation with Jean, concluded that there is his complete opposite at school, and decided that it would be interesting to look there again. The academician, walking through the yard, was still thinking about whom he had offended in his past life. He wondered how exactly he should discipline this young rebel, Kang Jin. Suddenly he heard someone approach him from behind. It was Nora. They exchanged greetings. Nora introduced himself, saying his last name was Quack, and his first name was No. Nora told a little more about himself, and the academic suggested that he might be a teacher. Teacher Quack. Hearing this, Nora began to vigorously wave his hands, denying he is not a teacher, but an ordinary warrior who is not even close to teaching. But he added that you can learn a lot from the soldiers too, and explained why he was here. He had arrived because of the student being taught by the academician, and whose behavior had piqued his curiosity. It was Kang Jin. Nora asked not to misunderstand him, and pointed out that he can only be considered a warrior mentor. He then began to explain more about himself, so the academician asked what brought him here. Nora then said that he had heard about the academic's irritation with Jin, and the academic confirmed that he was indeed very inattentive in class. Nora offered some advice on how to calm Jin down assuring him that he would definitely listen, even though the academic thought it was impossible. Looking at the academician, Nora realized that he was a man with a hard character who put pressure on others with his authority, which is why Jean did not get along with him. Nora explained that he had come to help because he thought he could somehow make things easier. He reasoned that there was no point in trying to tame Jeannie's anger at home if it was building up again at school. Nora came to the conclusion that it was necessary to solve the problem, and after a few days he came to the academy again. The academician, seeing him, did not understand for what purpose he had come this time. He went outside and saw Nora stretching in preparation for the conversation. As Nora came closer, their eyes met, and both prepared to have a serious conversation. A new day came and a light rain fell from the sky. Nora reappeared at the academy, holding something for the academic. It was a bag of food and a flask of delicious drink. The academician closed the book he was holding in his hands, preparing for the guest. They spread the food, poured the drink, and began the festive meal. The academician's cheeks were red from the glass, and the conversation turned more and more to Jin. The academician said that he had never met such a student in his entire life, although many people sought to learn from him. However, little Kong Jin does not appreciate this, and, confident in his intelligence, does not recognize the teacher's authority. Nora laughed, agreeing completely with his words. The academician added that if Jin had more perseverance and judgment, things would have turned out very differently for him. Nora replied that he understood him completely. 
Nora then hinted that John was obeying him after all, which almost left the academician speechless. Nora clarified that things weren't perfect, but he had learned to work with Jean's character. The academician, daring to be honest, admitted that his authority was being undermined by his very communication with Jin. He shouted, argued, and reprimanded, but all to no avail. Nora asked if the academic could share a few secrets, to which he agreed. The academician gave advice. Don't say anything to the boy. You can't scold or blame him, and especially, don't do it in front of others. The academic pointed out that Kang Jin's pride is huge, and his strong sense of rivalry is something that can be exploited. Nora, hearing this, asked the academic to lean in closer to discuss the idea. As the academic bent down, Nora whispered her plan to him. The academic's eyes lit up as he listened intently. The next day, in class, the academician announced the topic of the lesson, sitting in front of the students. Learning without thinking is a waste of time, and thinking without learning is dangerous, he declared, looking at Jin. Jean was convinced that the academician would drip on his brain again. However, he was surprised when the teacher did not turn to him, but instead asked another student, Vona. The academic praised Vaughn for the correct answer, as he continued to explain the topic. Learning that pays off is rewarding, said the academic, glancing back at Jin. After that, he invited Moon to answer another question. What are these tricks? Jin thought in wonder. The situation began to confuse him, because the academician was defiantly ignoring him. And at that moment he realized that he knew the answer to the question that had just been asked. Jin was full of impatience, but he had to watch the game of the academician, which awakened a competitive spirit in him. Moon continued to answer questions, receiving rave reviews from the academic. The lesson went on, and the teacher's attention remained on the other students. The academician praised everyone, calling them well done, adding that there was nothing to be particularly happy about. Suddenly, Jin slammed his hands on the table and the closed book, addressing the academic. What happened? The academician asked calmly. Jin was upset that the teacher didn't ask him any questions today. The academic replied that it was his mistake not to recognize that Jin's abilities had diminished somewhat. In front of the whole class, he said that he would ignore his poor performance and stop reprimanding him. This irritated Jin even more, and his hands clenched tightly into fists. The academic, glad to have found an approach to Jin, thought it would be a good idea to thank Nora by asking him out for a drink. He didn't even expect that he would feel so confident and calm now. Meanwhile, a rooster was running in the yard, crowing loudly. Jin enraged threw stones at him, trying to vent his anger. Why do you vent your anger on an innocent creature? A voice suddenly sounded from behind him. Noticing Jin's increased activity, Nora asked what was wrong, sensing his tension. Nora knew in advance that the reason for Jin's irritation was that he was perceived as a small child at school. Jin was angry at being simply ignored. Nora could have sworn that even though Jin lacks empathy, his desire for acceptance is extremely strong, and this could be his chance to change. In the conversation, they came to the conclusion that now his attitude towards learning literacy has changed. Jean finally realized how annoying it was to be ignored. Nora was pleased that Jean felt the need to learn. True, Jean wanted to prove to the old man that he could not be ignored, and even sought to trample the authority of the academician. Jean realized that there were many tasks ahead of him. Listening to Nora, making friends, and learning literacy from an academician. You're capable of anything because you don't like to go unnoticed, Nora told him. At these words, Jin confidently nodded in agreement. The next day came, and the students sat at their desks at school again. Observing Jin, the academician understood that he was not mistaken in him. Jin is a very intelligent boy, which means that the previous training methods were not effective enough. What could be better in this world than teaching people? Now the academician had two students, and he considered it the best blessing. That day, he decided to start the lesson with reading, and invited Hyun Sung to read aloud. Each of the students plunged into reading literature, listening carefully. The lesson is over, and it's time for recess. Jean went outside and, as usual, remained alone. Meanwhile, another group of his classmates gathered together, with Vaughn in the center. They began to make fun of Vaughn for always being tied to books, and even said that they would be better off without him. As he passed by, Jin heard them decide to teach him a lesson. They all started beating Vaughn together and Jin just watched them, not understanding how someone who was already struggling so mercilessly could be hurt so mercilessly. There shouldn't be any pity in a situation like this, Jin said to himself. He thought about the science he had received from his mentor. One of the bullies, pointing a finger at Vaughn's head, declared that his presence was bad luck. And just then, Jin heard a rustling behind him that caught his attention. After a scuffle, one of the bullies received a heavy blow to the head from Jin. 
The other classmates were startled and looked at Jin in confusion. He kicked another one hard in the chest. Not understanding what was going on, they listened to Jin's explanation, who said that it would be better to keep quiet like before. Jin declared that their mistake was in opening their mouths and made it clear that it is not worth insulting the weak, especially in a group. He swung his fist, preparing to strike again, and stressed that school should be quiet, even though he himself had a bad feeling about the situation. At that moment, his hand was stopped. Someone firmly grabbed it. It was Vaughn who told Jin to cease and desist. Vaughn understood that he had been insulted by the band, but still asked Jin not to continue. Jin looked at him, not understanding what was wrong with him. He told Vaughn to let him go until he struck, and he agreed, but asked him not to touch his classmates again. When Jin asks why Wan is worried about them, Wan replies that he's actually worried about himself, but asks to leave them alone. Fall out of here, Jin ordered them, warning that if the master found out about today, they would not be well. Everyone agreed and ran away. Back at Vaughn, Jin said he understood his intentions and asked if he was okay with everything now. After that, he invited Vaughn to go to his house. He didn't understand why he was going to his house. Jin began to explain the reason why he wanted him in particular. Turns out Jin needed something from Vaughn. They set off together in the direction of Vaughn's house. Coming closer, Jin looked around the house. He thought that even the doghouse looked better than this house. One now asked him his real reason for coming, to which Jin replied that he wanted to study. He explained that everyone loves her, except for those hooligans who beat him today, especially adults. Suddenly there was a noise behind him. Three children ran out of the house. Two girls and a boy, who were happy to see Vaughn. One immediately asked them if they had eaten, and when he heard the answer, he said that he was going to cook something now. Introducing Jin as his school friend. The children bowed to Jin in greeting, and one introduced them as his younger sisters and brother. On the left was Mimi, in the center was the boy Hong, and on the right was the eldest daughter, Zhou Nua. Jin gave his name as well, and Vaughn invited him in to say hello to his mother as well. Jin agreed to this offer. They entered the house, and on the bed lay a woman whose face was almost invisible from illness. Jin also greeted her. It was obvious that she was very sick, because she could not even speak. One explained to her that he came with a friend, pointing at Jin. He asked Jin to understand his mother, because she was sick and unable to answer. Jin looked around carefully, studying the situation. He noticed that Grandma's room looked ten times better, and Vaughn's mother looked even older than Grandma. At that moment, Wan tapped Jin on the shoulder. After the greeting, they could go on. They approached a group of children, where Vaughn began to light a fire. Vaughn did all the work, and Jin watched. After that, they went to chop wood. Or rather, one chopped while Jin watched. While watching, Jin struck up a conversation about Wan's mother, asking if she always slept and who took care of the house and made the money. Vaughn explained that he does all the work himself, and the craftsmen and the villagers also help so he can learn. Isn't it difficult for you? Jin asked. Vaughn replied that he was just grateful for the opportunity to learn. This all seemed very strange to Jin, because he didn't understand how Wan could be happy under such circumstances. Jin asked Wan if other people could also feel happy living in conditions like his. Vaughn replied that it depends on each person's mentality. He felt happy because he had a family to take care of. Vaughn also said that he was lucky to have such a wonderful mentor like Master, and that he was happy to be able to learn. Listening to these words, Jin looked at this modest house and still wondered how one could live here and be happy. Vaughn continued, adding that he enjoys learning because he sees no difficulty in it. At least, he had hope. He explained that he dreams of becoming an official and does not consider the desire to climb the social ladder to be a bad thing. Jin wondered if he was worse than Wan, since he had much less time but still did better in his studies. Suddenly, during these thoughts, a little girl grabbed his sleeve. She called him handsome and asked him to play with her. Jin reached out to gently remove her small palm. But just before touching her hand, he stopped. The energy emanating from this girl seemed unusual to him. Maybe Jin just didn't know how to handle a situation like this. His face tensed, and he just stared into her eyes, deep in thought. Jin tried to think things over. He decided to learn from this boy, and this girl was his younger sister. If he turns her down, Vaughn might hate him. Jin thought about how to behave in such a situation. In the end, he took the girl in his arms. Jean began to toss her up, causing her to laugh in amusement. He was surprised at how light it was, but he continued to play with it. Throwing her up and circling, he asked how old she was, to which he heard the answer. Five. A smile appeared on his face. Her older sister and brother were watching them, watching with admiration. Jin's gaze rested on them as well. He thought about how different they all were. Soon, they were all sitting at the table, and Vaughn served them food. In front of Jean lay two pieces of potato. 
The others had the same portion, and there was another dish in the middle of the table. Everyone grabbed a piece and began to eat, as if they had not eaten for several days. Although these dishes did not look particularly attractive, they brought joy to those present. Jin couldn't bring himself to start, and then one asked him not to be shy and eat. After tasting the food, Jin felt that it was fresh and almost without salt. Doesn't taste good? Vaughn asked. Is this really human food? Asked Jean in surprise. You said you came here to study. Maybe you'll learn how to eat properly today, Vaughn told him. But Jin still couldn't understand how you could eat something like that. Now he began to understand why Vona was often insulted by those boys. He noticed Hong looking at the piece of potato in the other's bowl as his own bowl was already empty. Jean still had one morsel left in his bowl. Vaughn, seeing this, held out his piece to Hun, and the little boy beamed with joy. What can I learn here? thought Jin. He later told Vaughn that he shouldn't have given away his food, even though he understood the reason for doing so. However, Jin asked if it wouldn't be a big deal if one passed out from hunger, since he's the only one who can provide for the family. It seemed to Jin that Vaughn should take care of himself first, and then take care of his younger ones, because if he weakened, no one would care for them. It's not like that, Vaughn explained. To be successful, you have to feel comfortable, and seeing my family well-fed makes me feel just that. Jin realized he was wrong, but inside he was still hesitating, trying to convince himself he was right. He asked if that's why people love Beck, because of his behavior. Some time passed and another hard training session came for Nora. He gave his all, but suddenly stopped, lost in memories. Nora reminisced about the conversation with his friend. He admitted that he is a little afraid of Nora, because he is the first one who is not afraid of him and calls him weird. For Nora... This friend was the first person he had spoken openly with since becoming a mere soldier, as he usually avoided people. However, it was this that allowed him to better understand others, even though Nora was often considered an oddball. A friend advised Nora not to be too trusting. After all, prudence is useful for both of them. At that moment, Nora opened his eyes and came back to reality. He couldn't understand why he suddenly remembered him. Looking around, Nora noticed that Jean was nowhere to be seen. At this time, Jin was climbing the mountain, giving all his strength to run. This run seemed endless to him. Suddenly, in front of him, he saw a large animal eating a small squirrel in front of two small chipmunks. Chipmunks, not knowing what to do and where to hide, trembled with fear. Jin, hiding behind the bushes, watched this scene. Suddenly, he heard how one of the animals began to squeal loudly. The squeals of the animals made Jin smile slightly, but the giant creature was getting closer and closer to the chipmunks. There was nowhere to run, and the white chipmunk accepted his fate. Suddenly, Another chipmunk, larger in size, stood in front of the predator, protecting the smaller one. Despite the otter's size advantage, he showed courage and jumped on her. There was almost no chance of victory in this battle. Only the end was visible before him. Behind the bushes, Jin continued to carefully observe everything that was happening. The chipmunk twisted several times in the air after colliding with the otter. Jin's expression changed as he watched the next one. He saw the otter grab the chipmunk with its sharp teeth. At that moment, Vaughn's silhouette flashed before Jin's eyes. He felt a slight tingling in his chest, as if something had touched him. The genie grabbed the rock that lay at his feet. The otter heard the sound and began to turn its head, releasing the chipmunk from its sharp teeth. But at that very moment, a stone flew right into her head. Jean appeared in front of the chipmunks, like a real superhero who came to the rescue. He looked at the small animals. The chipmunks were squealing, and the white chipmunk was sitting next to the two unconscious brothers. The genie held out his hand to him, and the little animal was frightened at first, twisted, and began to tremble. But then it felt the warmth and kindness coming from his hands. The chipmunk was already in Jin's arms, and he said gently that he was lucky today. And indeed for the chipmunk, this day could be called a real birthday. After a while, Jean was at home, sitting on a chair. In front of him, a chipmunk was playing happily, jumping on his hand. Then he did somersaults on the table where Jean was sitting. Jeannie sighed, finding the chipmunk's behavior excessive. It even seemed to him that he himself was going crazy. He called the chipmunk, saying that it was annoying him quite a bit. However, his behavior remained at the same time interested, watching the game with the animal. At one point, Jean thought that maybe he shouldn't have brought the chipmunk home and made an empty promise to the master. Then he took the little animal in his arms, watching how sweetly it fell asleep. He carefully placed it on a small cushion prepared especially for him. It was a small bed where Jean carefully laid the chipmunk in and began stroking him. It looked incredibly sweet of him. After that, Jin went to bed, and it wasn't long before morning. Waking to the crowing of a rooster outside the window, Jin stretched and opened his eyes. After getting dressed, he got out of bed and immediately went to the table. 
Genie threw seeds at the chipmunk, scolding that he only knows how to sleep. Then he took out a notebook and began to write something down with a pen, until the chipmunk, waking up, began to watch him. It was early morning, around five to seven o'clock. Gene kept records of the chipmunk's behavior, carefully recording its actions. It had been a month since the chipmunk had taken up residence with him, and Gene noted that he had grown noticeably. Gene never thought he would grow a chipmunk for more than two months. His notes were interrupted by a teacher who asked if it was time for him to go to school. He also asked how much longer Gene was going to call the chipmunk kid. The teacher hinted that maybe it was time to show real attachment after two months of education. The teacher himself thought that Jin needed to get used to a sense of responsibility, and not just a sense of power. Isn't it time to fulfill the promise? asked Nora, to which Jean was surprised, because Nora had even forgotten about the promise. You said if I took good care of him for over a month, you'd teach me how to shoot a fireball, Jin reminded him. Now Nora realized that he had a problem that needed to be solved. However, he did not fully understand why he had to teach this boy. After seeing Jean to school, Nora was left to think. He thought about what to do now that Jin was no longer having difficulty climbing the mountain. Come to think of it, Jean was climbing the mountain much faster now, and Nora began to question whether it was possible for a nine-year-old. He admitted that now he had to teach Jin something that would interest him and tire him out at the same time. Meanwhile, Vaughn and his family's house was filled with joyous shouts. Vaughn's younger brother and his sisters were happy to see the guests. In front of them, Jin and Juan held the two birds they had brought, offering to cook them for dinner. Hua said she could cook and took the birds in her hands. Then she ran into the house with the younger ones, full of enthusiasm. Vaughn thanked Jin for the food, because he hadn't seen his sisters this happy in a long time, and he didn't know how else to thank him. Jin asked Vaughn to help him understand his words and actions because, try as he might, he didn't understand it at all. One replied that he didn't quite understand what Jin was after. And then Jin explained that he wanted to know how to please people. For Vaughn, this request seemed extremely strange. He thought about how best to answer this question. At the same time, he noted that one can also live happily without this skill. When there are ten people, there are ten different colors. If you get a hundred white people together, they will also have a different soul color. Gene doesn't have to copy me, he has to do what he thinks is right, Vaughn said. That's how Vaughn explained everything to Jin, urging him to be himself. Afterwards, one asked Jin why he was studying with the master and asked him to give a specific answer. The genie replied that people favored the educated rather than the uneducated, and that the master was listening to him carefully. But Vaughn had a different attitude. He studied to get out of poverty. Thus, people can learn the same thing, but perceive and understand it differently. He explained to Jean that they had different paths, and therefore Jean should not think like him. Vaughn said he was born different, and there was no point in trying to fully understand him. Thinking about it, Jin felt irritated, because he did not understand why the master had given him such a task. But later he realized that Vaughn was saying everything correctly. Jin decided that even though Juan didn't understand him, he should still try to understand Juan, because he was sure that all people with white intentions had something in common. The other children always comply with his requests, but Vaughn stubbornly refuses, and this confuses him. Vaughn only asked Jin to understand him correctly, and after discussing it, they decided that they would continue to see each other after all. Jean pulled out a bag of money, declaring that nothing in this world is free. The world I live in is different from yours, was his response to Vaughn's question about the origin of money. At this, Vaughn started yelling loudly at Jin, but Jin continued to stand in front of him, stressing that people are different, and that this was exactly the lesson he had learned from one himself. Besides, making friends is good. Even though one didn't want to accept the money, Jin threw it on the ground in front of him. Even when Wan asked him to pick them up, Jin only said, See you tomorrow. As he left, he added that if Vaughn didn't want to keep the money, he could at least buy something with it. Because every time I come to your house, I'm hungry, said Jean, and offered to organize a nice meal next time. Some time passed and Nora was standing with Jin by the waterfall. Jin asked why they were here since it was too cold to swim. Nora brought him here to teach him the fire step. However, Jin still wondered why this particular place. Nora explained that it wasn't just a skill that could be learned. It required inner strength and Jean had to explore her own body. Nora rolled up his sleeve and showed Jean his biceps, saying that he would understand if he trained like he did. Only the strong like me know about it, Nora said, and Jean begged him to teach her faster. To find your inner strength, you need to start with proper breathing. Nora explained that, no matter how difficult the practice, you need to breathe only through your nose, inhaling and exhaling slowly. It will be difficult at first, 
but with practice it will become easier. In addition, it is necessary to draw in the stomach on exhalation and protrude it on inhalation. Nora explained that this is called ekon. When a person uses his inner energy, but for the need to absorb the energy of nature, the teacher told this so that Jin would learn to concentrate for long periods of time. Jin tried to do this, but after only a moment's distraction, he immediately lost control. At this point, Nora lifted him into his arms, explaining that the reason inner strength was difficult to learn was because of difficulty concentrating. Suddenly, Jin felt Nora's hands tense up and realized the seriousness of the practice. With all his might, Nora threw Jin straight into the river. Jin emerged, water was flowing from his clothes, and he, surprised, looked at the teacher who had acted so unexpectedly. What are you doing? Jin exclaimed. Nora calmly explained that he was just helping him. He ordered Jin to go under the waterfall, because there, under the flow of water, you can concentrate. To all Jin's questions, why and why, Nora answered only, that's necessary. Jinny swam straight to the waterfall as he was told. Hurry up and go under the stream, Nora urged him on. In a moment, Jin was already sitting under the waterfall, feeling very uncomfortable. The water hit his back with such force that it was incredibly painful. Nora loudly ordered him to follow the breathing technique he had taught him. Jin began to take deep breaths, trying to push aside all extraneous thoughts. The sounds of Nora's voice seemed to echo around him. It seemed that he was beginning to control the process little by little, although the pain was getting in the way. But he understood that if he continued, he could get used to it and learn. Imagine that you have a grain of millet under your belly button, even if it isn't there. Feel that you are creating it with your breath, Nora explained, trying to help Jin focus. As he concentrated, Jin thought only of the millet grain, imagining that he was creating it with air, feeling it inside. Nora went to the next level of training. He lay down with his feet in the water, where fishes swam and gave him a light massage from time to time. He wondered if he was doing the right thing by teaching Jin this way. He realized that it was not so ridiculous and remembered some moments from his past. Nora remembered how his general had said that regular practice of this breathing method could allow one to live even to great-grandchildren. During his time in the army, he had never had generals like him. And now, at his age, he wondered if he should devote his time to such methods. At the same time, looking at Jean, Nora remembered that even at his age, he had never been able to create this millet inside. Jin looked very focused and calm at this moment. Nora sat back on the rock, wondering if Jean could master it. After completing the training, they returned home. Suddenly, Jin saw Vaughn in front of him. Did he come because of that money? Thought Jin. The first thing Vaughn said was, I can't get the money back. He explained that his mother had a fever yesterday and he had to call the doctor. Jin smiled, thinking that now that money really found its purpose. Are you happy that your classmate's mother is in critical condition? Vaughn asked, looking at him. However, this was not what Jin meant at all. He explained that his intention was different and said, That's why I'm learning from you, to which Vaughn began to understand him. Jin asked not to return the money and to consider it as a tuition fee. One extended his hand to him and Jin didn't understand the gesture, seeing his lack of understanding. Vaughn realized that it would take a long time before they could fully understand each other. He still promised that he would return the money one day. They shook hands and Jin joked that he would get his money back, but with a huge percentage when Vaughn found out. After that, they went to Vaughn's house. Jin carried a small bag in his hand. He bought these things with money and tried to convince Vaughn that they were gifts, not wages, as an expression of gratitude. He explained that there is no difference between money and these gifts, because it is a sign of his affection and sympathy. Vaughn promised that he would somehow explain the real difference to him. They were already approaching Juan's house. In the silence that followed, Jean wondered how to start the conversation. He asked how Vaughn's mother was doing, and he gave a brief account of her condition. Jin then offered to bring the ginseng he had at home, saying that it helped restore energy. He knew that this was a very expensive remedy. My friend's mom is sick and I'm worried about her, said Jean. He added that this is friendly sympathy. Friends need help in times of need. Jin continued. Vaughn was moved by his words and could not deny it. Joyful laughter rang out in the yard. Children were having fun, filling the space with their enthusiasm. Every kid, smiling and carefree, enjoyed the moment of children's play. Among them, a father walked slowly with his wife, stopping from time to time to watch the children. The teacher approached him, carefully examining the crowd of children. The man asked how the children were doing and assured them that they could always turn to him in case of need. The teacher respectfully informed that the guests were already waiting for him and he could join them. Sitting down at the table, he noticed three more people who had already taken their seats. 
he unfolded a piece of paper and began to concentrate on reading what was written on it. Having finished reading, the man put the paper on the table and discreetly said that it was not easy. The gray-haired man noted that while the task was not easy, the progress was steady. Another suggested that it was a testament to the ability to influence, even by resorting to extreme measures. Lee thoughtfully replied that increasing the strength of the organization is not always a good thing, because behind every achievement there are other people's tears. They apologized to him, explaining that this was not exactly what they meant. He decided to clarify the real point of the matter by asking them to leave such ideas and forget about them. After that, he offered to proceed to the discussion of the next point. Meanwhile, Nora and John were at their usual training ground, focused on honing their skills. Nora watched his steps with a critical eye, which seemed to her not precise enough and did not meet expectations. Nora noted that the order of entry and exit should be clear and asked Jean to follow the established rules. He was indignant because the rules applied to everything, even how to sleep, run, and go to the toilet. The most important thing now is to straighten the back and improve teamwork, explained Nora. But Jin would rather run away to the mountains training alone. It seemed to him that even stray dogs were not trained so strictly. However, Nora insisted that mastering the fire step was not an easy task and required discipline. Even so, Jin was sure he could grasp it without too much effort. Nora had only warned him that it would be difficult for him after his impudent behavior with the teacher. Jin stubbornly continued to step forward along the marked line, paying no attention to the remarks. Observing his stubbornness, Nora thought that maybe it wasn't time for Jin's training, at least for the next year. The next day, the school grounds were full of activity. In the classroom, the children were clamoring, waiting for the teacher, and one student was sitting alone at his desk, concentrating on a book. He read the contents in depth, ignoring the noise around him. Suddenly, there was a loud crash on the desk next to him. It was Jin who walked into the classroom, tossing his book bag to a nearby seat. Noticing his concentration, Jin recognized that he was truly committed to his studies. To get his attention, Jean tapped on the desk, trying to distract him from the book. He only noticed Jean and heard him jokingly call him a bookworm. In response, he noted that he was not the son of a rich family, like Jean. However, both were only joking with each other, exchanging friendly jokes. At that moment, the master entered the classroom, and all the students hurriedly sat down in their seats. Leaning into him quietly, Jin whispered, suggesting that they go to the market together after class. After the pairing, they went to the market together. There, Jean bought four chickens and another bag full of food, even though his friend didn't even ask him to do it every time they came. Hearing this, Jin suddenly stopped and fell silent on the spot. After walking a few steps, Jin stopped, turned his head and looked at him in surprise. He approached Jin, and with a slight laugh, asked permission to lead a normal life, declaring that he would eat the whole thing himself if Jin didn't like it. Jean finally realized that the whole point was in the very tone of their conversation. He noted that this style of communication can often cause irritation in others, so Jin explained in a different way, adding that he is embarrassed to eat there every time, and that's why he always buys something before visiting. This approach made their conversation clearer, and Jin finally understood the gist of what was being said. He praised Jean, noting that he was a quick learner and understood even complex things. They walked on, and their conversation became much lighter, filled with good humor. Jin enjoyed this atmosphere. He was filled with a sense of peace and good mood. He decided not to think about the reasons. The main thing was that the mood was excellent. Suddenly, a man appeared on their way who attracted attention. He did not look very attractive, dirty, with a wasted face. He gestured to the boys to come over. Jean immediately recognized him as their neighborhood bully, and he advised his friend to just walk past. However, when they passed him, the hooligan turned and looked after them. He quickly jumped in front of them, emphasizing that when an adult addresses you, you must answer immediately. Jin looked at him seriously and asked, Uncle, do you know me? The bully's gaze immediately fell on Jin's belt, where a wallet with money was hanging. He slyly pointed his finger at the wallet and cheekily asked, Do you know what this is? For the bully, only one thing was important, money. But Jean warned him that he might regret his choice. The hooligan just laughed saying that it was immediately clear that he was standing in front of a child who did not understand reality. Leaning closer, he asked if Jin was afraid of him. Jin was only surprised because he did not understand why he should be afraid of such a person. The man, angry at Jin's answer, waved his hand and asked if he wanted to die. But he didn't even have time to bring his hand to Jin when the boy unexpectedly kicked him between the legs. The hooligan bent, breaking in half, and dropped to his knees. However, this only irritated him even more, and he decided to finally deal with the boy. 
With his fists at the ready, he lunged forward while Jin began to carefully back away. Jin realized his advantage in speed, realizing that the bully would not be able to catch up with him. At this point, it became obvious that Nora's training had paid off. Jin sped up even more, mocking the bully and teasing him for being too slow. He yelled at him that he should train better if he wanted to compete. It all looked funny, but suddenly their attention shifted to something else. The hooligan changed his aim and turned his attention to his friend, who remained in place and did not try to run away. Jin froze as he saw the bully slap his friend hard. The slap was so strong that he almost lost his teeth. Jin watched this scene without looking away. But when his friend was humiliated, the world seemed to shake under Jin's feet, forcing him to gather his strength. The hooligan began to kick his friend, not restraining his cruelty. Jin decided to intervene because he couldn't stand by when his friend was being humiliated. He grabbed a bag of money and threw it right at the attacker. This distracted the bully, and he stopped. Jean said loudly that the bully could take the money and disappear. The bully leaned down and slapped his friend again and said with a smile, That's what friends are for. You're really lucky. With a crooked smile from which some teeth had already disappeared, he turned and walked away. Jin immediately ran over to his friend helping him up and asking if he was okay. He got up in pain, said that the hooligan knows their situation well, and usually does not touch. But this time it was only about money. He apologized to Jin, promising to be more careful next time. The frequent beatings had made him almost numb to the pain, so he reassured Jin, telling him not to worry. They were already waiting, and the friend emphasized that they should go. However, Jin replied that he would go home. Without further explanation, he handed over the chickens to his friend, asking them to give them to the children. Without saying another word, Jin turned and walked away decisively. In his mind, he noted that he himself would definitely not have lost. But because of his friend, they had to concede. Firmly, he promised himself that he would not just leave it at that. The image still flickered in Jin's eyes. His friend's bloody face haunted him. He firmly promised himself that he would definitely take revenge on this scoundrel for the suffering he had caused. At this time, Nora was sitting at the table and enjoying delicious snacks. The food was exquisite and the alcohol truly refined, adding a special flavor to this dinner. He wholeheartedly indulged in the luxury that surrounded him. But suddenly, Jin burst in, opening the door with a loud bang, and turned to the master. Nora was surprised because he expected Jin later, but he immediately asked to teach him real martial arts. Indignantly, Jin complained that his daily classes only made him breathe properly, write letters, and run, while he sought to learn the true art of combat. Nora wondered, what could have made his student so suddenly interested in martial arts? But Jin stood his ground, claiming that he wanted to learn to fight. Nothing else interested him. For Nora, the problem wasn't that Jean couldn't be taught. He himself couldn't control his emotions, and wasn't sure he could pass the skills on to this particular boy. Even if he agreed to train him, it would take a long time. Finally, Nora understood his desire, went outside with him, and took a wooden sword with him. Gripping his sword tightly in front of a large tree, Nora concentrated. Then, with incredible speed, he made a swing, leaving clear traces of the impact on the tree. Turning back to Jin, he asked him, Do you want me to show it again? When Jean nodded in agreement, Nora resumed leaving clear marks on the wood with precision and force. He explained that anyone can do it, but the real skill is doing it right. Ask Jean to try it himself. Jin joked with a smile that it was an impressively difficult martial art. Having confidently approached the tree, he began to swing his sword, convinced of its ease of execution. See, I'm doing this for the first time, and it's working, Jin declared with satisfaction. However, the master asked him to try again, paying more attention to technique. Finding mistakes in Jin's technique, the master remarked that he was doing it wrong. Jin irritably called him stubborn, then asked Nora for a sword to show how it should look. Nora advised to watch carefully how he makes shots. Jin began to doubt whether the master really knew what he wanted to teach, watching his actions thoughtfully. The master once again demonstrated the technique, again swinging his sword at the wood with impressive speed. Jin's expression gradually changed as if he was beginning to understand something. Jin finally admitted that he saw a difference, but admitted that it wasn't easy to replicate. Gathering his willpower, he took the sword in his hands, walked closer to the tree, and tried again. Jin was convinced that he was repeating the master's technique. However, although the blows were similar, their traces were different, and Jin noticed that the result was different. It all seemed obvious, but actually doing it was difficult. Jin tried again, hitting the tree several times. He realized that watching from the side and doing it yourself are completely different things. However, Jin did not stop, tightly gripping the hilt of the wooden sword. He continued without interruption as if he was ready to hold the sword until morning. 
Nora watched carefully, noticing the incredible enthusiasm of the boy. What Nora saw next shocked him almost beyond belief. Even he himself took a long time to hone the accuracy of his shots. But the determined fire in Jin's eyes spoke for itself. Watching the boy's efforts, Nora only spread his hands in surprise. He rubbed the back of his head, not understanding how Jin managed to make such progress. At this point, Jin tightened his grip on the sword's hilt, but Nora told him to stop so that he wouldn't overexert himself. Jin countered, reminding him that the master himself said to learn how to do it right, and that's exactly what he's doing. Then Nora gently put her hands on his shoulders, soothing him and helping him relax. Seeing that Jin's hands were bleeding, Nora was confused, explaining that the feeling was due to overexertion. Nora began to gently blow on Jin's arms, unsure of what to do with the wounds. He asked the boy what he was doing and why he no longer listened to his instructions. Jean, not restraining his emotions, told the whole truth. They met a bully in the forest, and now he wants revenge. The bully trampled his pride and hurt his only friend. Nora sighed, noting that things like this happen in life. But Jean believed he had to act. It is because of this that he trains, despite the pain. Nora realized that dissuading Jean from doing something reckless was as useless as talking to a wall. He only asked not to invent martial arts as if they were necessary for self-defense, because Nora himself at one time learned them only in order to survive. But Jean seems to have decided that he won't stop at a few punches for the sake of his friend. Nora was afraid that the boy would not seriously harm the hooligan, so he invented a proposal for him. If you want revenge, do it flawlessly. Wouldn't it be a shame if you make a mistake and get beaten? He said. Jin agreed and again asked to teach him martial arts. Nora then proposed a simple plan. He asked Jean to make a hole in the tree. Once you can pierce that tree with a wooden sword, you can take revenge on the bully, he said. Until then, Nora asked Jean not to come back to him. Jean looked at the amount of work that seemed incredible, but he was filled with determination and faith in his abilities. Watching Jin, the teacher noticed how persistent and eager to learn no matter what. However, he wondered if Jin had any strategy, or was he just hitting the tree over and over again? His clothes are too big. Nora thought, deciding she would have to hem them. Nora approached Jean, assuming that he was tired, and suggested that they move on to another task. Jin suspected that the teacher wanted him to create Millet again. But the teacher stressed that it was very important and added, When you succeed, you will definitely come and say, Thank you, Master. He emphasized that by training year after year, success will be inevitable. They say that if you train every year, the result will come, said the Master. But the words say made Jin doubt. However, in the end, he decided to trust the master. Together, they went to the mountains to continue training. This time, Jin was sitting on a slope, on a rock, in a meditation position. He kept asking himself how exactly to create this millet. Jin tried to fully immerse himself in the process, searching for strength within himself. And suddenly, he felt something new. A warm feeling in the lower part of his stomach. It was as if a warm ball began to warm him near the navel. He concentrated even more until sweat broke out on his forehead from the tension. Meanwhile, the warm orb inside Jin began to grow, becoming larger and more visible. He understood that the next step was to transfer it to the solar plexus, for which it was necessary to first catch this sensation, and then learn to move it. Jin had to gain control over this energy in order to gradually raise it up. He concentrated more and more, and he began to succeed in something. It was incredibly difficult, but Jean didn't stop trying. When night fell on the street, Nora came up to him. The master looked frightened, although curiosity shone in his eyes. Jin didn't understand what happened and turned his head to the teacher. It turned out that the master was not scared, but rather amazed that Jin had actually managed to create it. Jin couldn't describe his feelings, but he was sure that he felt completely different. Nora realized that everything the general had said had turned out to be true. No one but Jin had been able to do this before. The teacher watched him with admiration until Jin suddenly began to shiver, explaining that he felt warm inside but very cold outside. Nora hugged him, trying to warm his student. After all, the mountain breeze was extremely cold. Rubbing Jin's shoulders, Nora saw a smile on his face. He'd done it. He'd mastered the millet. Now the question arose, what to do next? The next day, the master sat, savoring the exquisite and sophisticated alcohol, indulging in thought. He was still delighted that Jin had succeeded. However, now the problem was different. He thought this task would take a long time, but Jin completed it faster than expected. Therefore, Nora began to think of a new plan of action. He made it clear that the new task would be more difficult and take much longer. It wasn't long before he was by Jin's side again. Nora placed a tree in front of Jin and told him to jump over it every day. 
Jin could not understand the meaning of this task, and asked the master a question. But receiving an insufficient answer, he asked the same thing again. In response, Nora decided to tell him a story. He began with the fact that once upon a time, there lived a hired killer. Jean's imagination was already painting a vivid picture of this story. This mercenary approached a small calf tethered nearby and named it his new training partner. Every day he jumped over this little calf. Day after day, the mercenary's body grew stronger. His beard grew thicker and his hair grew longer. Despite the pain, he relentlessly continued training. His feet lifted off the ground as he made a leap. And then he would land, jumping over the calf. Looking back, he realized how much time had passed. He noticed this because the little calf turned into a big bull. After hearing this story, Jean assumed that if he continued to jump, he would eventually be able to jump over the tree. Master, how fast does this tree grow, he asked. It's not important. The main thing is that you strictly follow my words, because you also did not believe in the power of millet, Nora answered. Jin looked at the sapling that was only about knee high and let out a sigh of relief. Having accepted the task, he went home. In his yard, a rooster and a chipmunk were pecking food together. Jin walked up to them and stopped for a moment, watching. Then, calling them by their names, Pip and Cook, he called them to him. Come here! Both animals felt a chill run down their backs as Jin approached. He crouched across from them, but the rooster and the chipmunk remained standing there, watching warily. Once again, Jin called to them to come closer. After that, they rushed towards him, although they didn't look too sure. Jean even thought he was overfeeding them, because they both barely moved. The chipmunk began to climb on Jin, climbed onto his shoulder. He rubbed his cheek against Jin's, showing his affection. But Jin knocked him off his shoulder with one finger, so that even the rooster was shocked by such a surprise. The chipmunk landed, looking rather serious for such a small creature. Jin noted that it even seemed a little strange to him. He thought he was a little annoyed by this behavior, but he wasn't sure if it was the animals themselves or their behavior that annoyed him. However, he again asked them to come, and this time they ran to him more willingly. Jean sensed that he had a hidden talent for training. Then he started playing with both of them, stroking their heads. The next day, Jin sat next to the master, looking out the window. The master asked Jin to watch carefully what they would see. A chef was preparing ramen on the street, and a customer was standing opposite him, waiting for his order. Jin already wanted to eat, but the master insisted that he continue to watch. At one point, Nora asked Jean what he was seeing. Jin saw a woman and a man, the woman diligently preparing food, and the man patiently waiting for everything to be ready. What are these people thinking? Nora asked. Jin replied that a woman thinks about cooking, and a man thinks about how delicious he will eat. Master asked Jin to take a closer look, and asked why these two treated each other with kindness. Jin suggested that it was just a seller and a buyer, so nothing more was needed. Nora thought that was how Jin would respond. He then asked another question. Why did he think they were both smiling? Jean replied that everything was probably fine, but Nora pointed out that a smile doesn't always mean well-being. He then asked what would happen if they both had sad expressions on their faces. And what would Jean think if they looked disappointed? Then it's the other way around. They can smile but not like each other, right? Continued Nora, developing his opinion. The master explained that the landlady might not want to sell the food because of health problems and the buyer might not have the money to afford only this modest lunch. For the landlady, this is a client she does not want to lose, and for the buyer, it is a place where he can purchase something. Jin listened to this and took everything as a kind of wonder, but Nora tried to convey one important truth to him. What you see on the outside is just a mask. You have to learn to feel what's inside. Jin, sipping his tea, seemed thoughtful, as if he was beginning to understand something. He wanted to say that it all seemed strange, but the master interrupted him, correcting the word to special. Nora then took Jean's hand and explained that it was a long way. At first, you are only aware of people's attitudes, but you need to start with the ability to see their feelings, he said. He then asked if Jin had been talking to the boy. Jin replied that he looked like him, but Nora countered, noting that they were different, and it was evident in Jin's face now. He explained that now his face shows real feelings, whereas that boy always had a stone face, be it sadness, joy, or anger. The master pointed to his face and explained that it expresses emotions as they are. He suggested that Jean begin by learning to recognize these feelings in others. This conversation seemed quite interesting to Jin and made him think. Meanwhile, at his friend's house, she, his sister, was cooking, making the family dinner. Meanwhile, his brother was playing with the youngest child in the family. Vaughn watched them and couldn't help but smile. Joan was also visiting and standing nearby. 
He watched them as he stood in the doorway, pondering the master's words. The master said that ordinary things that people usually take for granted can be understood by observing friends and loved ones. However, Jin did not understand why this teaching was so difficult. The master explained that the same facial expression can be different in children, young people, and old people. Vaughn noticed his thoughtfulness and asked why he was so absent-minded. Jin replied that he wanted to discuss something. Approaching Wan, Jin sat down next to him and told about the conversation with the teacher. Vaughn understood his question and noted that it could only confuse him, because this problem was not the only one. He added that there are many people who do not even know about it. One then asked if Jin remembered the day he first came to their house. He wanted to know if Jin remembered the details of that day. That day, one said that while Jin's words made sense, sometimes it's more important to just feed others. With that in mind, Vaughn offered to discuss different facial expressions, and that's when he brought the food. It was a day for which Vaughn was infinitely grateful. The younger ones were also happy, but Vaughn asked Jin, What happened to my emotions then? Jin replied that his emotions seemed to be anger. Right then, Vaughn was angry, but grateful at the same time. Jin realized that he felt anger and gratitude at the same time. Vaughn understood that the inner state of a person can be manifested on the face, but in some situations it remains hidden. He thought that the teacher was trying to convey this very idea to him, and that's why Jin is called special. Time passed, and Jin was once again standing next to the tree he and the master had planted. He was looking at him intently, preparing to jump over. Running up to the tree, he pushed off the ground with all his might, and now his body was already directly above this tree which had grown considerably. It is now much larger than it was when they planted it. Wiping the sweat from his forehead, Jin looked back, thinking that he might not be able to jump it next year. After that he ran upstairs, continuing his training. His running speed has already increased significantly. However, it is time to go to school and study. Sitting at desks next to Vaughn, they studied books together. After classes at school, Jin went to the waterfall, where he tried to control his breathing. Red maple leaves fell next to him, covering the ground with the bright colors of autumn. Autumn passed quickly and winter soon came. There was already snow underfoot, crunching with every step. The genie stood in front of the tree he had challenged, his wooden sword standing next to him. His body became stronger, his muscles became much larger and in relief. Jean warmed up in preparation for practice by doing warm-up exercises. He trained without clothes, hardening his body in cold conditions. As the snow fell on him, he immediately melted, hissing slightly from the heat of his hot body. The genie walked over to the wooden sword and took it firmly by the hilt. Pointing his sword at the tree, he took a deep breath. Exhaling to increase his concentration, he felt all his thoughts focus on the goal. And as his concentration peaked, he felt himself ready for action. Clenching his sword, Jin began to strike the tree with all his might. His punches became much faster than before. The movements were crisp and polished, and the facial expressions exuded confidence. When he finished, he turned away from the tree and started walking in the other direction. The tree trunk was left with deep impact marks, much larger than ever before. Even a small hole appeared, which he could not pierce before. Meanwhile, Nora was looking for the book he needed in the library. He almost took apart half the shelves, carefully looking through each book. The text printed on the pages confused him somewhat. There is so much text in these books, he thought as he flipped through one of them. Suddenly, his commotion was noticed by a girl who was passing behind him. She asked if he was looking for anything in particular, and Nora asked if they had a martial arts book. As for martial arts, I think there is, the girl answered, and Nora asked to find one with lots of illustrations. She went to the shelf where, in her memory, the book was supposed to be needed. The girl began to search, since she had not seen that book for a long time. A layer of dust had already accumulated on the book which she carefully brushed away. Opening the book, the girl saw illustrations that showed the correct techniques of wielding a sword and stance. Although she once planned to burn this book, today it will bring her some pocket money. Nora continued to wait in the same spot, still looking at the other books. The genie was standing in front of a tree from which the leaves were flying. Spring had come. Nora watched his jump because now it was necessary to crouch three times higher than his own height. John grew a lot and managed to jump quite high. The enthusiasm in his eyes was noticeably greater than before during training. He jumped so clearly that he flew through the tree with ease. In the air, he had to push against the currents of the wind to rise even higher. Due to the height of this jump, he barely landed on his feet, doing a few spins to keep his balance. So, how did it go? He asked the teacher, and he only replied with a smile that Jin himself could see that he could do anything. Easier said than done, replied Jin, shaking off the dirt. While in the library, 
Nora remembered Jin's agility, and, although the boy was his student, pondered Jin's insanity and whether he should intervene himself. However, he still wondered if it was time to use his own power. Nora began to reminisce about their training at the waterfall. Jean was very good at standing upright, keeping his balance. His punches in the air were impressive and accurate. Even the aura began to gather around his hand as he punched the air. A stream of air erupted from this aura, amplifying his blows. Nora watched this with admiration, feeling impressed by the student's progress. He understood that John was beginning to do something incredible, surpassing all expectations. After another hit, Jin asked the teacher if it was a layer of fire. In general, everything worked out for Jean, and he confidently continued training. Standing in the library, the master thought about what to do next. He even began to think that Jin really could have descended from heaven. At first, he tried to teach him simple humanity. At that moment, a girl approached him, handed over the book, and explained what could be found in it. Meanwhile, Jin practiced sitting on the grass. The children watched him while Vaughn was engrossed in reading a book. Vaughn turned to the children and said that they all have fragile bodies, so they must do whatever he says. Jin turned to Vaughn and asked if he realized what he had to do. Vaughn agreed to train with him because some of the memories caused him negative emotions. Jean warned him that he would have to practice a lot and that it would not be easy. First, Vaughn is the head of the family, and the younger ones depend on him. It would be undesirable to lose authority in front of them. Now everything must be considered. Instead of undermining his authority, Jin decided to use the situation to the benefit of the juniors. Vaughn noted that there are many adults who support him, including his father. The streets of the city were in chaos because the evening had come. A group of people swayed along the street, singing songs. This evening seemed to be generally interesting and somewhat chaotic. The girls looked out of the windows, smoking and laughing loudly. A security guard stood at the entrance to the gaming bar, overseeing order. Some inside won money, while others could not hide their disappointment at losing. Then the guard saw several little ones in front of him and said that this was no place for them. He tried to push one of them away with his hand, trying to chase them away. But something went wrong. His hand was intercepted. It was Jin who threw the giant over him with one movement. The security guard could not understand what was happening. Who are you so boldly pulling into your arms? Jin asked, standing over him. He confidently looked the giant straight in the eyes, showing his determination. Zordovan began to rise, clearly angry. He decided to teach Jin a lesson and swung at him again. A strange, unmoved look appeared on Jin's face. Zdrovan could not seem to understand what was happening and felt confused. He thought, well now I'll show this cheeky little one. But because of this strange feeling, I realized that there is something special about Gina. He clenched his fist tightly, not wanting to be intimidated by some boy. Despite the fear of the rumors that he was beaten by the boy, he decided to take another swing. He had already thought that this would be the end for Jin. But suddenly, he felt a powerful slap from behind from another big man. He, standing behind him, asked at whom he was looking so impudently. After that, the first big man had to calm down. He bowed to Jin and asked how he got here. It was Master Nam, and he explained that this place was not for the likes of Jin. He added that if the owner finds out about it, there will be big problems. Jin explained that he was looking for one person. The next day, Vaughn's relatives wished him a happy journey. Vaughn set out to meet new adventures, full of determination. Walking forward, he carefully examined the people around him. On the way, he met a group of people standing around a man with a sign around his neck that read, Robber. This man had once made a mistake. He immediately understood whose hands it was. This man looked like he stuck his head in a beehive. It was easy to guess that Jin had done it. Vaughn realized he needed to talk to Jin. He arrived at the school, where Zhang was sitting at a desk engrossed in reading books. Jin knew this conversation was inevitable, and he was ready for it. Jin greeted him with a smile as Wan walked closer. They immediately began to discuss the events. Jin said that thanks to the successful decision, he is now in a good mood. Meanwhile, in a completely different place, the ink pen left marks on the paper. This pen was written by Lee, who asked his servant sitting behind him if the man was still alive. The servant explained that after the attack, the man will not be able to walk on one leg, although his life is not in danger. Lee asked why Jin was so obsessed with this thug. The servant explained that this was because the man had previously beaten Jin's friend. The master was furious then. The word fury interested Lee, and the warrior explained that it was necessary for the just condemnation of the guilty. He also speculated what would have happened if Nora's teacher had stopped Jin. Lee understood why Jin was so passionate about martial arts. He ordered the servant to continue watching and to act cautiously, because if you get into it unnecessarily, you will not achieve the desired results. 
Lee was most surprised that despite his anger, Jin did not kill the attacker. Lee wondered whose credit it was for this self-control. He realized that Jin could be controlled, perhaps as a result of Nora's training. Maybe it wasn't just the words Nora said to him when they first met. Night fell on the street. Nora sat on the training ground, wondering how to buy even more time for Jin's training. The praise came naturally as he saw how quickly Zhang was learning. However, Nora was troubled by the thought that once Jin said she no longer needed him, he would lose his chance to become perfect. Suddenly a man appeared behind Nora and asked why he was sighing so heavily. It was Jin's father. Nora explained that he wanted to create a training strategy. Allures. But he didn't know how best to approach it, so he was worried. Nora recalled that when he was serving in the army, he happened to hear about the difficulties in changing dispositions and thought that it might be based on the principles of Bagua. Lee said that he once helped a fortune teller in a Buddhist temple and remembered a lot from her teachings. He asked Nora if he would pass this knowledge on to Jin, but Nora replied that he wanted to teach him more interesting things. He gives you a lot of trouble. I'm very grateful to you for that, Lee said. Don't worry, like I said, I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with him, Nora replied with a smile. Lee continued, noting that Jin had changed a lot lately. He expressed his gratitude and asked why Jin had been going to the market so often lately. Nora explained that he wanted to teach Jin how to understand people's facial expressions. He explained this to Lee noting that it sometimes caused many difficulties. Nora said that Jean needs to learn to recognize people's feelings and interact with them. The guy is very smart, so I'm sure he'll do well, he added. I know your son. He will become as great as you, Nora assured. Jin's father smiled and asked, Really? Nora held her breath for a few seconds. He then said that Jin would become great, because he wanted to. During the conversation, Lee drew symbols and noted that it was about disposition, but it seemed like it might not fit. Evaluating this work. Nora admitted that one could hardly imagine anything clearer. It was time to say goodbye, and they said goodbye to each other. Lee, in his beautiful attire, walked away, leaving Nora alone. Nora sat down and began to carefully examine the symbols drawn on the ground. He realized that Lee is not as simple a person as it may seem at first glance. Jin trained hard, feeling that he needed to put in even more effort. He was clearly aware that there was a lot of work ahead that needed to be completed. He had already mastered most of the lessons, and now they seemed easy to him. Together with Nor sitting at the table, they discussed the new tasks that Jean had set for himself. They again watched through the window at the people passing by on the street. Most people try to hide their intentions, but the face always betrays their true feelings. Jean remembered a conversation with Nor when he talked about the importance of controlling emotions. If you work hard, you can learn acting skills and control facial expressions. This is exactly what Nor asked him to pay special attention to during training. And now, standing in front of the tree, Jin could feel his skills improving, but it was still difficult. However, he was sure that he would eventually be able to achieve better results if he continued training. Jin rushed to the tree, trying to jump over it, counting on his strength, pushed off confidently. But the landing turned out to be unsuccessful. Isn't there a safer way? Jin asked. But the master explained that he needed to find the right path himself. If you always follow others, there will come a time when you will not be able to act independently, added the master, emphasizing the importance of independence. In this way, the master tried to explain to Jin so that he would not constantly rely on questions to him. He explained that Jin chooses difficult paths, which causes him to constantly face difficulties. All the skills he develops will help him not only in success but also in case of defeat. The master then quipped that Jin had a funny look on his face when he fell. Jin decided that this time he should use a trick. Turning around, he focused on another attempt to jump over the tree. He felt how the ground was spreading under his feet, and he flew down rapidly. Flailing his arms, he decided that now was the time to try another trick. Suddenly, a gust of wind picked up his body, as if supporting him in flight. A current of air held his legs, preventing him from falling. The wind clearly directed his movement so that he landed smoothly without falling. The master was delighted because he did not expect such a result from Jin's attempt. Jin realized that he could use his skills to control his movements as he fell. The next time he turned around again and ran quickly to the tree, ready to try again. Using his skills, he powerfully pushed back and soared high up, continuing his training. Genie, in complete control of the airflow, gently lands on the ground, balancing confidently. Nor thought that Jin had lost his mind watching his dangerous experiments, but the same stream of wind, picking him up, carefully lowered him to the ground. Teacher, have you seen? Jin exclaimed. Yes, I saw, I saw, he answered. You are a real genius! I really succeeded! Jin exclaimed joyfully, overflowing with happiness. 
Nor thought, maybe Jin has abilities that he himself doesn't even know about. Night fell. The coach sat outside, watching the stars. He tried to draw the same symbol, again forgetting what it looked like. He dragged his stick along the ground in exasperation, trying to remember the pattern. Well, he can't ask the owner to repeat the symbol again, thought the coach. He dropped the stick and decided to stop trying because he had other things to do. Suddenly, Jean appeared behind him, startling him with her silent appearance. His steps were imperceptible as he used a heel-to-toe technique. He approached the master and carefully began to examine what he was drawing on the ground. I'm learning the moves, Jin said. I realized that the main principle is accuracy. The teacher spoke, explaining in detail to Jin the concept he applied based on the fundamentals of the martial art. He explained that he used the Baogua technique as a basis for the movements. The genie walked over to the symbols drawn on the ground and began to follow them, studying them carefully. He moved in the largest circle that was drawn on the ground, trying to catch the rhythm of the movement. His steps resembled a dance, smooth and elegant, but at the same time looked a little clumsy. Sometimes his steps looked funny because he lost his balance and staggered. After completing the circle, Jean pointed out to the teacher that although the Baogua was the foundation, something was missing. The movements were interrupted, causing him to lose his balance. He thought back to his Jing classes at school and looked thoughtfully at the symbols on the ground. Jin reached for the stick that the teacher had thrown, planning to touch up the drawing. He remembered that they said in class, Taiji gives rise to Taijuan, which in turn creates thought. Thought further generates Bagua, and ultimately it is energy that leads to changes in movement. Jin swiped his stick across the ground, correcting the symbols, and told the teacher that it made more sense now. After that, he started moving through the symbols again, now with more confidence. A smile appeared on his face, because now the movements were perfect. Jin praised the teacher, calling him a genius for thinking of using the scheme in this way. However, the master was aware that Jin had mastered the basics under his eyes, and it seemed that he didn't need to explain it all anymore. But this is only the beginning. It would be better if the master learned more interesting techniques to teach Jin something new. You can't always follow me, remarked the master, to which Jin replied, Then you'll have to continue to overcome difficulties. He continued to walk around the circles, showing where you can stand and where you can't, eliminating all the shortcomings of the movements. Master couldn't understand what Jin was saying. No matter how much he listened to him, it all remained unclear. Well, let him speak to his health, he thought. If he realizes that he doesn't understand anything, it could lead to a bad result. He sat down, deciding to just watch the process continue. The master was well aware that he was unable to teach Jin this art at the moment. The academic was conducting a class when Jin stood up and addressed him. A new day dawned and Zhang was full of determination. The academician immediately noted that Jin was showing incredible results, and this could not go unnoticed. Satisfied, he realized that this was no illusion. Jin had indeed made significant progress. Watching this, the other students felt irritated, jealous of his success. At this moment, Jin himself was worried, not knowing how his achievements would be received. He felt that now was the moment he had worked so hard for. After some time, Jin and the master sat together, and the master mentally acknowledged the genius of his student. He noticed how much Jin loved attention, and even began to hope that this greed for attention could restrain his cruelty. Jin enthusiastically told the teacher about his feelings. I had to see it! It felt like something was rising from my stomach, I don't even know how to describe it. Did you like it? asked the master. Of course I do, Jin replied. There is a saying, your plate is deep, said the master. Jin did not immediately understand that this was a metaphor. Then the master offered to take care of the teacher, who does not want to spoil the good mood of his student. He alluded to himself, because he often felt stressed due to constant training. Jin got up, asking the master to wait and said he was going to wash up and then come back. Later, they were already sitting at home at the table, continuing their conversation. The master was literally beaming with joy, although his smile looked a bit strained. Fake smile, Jean remarked, scrutinizing his face. Is it really so? asked the master, to which Jin confidently replied, Exactly. However, at this moment he pondered, trying to figure out how to recognize true emotions. The smile seemed to be ordinary, but how can one accurately reveal its true meaning? He did not yet understand what was confusing him. Then the master took his cheeks. Look carefully, he said. People don't always show what's in their hearts, so you have to be able to guess. Not only lips, but also eyes. Their shine reveals real emotions. When people smile sincerely, the upper part of the cheeks moves first, and then the lips. Do not forget to look into the eyes, because this is the most important part for recognizing emotions, he added. 
Because of this, Jin couldn't really understand, so he told the master that he only saw a fake smile. The master asked Jin to try again, promising that if he failed this time, then he would have to find another approach. The master began to scrunch his face as if someone had insulted him and watched Jin's reaction. Jin watched closely and noticed that the lips and cheeks were moving at the same time, but the cheeks were rising slightly. Then the master came up, patted Jin on the head and praised him, noting that he was beginning to understand. However, he added that it is necessary to separately train his ability to see real emotions. After a while, they were walking along a path in the forest, where Nor told Jin that vision is the eighth innate human sense. The problem is that there are often misconceptions about what you're actually seeing. What exactly are the misconceptions? Jin asked curiously. At this time, they had already gathered branches and started to light a fire. The master suddenly threw a rock at Jin, which surprised him. Wait a little, said the master, until the fire was fully ignited. He asked Jin to take the stone, but he said that he could not because the stone was hot. How do you know it's hot unless you try it? asked the master. The genie argued that he had seen the stone lying in the fire. What if you didn't see it? Would you just pick it up? said the master. And suddenly somehow, the stone cooled down. But you still won't believe me, because you saw how it was on fire. He continued. Nor went to the stone, took it in his hands and threw it from one hand to the other. He explained that the stone was hot, but not so hot that you couldn't hold it. This is an example of a false perception that you have to see for yourself. As long as a person is alive, he can look, but only until he touches the truth, said the master. However, that was not all he wanted to explain. He suddenly tried to punch Jin in the forehead, but Jin quickly dodged. It turned out that it was only a bluff on the part of the master, who was testing his reaction. Although the master swung, he didn't even have the thought of hitting. He only asked Jin not to jump to conclusions. Once again, Jin deluded himself believing that he already understood everything. He was willing to train hard and was sure that with time, he would be able to better understand such situations. Nor explained that with practice, Jin would be able to tell if a hit was real or just movement, and could easily dodge. Then the master held out his hands in front of Jin and asked him to try. Jin swung quickly trying to hit. Nor easily placed his palm under Jin's fist, demonstrating a control technique. Jin decided to try again, making sure of his actions. But this time, when he swung, Nor abruptly withdrew his hand, avoiding the blow. This was a real achievement. After which, Nor began to tell a story about his past as a soldier, and how he survived thanks to his skills. Listening, Jin guessed that the teacher was hiding something. The teacher explained that this is precisely why you need to train your emotional intelligence. To be able to recognize not only real emotions, but also fake ones, and to understand at a glance what is hidden inside. Jin hinted that the master had aged a bit and couldn't perform the techniques the way he used to. The master smiled as he mimicked the movements and suddenly his face changed, becoming eerie, as if a murderous desire had awakened in him. He began to approach Jin, displaying his menacing nature. Jin was very startled and backed away and fell on his back, not knowing how to react. Nor just laughed as he asked Jin what happened to him. Jin, a little confused, asked what it was, to which Nor replied, It's human energy. He told Jin not to be afraid, and explained that after decades on the battlefield, there is always doubt in situations like this. He then asked Jin if he was sure that the cause he was training for was really worth all the effort. Jin answered confidently, yes, after a grueling workout and a long day, they were already relaxing at home, lying on the same bed, discussing how much fun they had today. Knorr suggested learning all the techniques together, but noted that men's problems cannot always be solved together. He also thanked Jin for treating him with more respect than he deserved. The atmosphere was incredibly calm. You could see bright stars through the window. After the conversation, they both fell asleep, feeling light and calm. Jin fell asleep with his head on his hand, feeling cozy and protected. It was morning, and Jin's animals were playing happily in the yard, enjoying the peace. Suddenly, the chipmunk noticed something, and his behavior changed dramatically. His coat bristled, and he began to hiss, showing signs of distress. It turned out that the chipmunk saw the snake that Jean was holding in his hands. Jean held the snake, its head near his neck, his gaze still cold. His eyes were full of determination as this hunter tried to attack his beloved animals. After quickly dealing with the snake, Jean panicked the chipmunk and the rooster who decided to run away when they saw this. After a while, Nor and Jin sat in the same place, watching the people move under the windows. Nor almost fell asleep, drooling, tired from a long day. Jin didn't go into details, concentrating on training his hearing by listening to the conversations around him. He heard a cloth seller offer a discount of 20 coins, 
but the buyer wanted forty, and nearby two women were discussing their husbands. Nor realized that Jean had a real knack for listening, and that could come in handy. Jean then turned to the teacher, saying, Teach me, I feel that I am very special. Could I really be a monster? He asked the teacher. You're not a monster, Nor replied. You just have abilities that others don't have. Besides, you have me. If you really were a monster, I wouldn't be around you, Nor said. The teacher explained this to Jin, but still wondered. Why is he so worried? Has something happened? Nor tried to remind Jin that it was important to always tell the truth and asked if he had been bullied by the boys at school again. Was the old academic ignoring him again? But this time it was not like that. He had heard a lot of praise lately and it seemed to him that the academician was even proud of him in front of others. Everything was fine, but sometimes Jean felt strange, like something was wrong. He had achieved everything he wanted, but now he didn't want to be alone and do nothing. Hearing this, the master gently placed his hand on Jin's head. He reminded him that he always had a teacher he could rely on. Master assured Jin that there was nothing to worry about. A smile appeared on Jin's face and he calmed down, letting go of all unnecessary thoughts. As long as you have teachers like me by your side, you'll be special whenever you want, the master added. Those were the last words the teacher spoke to Jin at that moment. Evening came, and Nor walked alone. Reflecting on the fact that he and Jin had reached a certain limit since Jin had learned to use his powers. Thank God he's starting to pay more attention to himself, Nor thought. The problem was that everything was not working as it should. However, Nor decided that it was necessary to try to find a way out and went deep into his thoughts. The next day, Nor set a table in front of Jin on which there were many dishes. To Jin's question, what is it? He replied, it's a destruction jar. If you want to feel better, you need to break a few pieces. Jin was worried that if he broke the dishes, his actions might be different from other people's actions. He asked the teacher if Noor himself had ever done this, because if you swing a stick, you can destroy not only dishes, but also several trees. After the teacher's answer, Jin went to the table, took one of the bowls and thought. He turned to Nora and said, I'm fine thanks to you. I've learned how to behave so people don't think I'm weird. Nor felt protected, knowing that Zhang was relying on him even though he himself was only eating and drinking, not doing anything special. He asked Jin to ignore it and explained that he didn't know how to solve the situation yet, but he promised that he would definitely find a solution and asked Jin to promise him one thing. Don't lie or hide anything from anyone, Nor said. Jin admitted that he would never go back to the time when he didn't know the master. He added that he would find a way to find him anyway. At that moment, Jin threw the plate and smashed it against a tree. After the crunch of the plate, Nor plunged into memories of his days as a warrior. He was sitting under a tree, bandaging his wounded arm, remembering those events. A friend approached him and asked him to express his thoughts. It was the moment when they had just finished the battle, and everyone was still under the impression. Comrade Nora came closer and began to bandage his arm, trying to help. He explained the smile on his face by the fact that it is always better to smile than cry, even in difficult situations. Nor noticed that his friend was not really happy, even when he was smiling. The fellow replied that it was ridiculous for he was the only one who could say so now. But Nor had one question that still interested him. He asked a friend if there was anything in the world that was really worth fearing. At first, the comrade repeated his question as if thinking. Then he explained that if he felt such fear, he would become a completely different person. Returning to the present, Nor remembered those words and thought, if I had not felt fear, what would I have become? He reflected that if he didn't feel fear, he would really change. But now he wondered, what was this boy afraid of, Jean? He walked around the room, thinking, but still couldn't figure out what exactly Jin should be afraid of. Nor came to the conclusion that he was the only link between this boy and his communication with the world. And no matter what happens, he has no right to betray him. So he decided to bring his idea to life, providing Jin with support and protection. Nor hoped his plan would work and went into the forest in the evening where he lit a fire to prepare for his next move. He looked at the mountain that rose before him. Wondering if he should try to climb it, he doubted whether he should do it because he felt very tired. Meanwhile, Jin walked along the path, passing the tombs that stood on either side of the road. The atmosphere was eerie, and suddenly there was a rustling sound behind him. The sound caught Jin's attention and he turned his head to look. Nearby, he saw two small deer standing quietly between the trees. Realizing that there was no threat, he simply yawned, calming down. Jin wondered why he was here now, instead of doing gymnastics on this moonlit night. He decided to lie down on a bush to rest for a while, feeling tired. Soon, his eyes closed and he fell asleep, drool running down his chin. And Nor, looking fearfully at the mountain, continued to stand. 
Thinking about what was waiting for him next, the next day Nor reflected that there was no point in Jin putting himself through these ordeals. He was sure that Jin misunderstood emotions, and it shouldn't happen like this. A visible and obvious result was needed. Then he remembered that he had already been in a similar situation, and then he should not have acted in the same way. Nor decided that he needed to focus only on a certain area and hurried to the exit. He met a butler on the street. He explained that there was an important matter that needed to be addressed to the master. Dvoretsky replied that he would have no problem informing about it in advance so that Nor could come at any convenient time. After a while, Master and Jin stood by the cow, not quite understanding what they were doing here. Nor wanted to see how cattle are properly slaughtered, and Jin immediately expressed his desire to try it too. But first Nor suggested just looking. The cow felt when it was approached, and knew why it was being untied. After that, the man picked up a large sharp stake and a hammer. The genie, seeing this, was walking along the forest path with the master and asked, What were you thinking when you saw the cattle being slaughtered? Nothing, Nor replied. I was simply pleasantly surprised by the master's skill. He did everything in one breath. He caught and killed the bull. Then the master asked Jin to pay attention to the fact that his peers usually sympathize with the bull before praising the skill of the butcher. To this Jin replied, And when they eat meat, do they also pity it? Nor agreed, but noted that children usually think differently. Jin then asked if the master wanted him to think differently, to which Nor said no. He just wanted Jin to know what people say before slaughtering a bull. The man turned to the bull, wishing him a better next life. Nor wanted Jin to understand why the children were trained before the first slaughter. People first imagine everything that is happening and try to come to terms with it. Nor also wanted Jin to explain to him why they were killing the bull. The genie replied, to eat him. Absolutely true, Nor said, and began to explain that when he was in the army, he killed people for survival, following the rules of the battlefield. He noted that even when he kills a mosquito, he does it not because it is annoying, but because it sucks blood. Jin thought Nor was dragging his feet and said curtly, You need a reason to kill. Nor realized that Jin was getting the point and continued, When you killed a rabbit or a chicken, you didn't have a good reason for it. However, Jin countered saying that he also has a reason why he acts like this. His reason was to achieve something on his own. He wanted to do something extraordinary, feeling like a god when he acted on his own. Hearing this, the master just hit his head with his hand, realizing the complexity of Jin's thoughts. What's wrong with you, master? Why are you like that? Jin asked. It's okay. I just remembered about mosquitoes, and they are here like here. I had to catch them to make excuses, Nor joked. Nor looked at Jin in a completely different way understanding his real reason. Jin was worried that his reason might seem strange, but Nor reassured him, saying that it was not strange but even special. He offered to continue the conversation, gradually revealing his thoughts. However, inside, Nor was worried that Jin barely understood what he was saying. This was exactly the moment he had been dreading, when Jin began to see the world differently. Nor told Jin that he understood his reason, but also noted that other people might not be able to understand him. Jin admitted that this was why he kept his distance from the others. But thanks to the master, that had changed now. Only with Nor could he be himself. And this was the result of his efforts. He did not give up when he sought to achieve his goal. The problem is the choice. Will you enjoy the gifts you receive when you become a ruler? Or will you settle for a little as others want? Nor asked. He asked Jin when the time came to feel it and think about what he really wanted. Jin, listening, agreed with the master's words. But Nor continued, Standing until the end is difficult, but one day you will come back here again and for now, you need to think things over. You have to choose between your reason for killing animals or the reason that normal people have. Jin could tell that the master was still worried about him, and that gave him confidence. Jin then calmed himself down by calling himself smart and confidently continued the conversation. He asked the teacher if the strange man they sometimes talked to had also killed people. I think so, replied Nor. Maybe that's why he decided not to do it anymore. He was very wise. After hearing the master's words, Jin's mind began to clear. He realized that people used to call him a ruthless puppy. But now everything has changed, and it was the result of his efforts. The master asked him not to forget this. After returning home, Jin changed his clothes and went to practice. Again, he trained until his body began to steam from the exertion. He performed incredibly beautiful sword strokes as he tried to hone his skills. However, it seemed to him that something was still wrong. He tried to change the technique and asked himself if it was possible to do it correctly. Yes, as the teacher showed, but something still did not give him peace. He walked over to the table where the book he had been studying was lying. 
This book had nothing but four words. Even picture books have more words. The movements shown had no logical connection and were not related to each other, which confused him. Ah Jin mused as he flipped through the book. Basically, it's not that useless if there's something to aim for. Nor came up to him with panic in his eyes and asked, What are you reading? He snatched the book from Jin's hands, explaining that it wasn't for him. Jean asked not to hide the book, as he believed that everything he had been taught recently was reflected in it. He didn't think Nor was reading it for self-comfort, and asked where he had bought the textbook, and if he had been tricked. Knorr objected, saying that he had not been tricked, that was impossible, but admitted that the movements in the book were indeed unrelated. Do you know that, Master? Jin asked. It's just an app, Nor explained, and suggested that Jin start training soon, since he still had to go to school. Nor watched Jin's movements and thought how wonderful it was to have such a student. He could feel how hard Jin was being trained, but it was a sign of progress. Nor looked at the book again, wondering if he really had been tricked. And Jin, at this moment, was completely focused on honing his shots, striving to achieve perfection. It's a new day, and it's time for classes at a private school. Each of the students went about their business until the academician arrived. He was, as usual, engrossed in the study of a book. But suddenly, he turned his attention to the street, looking out the window. There he saw Jin honing his movements as if he were holding a sword, even though he wasn't actually there. One noticed that Jin looked irritated and tense. Jin walked over to Vaughn and placed the book on the table in front of him. He asked to see, explaining that it was difficult for him to master the sword properly. Jean showed him a picture in the book and asked if he could go around in a circle, trying to do movements similar to the ones shown. One thought that if Jin stood firmly on his feet, even if the upper movements were wrong, he would still be able to keep his balance by placing his feet correctly. Jin invited one to train together at his house today. Do you have a lot of free time? You should be reading books, Vaughn remarked. However, after a while, Juan's face was tired and sweat was running down it. After a while, they were already training at Jin's house, doing exercises. Vaughn quickly tired and asked for a break as his legs were shaking and he could no longer continue. Sitting down next to Vaughn, Jin asked if he was confident in his knowledge. He started talking to Vaughn about his future and plans for life. They also discussed who would take the exam next. However, Jin said that he did not see the point in taking the preliminary exam. He saw no other way but to make a career and become famous. The sister came to them and informed them that dinner was ready. She prepared a lot of delicious rice and salad with meat. This meal alone brought a smile to our faces. The younger brother remarked how good it was that they talked every day. Jin asked Vaughn to pass it on to his brother. One ate silently with his head down, but these words made Jin think. He began to wonder why he came here so often. It had become a habit, but he did not like this sad dining table. He noticed that the baby sister Mimi was the same weight as himself, and this caused concern. The little sister turned to her brother, trying to get his attention. She said that there were rumors in the district about a band of robbers who robbed a neighboring village. The village, which is 30 miles from here, was attacked. Ten robbers ride on horses. Now the head of the village is gathering people and calls them to go on duty, said the sister. She added that one man should also leave their house. Hearing this, Jin thought the idea was useless. He noted that while on duty, they would not be able to stop the robbers, let alone detain them. Has an ordinary farmer ever been able to defeat such cruel people? He asked. Jean argued that it was better to raise money and hire warriors. This was his logical argument. He emphasized that it is not even that expensive, considering that their lives are at stake. However, Vaughn decided that he had to go anyway. Jean tried to convince him. Vaughn explained that this was his village's problem and he had to help because the villagers had helped them many times. Despite this, Jin continued to insist that Juan should just pay instead of going himself. Jin emphasized that he was telling the truth. The exams were coming up soon, and instead of preparing, one was spending his time on duty. Jin even began to raise his voice, saying that he understood Juan's desire to thank people for their help, but he would be able to do that when he became an official. He tried to explain that it is better to stand and tremble on duty or accept his help, pass the exams, and then help financially. Jin got the money, and after these arguments, one agreed to take it this time. It was enough, and Vaughn promised to return this money to Jin. However, Jin didn't even think about it because he had enough funds. On the way home, Jin reflects on Won's concern for him, stressing that it's late and he should hurry home. Jin decided that now was a great opportunity for him to practice his move. He started to do so, but suddenly he heard as if someone else was nearby. Two people with weapons in their hands were sitting behind the bushes. They debated whether he was a child, but then, after looking at his clothes, they realized that he was most likely rich. 
Jean overheard their conversation and realized that these were exactly the robbers they had warned about. They climbed out from behind the bushes and stood in front of him, blocking the way. They could not resist the temptation of the wealth they thought he might have. Jean thought quickly about the situation, looking for a way out, and came up with something. The robbers were confused by the fact that he was not at all afraid of them, but even laughed while standing in front of them. Are your parents around, or are you here alone? They asked. Observing their behavior, Jin noticed that they were chatting like lost children on their way back from the market. He began to pretend to be frightened, saying that he was leaving a friend's house and that his house was in another area. The robbers asked if he had any money, but looked a little scared themselves. When Jean said he had no money, they began to discuss what to do next. Pretending to release him today, they ordered him to appear tomorrow evening and bring money, otherwise there will be problems. What kind of nonsense? Some strange robbers. Do they even behave like that? Thought Jin. They probably shouldn't even have started their business. The genie decided to make fun of them and said that if the money could not be brought tomorrow, he would not be able to do anything. They only promised that he would be in big trouble if he didn't keep his promise. Jean pretended to be scared, changing his voice to a shaky one and asked if he could leave now. Then the robbers simply let him go, allowing him to go on. After walking a few steps, Jin turned back. He did this because one of them called out to him, attracting attention. But when Jin returned, he simply said that it was dark and asked him not to trip on the way home. After that, the robbers turned around and went in different directions. Now the only question remained. Would they really be waiting for him tomorrow at this place? The day seemed clear and calm, perfect for training energy when nature itself inspires concentration. Jin got up early in the morning to continue his training, enjoying the dawn silence and concentrating on his breathing. He tried to concentrate the energy in himself, carefully distributing it through his internal channels, watching every movement. Engrossed in the process, he did not notice how his father quietly approached him, watching his exercises. His father asked what he was doing, and Jean explained that he was practicing the breathing technique his teacher had taught him. However, the father was doubtful, because he did not understand how the teacher could teach such a technique, which seemed unusual to him. Jin once thought it was useless too, but despite his doubts, he continued training, convinced of their effectiveness. At first, the teacher kept emphasizing the development of the core, and Jin felt that his tan, once as small as a seed, had now grown to the size of a fist. These words made the father think, because now he understood that the teacher really had knowledge, and asked his son if he could release the energy outside. Jin replied with a smile that of course he could, and even wanted to demonstrate it to his father. Jin focused energy into his hands, and his palms began to emit a powerful aura that pulsed around him. At that moment, a sphere began to form in front of him, swirling the air around it as if an invisible vortex was gaining strength. It was the maximum he was capable of at the moment, but even so, the technique looked impressive. The father, noticing this, was surprised to ask what else the teacher had taught him, but he felt something strange in the air. He realized that something was wrong, although he was happy about his son's progress, despite the fact that the son could already compete with experienced warriors. This was not enough. The father expected his son to be a level higher than an ordinary warrior, showing his talent. He praised Jin for being able to defend himself, noting that the level he had achieved was a testament to his hard training. After showing off his skills, Jin stood in front of his father, waiting for his reaction. The father praised the physical training, but added that he would like to see his son's success in studies as well. Jin promised that he would not be distracted from his studies and would make an effort to show progress. The father, without saying another word, quietly walked away, leaving his son alone with his thoughts. All Jin wanted was his father's praise, but all he got in return was a thoughtful look. Now it remains for him to prove his prowess in learning and prepare for the Guangxi trial. Jin was soon on his way to the rendezvous ready for the next leg of his journey. He waited patiently for the others to appear, his gaze directed into the distance. He didn't care why they were taking time because he was focused on his goal. A figure soon appeared on the horizon and Jin knew they had finally arrived. His gaze met several people. The whole team appeared at the meeting place. They didn't believe that Jin would actually come, but he didn't disappoint and stood confidently in front of them. This group looked hostile and one of them held a sharp knife near Jin's face, showing his intentions. The thugs demanded money from Jin, and he didn't hesitate to pull out a pouch full of coins to meet their demands. One of the scoundrels, joyfully beginning to pour out the contents of the bag, was surprised to see something strange among the coins. He found an object that surprised him, not understanding what it was or where it came from. Counting the coins, he was confused. There were a lot of them, but he could not understand where the boy could get so many valuables. 
Jin sarcastically stated that they were real fools. In his place, he would have simply taken what was given and kept his promise by letting him go. However, the bandits began to argue among themselves, because they expected to receive only 30 coins, but instead Jin brought much more. Suddenly, the face of one of them changed. He looked depressed, as if something was important to him. He began apologizing, saying that they only wanted to survive and did not expect to receive so much. Now they offered to take Jin with them, because no one had brought them more before. Hearing this, Jin was confused and didn't know how he should take it. However, despite his doubts, he decided to go with them, wanting to learn more. They led him to an abandoned farm surrounded by crumbling buildings and wasteland. Jin could not understand how it was possible to survive in such a place. One of the thugs said that if their heads worked better, they wouldn't have touched him because his father would have paid the ransom anyway. Jin wondered why he had voluntarily come here, because it seemed completely illogical. He was put in a cramped room, given some raw corn, which was difficult to eat. Then they locked him up, as if they had put him in prison, although it looked ridiculous. The worst part was that the room was infested with bugs, but Jin could easily escape. However, he decided to stay because it was interesting. He understood that he could easily get out. If they had really kidnapped him, they would have at least tied him up or secured him so he wouldn't run away. When Jin finally came out of his so-called prison, he noticed a group of children playing nearby. Approaching them, he smiled and said, Little one, come to me. I have something for you. Jean pulled out the corn the bandits had given him and handed it to the children who surrounded him. He told them that if they were hungry, they could come and take food without feeling ashamed. He noted that these children did not look like the local residents, among whom the robbers live, but looked like ordinary poor people. The children eagerly pounced on the corn, and it was evident that they were very hungry, for they looked exhausted. They told Jean about their difficult life how rarely they managed to find even a little food. Jin noticed that the field nearby looked well kept and asked why they had no food. The children explained that everything is because of black people. Jin asked who the blacks were, and the children answered that they were notorious robbers who terrorized the local area, so violent that even the authorities could not stop them. They stole food, cattle, and even bulls. The children, remembering the bull that these robbers took from them, said that this bull was very important to their community and even the adults cried when it happened. It turned out that the bull was the main source of food in the village, and the children sincerely hoped that one day they would grow up and take revenge on the robbers, restoring justice. Tears streamed down their faces and Jin asked them not to cry, trying to cheer them up. Later, when night came, everyone gathered around the fire where the bandits were sitting. Jin walked up to them and bluntly stated that they were a bunch of losers if they couldn't handle a captive properly. He asked if they had indeed made a decision. What were they going to do with him next, and why was it taking so long? One of the thugs said they planned to ransom him and then let him go. But they didn't know how rich Jin really was. Jin explained that his family lives quite well, and they have no idea how much they can get. The bandits admitted that they wanted at least 30 silver coins, but Jin thought that was too little. He wondered why they were so afraid of the blacks. They were just a group of bandits. One of the poor people said that the blacks are not just robbers but a whole group that travels on horses. They are cruel and ruthless, and if not ransomed, they can kill. At that moment, an idea flashed through Jin's mind that he had once heard from an old acquaintance of his. If these blacks are really that ruthless, he will be ready to deal with them himself. Jin did not understand how the bandits planned to get a ransom for him. They explained that one of them would go to his house and demand a ransom. Jin warned them that if they simply went to his family's palace and announced the kidnapping, it would be true suicide as the authorities would destroy them in an instant. Jin explained that anyone who dares to come to his family with a ransom demand will immediately lose his head. The authorities act ruthlessly. He added that the local feudal lords would quickly find and destroy the robbers because they evaded taxes and there would be no one left who could be ransomed. If they choose to expose themselves, their heads are simply chopped off and returned to their father as a warning. Therefore, Jin proposed not to report the abduction, but to act decisively and harshly, taking the initiative. Jin wondered why he was even telling them all this, since they had kidnapped him, and now he was protecting their interests. But looking at these destitute people, he felt a certain softness in his heart. He felt a little sorry for them, because they looked so tired and hopeless. Jin caught himself thinking that maybe his plan could actually work and make a difference. If everything works out, these people will see him as their savior and then they will honor him all their lives, respecting the help he provided in the most difficult time for them. The Lord was sitting in his office, carefully examining the portrait that hung on the wall, as if trying to understand something important. 
He had just been informed of the report, in which there should be no mistakes, for the old man in question was only an ordinary soldier. In those days, Chongman was the commander-in-chief, and if it really was him, then everything was right, the servant remarked. The servant confirmed the master's guesses, answering his questions and adding that the information was similar to the truth. However, if this is really so, then what is the connection between the events? Because if the old man is not an ordinary soldier, then it has a different meaning. There were only rumors that Commander Zhongman taught martial arts to his soldiers, but this was unconfirmed. The master checked the skills of the main servant and did not notice anything serious. So, how did he teach Kanzen? Because he himself does not have such skills. The secretary did not understand how this happened, because only the leader and his advisor in their house possessed martial arts, no one else. It turns out that this is really a mystery, because even if he knew about the existence of technology at his age, he could not learn it on his own. His advisor then told him that Teacher Guang bought martial arts books in the village, and perhaps this knowledge was gained from them. But if it is really so, which of the unknown authors could raise the combat level like that? After all, books usually do not contain such deep knowledge. Therefore, the owner decided that it was necessary to check all the books, and especially the old keeper, because this could not go unnoticed. If this matter is underestimated, a threat may arise, and martial arts knowledge may spread. There is a risk that this knowledge will be used by everyone without control, leading to chaos. The Lord, remembering his late wife, thought, Perhaps Kanjin really began to study martial arts. He remembered the times when he took part in battles and how much he worried about his son. Holding a wooden sword in his hands, he read the notes, scrutinizing every word, trying to find a clue. Even if everything written in the book is correct, the movements described there looked a bit strange. He thought that the legs should be strong and the back should be correct because this is the basis of any martial art. If a warrior with minimal knowledge were in Jin's place, it would be difficult for him to understand these subtleties and avoid defeat. The owner realized that he needed to change his approach to training in order to achieve new results. He began to practice, perfecting his movements, gradually finding a better way to perform the technique. Soon his movements became more precise and his technique smoother and more confident. Over time, he began to feel that he was even better at performing these techniques than before. However, without a mentor, he could not be sure that he was doing everything correctly, and he doubted whether he was wasting his time. From the beginning of the training, his back hurt a lot, but he did not stop, thinking that it was part of the process. Although the technique looked impressive, he planned to later teach it to a young master to pass the knowledge on. Meanwhile, we returned to Jin, who stayed in the village that evening trying to implement his plan. His brilliant idea gradually lost its perfection, and he realized that the situation was more complicated than it seemed. Jin decided to ask the locals if the bandits would leave them alone if they were paid, but the residents replied that they could not just give money, because if they paid, the bandits would continue their attacks. It turns out that this is a closed circle. They pay. The bandits rob and come back again with new demands. Jin asked what to do then. Capture someone again and demand a ransom? He offered to go to the main palace and tell everything, but the people were afraid that they would be punished for not paying taxes. They thought long and hard about how to solve the problem and decided that the best way was to keep him captive. But they understood that this was only a temporary measure. Jin decided to take control of the situation, planning to bide his time, knowing that help could come very soon. He understood that it is not possible to inform his father now, because he is taking all the responsibility on himself, and there will be no room for mercy. The problem was that no one should find out about the situation, and he knew that the teacher would find him soon. Jin asked the locals to bring coal and boards, planning something important. He stressed that they should do it as soon as possible without delaying a moment. Jin soon spoke with another of the local villagers, trying to organize the next step in his plan. After explaining the situation to him, Jean sent him forward with an important task, to meet the right person. When the villager arrived at his destination, he told everything to Jin's teacher, informing him of what was happening. The teacher heard about the boy, whom he knew well, and realized that the matter was serious. He couldn't understand why Jin was acting like this, but he decided not to delay and prepare for the meeting. Soon he was on his way, planning to arrive at the place as soon as possible. At dawn, the teacher was already there, ready for action. Meanwhile, Jean continued his training on the lawn, confident in his plan. He believed that the teacher would like his idea and that he would be able to make it so that no one would get hurt. Bandits also came early in the morning, preparing for another meeting. The villagers, however, were afraid that they would not receive a ransom and did not know what to do in such a situation. Jean calmed them down, explaining that it wasn't about money, 
He went to the teacher for help, but the peasants insisted that they needed money because it was with them that they could buy off the bandits. Jin assured them that everything was under control and asked them to wait a bit. He pulled a bag of silver from his pocket saying that it would be enough to temporarily hold off the bandits. Jin emphasized that even when he was captured, he was helping them, and it was a gesture of mercy on his part. Soon, all the villagers gathered at the meeting place, where bandits on horses were supposed to appear, waiting for a ransom. The bandits looked at the frightened and depressed villagers, seeing in them only an opportunity to get rich. They could not understand where these people got such a large amount of money, because there was nothing of value in this place. The bandits were surprised, and one of them announced that he would bring more of his men to restore order here and establish his control. The bandits thought that if the villagers continued to pay so diligently, they had big plans for this community. One of the representatives of the village begged them to leave them alone, explaining that they were defenseless and had no way to fight. However, the bandits said that now, the Iron Blood Gang will be able to provide them with protection and security in the village. However, this protection will only be extended for a month if they agree to pay monthly for such a service. The thugs stressed that they would have to pay every month or they would not get any help. The villagers explained that they had no money at all, but the bandits didn't care at all. They were only interested in profit. In his thoughts, the chief bandit planned that if the villagers paid once, they would continue to pay. The peasants became indignant, claiming that their master could not treat them like this. Such a situation was unacceptable for them, because they were barely surviving. But the thug decided to intimidate them, stressing that they should feel fear every day, and then they would pay. He warned that failure to pay would lead to serious consequences for them. A simple peasant raised his voice and declared that they really had no money. One of the thugs instantly punched him in the face, causing him to fall to the ground with a heavy blow. The peasant fell, feeling the ground accept his weight under the force of the brutal blow. The thugs began to kick him, forcing him to abandon his words and obey their demands. The man, lying on the ground, begged for help, his voice echoing through the crowd. The gang commander watched all this with a laugh, enjoying how fear gripped the villagers, forcing them to obey. Their plan worked perfectly, because the villagers, without weapons and strength, could not resist the bandits. Suddenly there were words addressed to the bandits who called them real fools. The main thug turned around, looking for the one who dared to speak so boldly. Jin, standing confidently, declared that their Gang of Iron Blood deserved a new name. Gang of Iron Fools. He emphasized that the name should match their miserable appearance, causing anger and indignation among the bandits. The bandit, seeing the impudent boy, was stunned and could not believe his audacity. Jin asked him, If he had already taken money from the common people, why did he continue to beat them? You got what you wanted. Then what's the problem? Is it enough for you? Jin asked mockingly, and the thug assumed that it must be the boy's money. Jin, looking directly into the bandit's eyes, asked what else he wanted. The bandit laughed evilly, looking at the villagers, and emphasized that the real treasure was in front of him, the one who brought the money. The beaten peasant tried to explain that Jin was just a child and had nothing to do with them. The big bald thug kicked him, saying they'd figure it out now, and told him to shut up. It was clear that ordinary peasants could not tolerate such abuse, but did not have the strength to resist. The genie did not understand why the villagers did not fight back and urged the bandit to stop this bullying. In response, the bandit only smiled, not taking the boy's words seriously. The bald thug began to beat the peasant even harder, demonstrating his strength. But when he turned, his gaze met an attack flying in his direction. Jin couldn't stand it and threw himself at him, no longer having the strength to look at the injustice. The bald thug tried to hit the boy, but Jin deftly dodged the blow. He tried to strike with all his might, but Jin dodged his every move. The bald man missed Jin's cold, precise punch, and a look of shock appeared on his face. Out of surprise, he began to sway, trying to regain his balance. However, Jin didn't give him a chance. His legs sharply hit the bandit, hitting the target. The bald man flew to the side, like a great monster that had been knocked down by force. He flew away like a doll, falling far to the side, unable to get up. Seeing their bald comrade knocked down, the gang rushed at Jin from all sides, trying to attack him. However, all their blows were too slow for the young master. He easily predicted their movements. Jean read them ahead of time and cold-bloodedly analyzed their every move. When they finished their combo, Jin grabbed one by the collar and threw him to the ground like a helpless plant. The bandit fell to the ground like a leaf, not having a chance to get up. There was one more bandit who also tried to attack. Jin knocked all his strength out of him with a punch, making him cry out in pain. Then with a kick, he forced him to bend down, and with another blow knocked out his teeth. 
Jin's leg landed squarely and the thug fell, powerless. The whole team of miserable bandits lay on the ground, moaning impotently. It was obvious that this was not just a boy, Somya. For the gangsters, he became the real embodiment of the devil. The villagers couldn't understand how such a boy could even agree to be kidnapped if he was so good at fighting. Jin, looking at them, made it clear that this was no accident. After all the enemies were defeated, he asked the villagers to do something with them. When the villagers asked why he did this, Jin replied, Are you going to put up with this kind of abuse much longer? Jin expressed his opinion that these bastards behave like animals after receiving money, and asked the villagers why they were so concerned about it. He emphasized that if there were only one bandit, they might be able to protect the village. But there could be hundreds of them. Jin asked if they believed that one gang could have hundreds of people. Because even in the state there are not many such numerous gangs. Even a dozen attackers were a big problem for the villagers. Jin realized that he had slightly overlooked all the consequences, as his teacher always told him to consider the consequences before acting. He decided that he needed to go to the bandit camp and find out the whole truth. He emphasized that if the bandits come again and try to take the money, there will be big problems. It must be solved from the root. Jin was convinced that the problem should be solved at an early stage in order to protect the village. The frightened villagers did not know what he was leading to and were confused by his words. Jin started to get nervous, looking at the faces of the villagers, thinking that maybe they have a better plan to solve the problem. But he doesn't know about it. After a while, they put the bandits in a dungeon, tying them up and making them sit, staring at each other. The bald bandit pulled out a hidden knife and, unseen by others, cut the rope. He whispered to his comrades that once they got out, they would kill all the villagers, leaving a few alive to spread rumors. He promised that the boy who defeated them would definitely suffer the most severe punishment. They were going to enact the most brutal method of revenge they could imagine. Jean watched them from the window, clearly understanding what the thugs were planning. He heard their threats and understood that they were bent on revenge. The leader of the bandits could not come to terms with the fact that the little boy had defeated them and wanted revenge. Jin, looking at their angry faces, felt joy, realizing that he had done the right thing, thinking about the consequences. Suddenly, the bandits noticed that the door of the dungeon began to open. Jin walked towards them, walking calmly towards his enemies. He walked up to the bald thug and without hesitation kicked him, knocking the knife out of his hands. After that, Jin dug a deep hole for them and, without delay, threw all the bandits into it. Trapped, the thugs began to beg for mercy, realizing that their fate was in Jin's hands. They realized that the situation had become critical, but Jin calmly continued to act according to his plan. Jin reminded them that they once thought of him as a boy who made mistakes, but now he shows that he can think of consequences. He said that if they disappear, then there will be no more problems, the future will be calm. The bandits begged him to spare them, promising to do whatever he asked. But Jin asked if they wanted to know how to save themselves. He turned to the Iron Blood Gang and asked how many people were actually in their group. One of the bandits admitted that there were only about 200 of them. If they don't return, their gang will be in great danger. Jin began to throw dirt at them, burying them, because, as he said, those who lie to his face do not deserve to live. He knew that 200 people was a lie because if there really were that many, they would have been destroyed a long time ago. The bald bandit, facing the ground on his head, began to surrender and confess. Jean decided that he finally found someone who was telling the truth, but the rest of his friends who lied must pay. The bandits, realizing what awaited them, began to ask for forgiveness, and assured that they were ready to tell the whole truth. Jean decided to keep only one of them alive, the one who would provide the most information about the gang and their plans. The screams of the bandits fighting for their lives echoed from the pit as they raced to tell more. Jin listened intently, voraciously gathering their information, satisfied that his plan was working. He noted that everything was going according to his plan, and that the bandits were wasting their energy under the guise of noble goals. After hearing all the information he needed, Jean decided that there was no point in keeping them alive. However, the bandits recalled that Jin had promised to keep them alive if they told the truth. Jin played a fool, saying that he promised to give the key to salvation, but did not say that he was going to leave them alive. This meant that he was going to kill them, and they threatened him that they would become ghosts and find him. The genie just laughed at their words, finding the belief in ghosts ridiculous, and continued to cover them with dirt as if they were common criminals. He stated that even their confessions would not change his decision. It was only justice. The thugs couldn't believe that a young guy could be so cruel. 
but Jin continued to cover them with dirt. Jin emphasized that there are many such bastards who cause trouble for others on this earth, and they deserve to be punished. Suddenly, he was stopped by a familiar voice that he immediately recognized. Jin turned his head in surprise to see who this mysterious person was. The young master's teacher looked at him with disbelief, as if he were crazy, not understanding what was happening. Jin explained his actions by saying that he was just having fun, trying to find some kind of way out of the situation. But the teacher, with seriousness in his voice, asked what he was really doing and whether he was aware of his actions. Meanwhile, the robbers, buried up to their necks in a hole, shouted for help. This ridiculous situation alarmed the teacher because he did not understand what Jin's actions meant. Jin began to explain that he was finishing what he had started. He explained the essence of the situation in detail, trying to justify his actions. After hearing the story, the teacher could not believe that his student was really going to bury these people alive. Jin, for his part, explained that he was acting rationally. If he let them go alive, they would return with the gang and destroy the village. In his opinion, this was the most effective way to get rid of the problem. He believed that these robbers were already imbued with darkness, and the best thing was to get rid of them without making too much noise. The teacher, however, understood that if even one member of the gang found out about this, they would come in a whole gang and cause great harm to the villagers. He asked what Jean would do then. Jin replied that he could destroy these bandits at any moment and protect the village, confident that the locals would not tell anyone about what had happened. However, the teacher thought that this was a naive thought, and explained that sooner or later the information would come out anyway, and he should have told him everything from the beginning. Jin admitted that he wanted to do it, but he knew that the bandits would still demand money, and he wasn't sure that ordinary people could handle the situation. He decided to act on his own, believing that this was the only way out of the situation. He asked the teacher what he would do in his place, wanting to hear a different solution. Jin continued, stressing that the teacher hadn't given him any reason why he shouldn't do that, and that he had no better option than to just say no. The teacher understood that it was impossible to act like that, but he himself did not know what decision would be correct in the situation. He knew that a mistake could destroy his reputation in an instant. Suddenly, he loudly ordered Jin to forget the existence of this village, forbidding him from any further contact. He sternly ordered Jin to follow his instructions without question. Jin reacted with disbelief, because the teacher's words seemed to him meaningless and made no sense. The teacher noticed the hurt in Jin's eyes, realizing that his words had hurt the boy. The teacher ordered Jin to go first, assuring him that he would stay and clean up and deal with the situation. He emphasized that the boy must not come back here again and must leave immediately without promising anything else. The teacher hugged Jin, asking him to try not to catch anyone's eye as he left. After that, Jin left the village, leaving behind his doubts. But each of them had an unpleasant residue in their hearts after this conversation. The teacher took the shovel and decided to finish the work started by his student. He understood that it was dangerous to intervene in this situation, but he could not do otherwise. Despite the complexity of the situation, he had no choice but to continue what Jin had started and began burying the thugs. Later, in the office of the elders, he resolved important issues related to the management of the village. Suddenly, the butler Chan approached him, carefully knocking on the door. When the butler came in, the leader thought that maybe he was looking for some drinking company. But today it was impossible, because there was a problem that caused difficulties for the young master, and it was necessary to discuss it. Apart from the butler and the secretary, there was no one in the room, only those with whom serious matters could be discussed. The leader understood that the situation was serious, and now was not the time for alcohol. He decided to briefly describe the problem in order to immediately proceed to the solution. The secretary listened carefully, realizing that with these gangs no trace could be left. They agreed that if there was even the slightest trace of them, it could lead to further problems. The leader thanked the secretary for his support and took responsibility to resolve the issue. The secretary promised that all problems would be resolved and steps would be taken to destroy all evidence. However, the leader asked that this should not happen again stressing that he would personally monitor further actions and said goodbye as he left the room. The leader left the secretary, leaving him in a state of mild embarrassment from the information he had received. The secretary felt that the situation was serious and understood that it should be brought to the attention of the leader as soon as possible. He knew he had to be careful to avoid unnecessary consequences. The next morning, Jin began his usual training, diligently honing his fighting skills. It was impressive that he got up so early and concentrated on his technique perfecting each movement. He trained diligently, perfecting his moves, repeating every punch and technique twice. 
The teacher noticed that Jin was doing well, but decided it was time to learn more about what happened in the village, which he had never explained before. Jin was interested in the answers to that situation, so he couldn't leave the question open. The teacher understood that if he told the truth about the possibility of killing the bandits, it could only make the situation worse. So he asked Jin what he thought about it, but added that it didn't really matter anymore. The teacher asked his student to trust him and not worry too much about what happened. However, due to his natural curiosity, Jin couldn't ignore it. But the teacher promised that he would tell everything when the time came. Jin decided to accept this answer and wait until the mentor was ready to reveal all the cards. The teacher gave the good news. He noticed that Jin's core had increased in size, signifying significant progress in his development. When asked how Jin was feeling, he pointed to the very small size with his fingers, saying that the kernel had become the size of a pea. Jean, confident in his abilities, decided to show what he is now capable of. Getting into a fighting stance, he began to accumulate his energy, focusing all his efforts on creating a strike. Soon, a larger ball of energy formed in his hands than he expected. Jin figured out how to use his new power, although he still didn't fully control it, gradually mastering the technique step by step. He managed to focus and greatly increase his strength, surprising even himself with his progress. Jin's punches became much stronger, each one releasing his internal energy, creating a powerful surge of power. His punches started sending out energy waves and even the teacher was surprised to see it. For the teacher, it was an impressive sight to see the boy hone his skills and control his power. Jin had been training for a long time to create such waves, but he was getting worried because his power was growing more and more. Because of this, his head and neck sometimes hurt and the pain sometimes reached the top of his head, which worried him. The teacher understood in his thoughts that such symptoms usually appeared before a person reached a state of overflowing energy. But previously, this was considered almost impossible. He decided to reassure Jin that it wasn't serious, and the best thing for him right now was to rest. But the boy felt that something inside him was trying to break out, and he continued to train. The teacher also remembered this feeling, although it had never actually happened to him. He had only heard about it. We returned to the advisor who asked one of the members of the secret group if everything was done neatly. The secret agent assured that there was no reason to worry. Everything was done with quality and without any traces. The advisor wondered why the secret group had undertaken this task, but he knew that their mission was to appear only in the event of a threat to life. In any case, this was the first place where trouble could arise, and the agent knew that the old man would come, so she continued her work. To say she was special is an understatement. She promised to provide more accurate information next time. The girl unquestioningly agreed with the orders and soon left the meeting place. Now the advisor had only to inform the leader about the situation, its consequences, and proposed solutions. He never expected that man to just come and ask for help like this. In any case, the advisor understood that much was at stake, and his further activities depended on it. He had to work to find out the whole truth about that boy, gathering all possible facts and uncovering the true essence of what was happening. After some time, a family dinner was held, where all family members gathered at one table. Zhang looked rather pensive, his mind clearly occupied with something important. At the next table, his sister was talking to his brother about how the robbers had suddenly disappeared. One of the villages that suffered constant attacks reported that the robbers came, said that they would not rob again, and simply left. This seemed quite strange even to Jin, as such behavior seemed unnatural to him. He could not believe that everyone was happy about such an event, although it was clear that these robbers had been on the nerves of the local residents for a long time. But something still did not leave him. There was a feeling that the situation remained incomplete or unclear. Seeing her brother's thoughtful face, her sister asked what was bothering him. Jean replied that it was just curiosity. He explained that he did not believe that the robbers simply lagged behind the villagers. If some hero did show up and stop them, it would be a noble deed, but did that really happen? In his opinion, such things usually do not happen in real life. The villagers could solve the problem on their own, but what exactly happened remained a mystery. If this hero really exists and defeated the bandits, the question of whether he can be considered bad or good remained unanswered. It was a rather strange question, but his brother replied that it was a special case. He added that everything depends on the situation because sometimes circumstances change perception. The brother noted that the law is the minimum requirement, but sometimes circumstances violate the law and then the foundation of truth can be shaken. Thus, the brother evaded a direct answer to the question of whether this person was good or bad. He continued by explaining that a person who breaks the law is not necessarily bad or good, 
Jin asked how this could be understood, but his brother asked him, if he himself caught the robbers, would he kill them all at once? Jin took his time to answer, considering the question. The brother continued, stressing that he didn't know the man's motives, but perhaps that hero just genuinely wanted to help the villagers without any selfish intentions. This answer made Jin bite his lip, thinking that the motives may actually be deeper than they seem at first glance. That night the young master met with his teacher, wanting to discuss his thoughts. He told him about Cat, whom he had seen today, and who seemed to him rather unusual and withdrawn. The teacher understood that principles are an important part of life, and if someone has them, it is good, because it is principles that help move forward. However, Jean admitted that the word principles did not mean much to him. The teacher decided to explain that it is easy to talk about principles, but it is very difficult to follow them because they are promises to oneself. When you promise something to another person, two people know about it. But when it concerns a principle, only you know it. He emphasized that following one's own principles is extremely difficult and requires great inner strength. Jin began to understand that his teacher's action was also a manifestation of principle, since he did not explain to him the real reason for his actions. The teacher hesitated in his mind as to whether he should reveal everything to Jin, but decided not to for now. The main thing he wanted to convey to Jin was the need to think things through, because not following this rule could ruin everything. If Jin wants to be respected, he must always think about the consequences of his actions. Patting Jin on the head, the teacher tried to convey this thought to his student, hoping he would understand. That night the leader was busy reading books, trying to find answers to his questions. He flipped through the pages, analyzing the information one by one, looking for clues. Something in one of the books caught his eye, making him stop. He realized that he had found what he was looking for, the basic knowledge of martial arts that was the basis of training, but seemed simple. This meant that he was getting closer to understanding how his son was taught martial arts and how the knowledge was passed down to Kanjin in general. Although the techniques in the book looked boring, the teacher was extraordinary. He was able to cause changes in the student and light the fire of the desire to learn. The leader realized that if his son's power was taught useful things, it would be a great achievement. Although Jin's strength was not yet too great, he knew that whatever his son learned would bring him the highest results. However, the person who had awakened a spark in Gina left behind many questions, making you wonder about her true intentions. For example, it is not clear how he knows the other techniques, which has raised many questions for him. The next day, the teacher realized that he had pushed Jin too much in his training and decided to calm him down a bit by buying some useless book. Walking along the road, he met the owner, who was to fulfill his request. This new person has already come and thanked them for waiting for him. There was a meeting to be had in a bustling bar, and the teacher took a seat waiting for this man. They began to listen to the stories of the mercenary who performed at the bar, and some of them were quite interesting. The teacher, sipping a delicious drink, pondered that Jin should learn battle tactics, so he decided to listen to these stories. Although the mercenary didn't reveal any important details, the teacher did find some basic information for Jin's training. Leaving the bar, the teacher even felt sick to his stomach from these stories, but he had already prepared the program he planned to teach his student. A genie appeared on the horizon and asked where his teacher was, but the teacher replied that he had come because he was worried about his student. The young master joked with a smile, asking what the teacher had prepared for him this time. Perhaps stories about the war between dynasties or something like that, since he had no plans to become a warrior. The teacher was a little embarrassed by such an answer, not expecting such a reaction. Jin went on to say that the teacher might not bother, as stories about ancient legends would be enough for him. Despite this, the teacher still wanted to see Jin train and invited him to show off his skills. Jin quickly got into a fighting stance, showing off his techniques. It looked like a joke to him, but he still readily showed his skill. To the teacher, these movements were basic fundamentals, but to Jin they seemed like empty talk. The teacher was already tired of Jin constantly clinging to his words and suggested that he just train seriously. Jin was interested in who would be chosen to take the exam and he was impatiently waiting for this information. Soon, all the students gathered in front of the elder, preparing for an important announcement. All the disciples had to concentrate and fight their own doubts as they stood before the elder. Although the elder was not an examiner, he promised to treat each of them leniently because they were all his pupils. He urged them not to be afraid to express their opinion, because they earned it with their persistence. Jin, however, was bored, finding everything going on extremely uninteresting. He was just waiting for the moment when it was all over and he could leave, 
He remembered the moment when he and his brother sat at the table and looked at books on martial arts. Jin then asked his brother why he was studying all this, knowing that he would have serious rivals and whether it would be useful for him. He was just studying it, thinking it was nothing special. Suddenly an elder appeared behind him, glaring at Jin. As Jin sat next to the elder, listening to his boring speech, he felt as if he had dug a hole for himself. The teacher turned to Jin, trying to get his attention. He said that he has high hopes for Jin and believes in his potential. For Jin, these words were unexpected. He did not expect such a turn. It was difficult to feel the responsibility for these words. And he began to think about what awaits him next. Jin spent the whole night looking at old books, deciphering incomprehensible runes and symbols that did not lend themselves to his understanding. His gaze became more and more tired, and he wondered why he was doing this at all when he had so many other important things to do. But suddenly, like thunder in the middle of a clear sky, a mysterious guest appeared in the room, watching him from the shadows. It was the overlord, his father, appearing without warning, silently watching Jin. The father suddenly appeared in the darkness of the room, stopping in the doorway as if checking on his son. He noticed that Jin was diligently studying the magic books, and his eyes lit up with pride for his studious offspring. Jean sensed something unusual, wary in his father's behavior, as if he was hiding his true intentions. The owner did not come for nothing. He wanted to praise his son for his tireless work and to say that he appreciated his efforts. The father admitted that he was too cold, and now he is happy to support all the expenses of his successful offspring in education. He emphasized that a boy named Devon, one of his most devoted students, helped him with many things. The young master agreed with his father because Devon became his faithful friend with whom they study and improve together. The father was pleased that his son had such a reliable companion. Jean emphasized that he and Devon are always learning together, supporting each other in difficult moments. The father, not wanting to burden his son, still had high hopes for him, hoping that he would not let him down. Jin confidently assured that he would do everything in his power not to disappoint him and live up to all expectations. A new challenge appeared on the path of the young owner, which he had never expected to meet before. He didn't think he could talk about it so openly with anyone but Devon and his family. Of course, it all didn't seem that important, but Jin continued his studies without stopping. He knew that his father was counting on him and this thought pushed him to new heights. It was the first time his father had expressed his expectations so directly, and Jin couldn't let him down. For the first time in his life, Jean felt that his father really relied on him, and this gave him strength. At the same time, he began to practice martial arts, strengthening not only his mind, but also his body. With each workout, his body overflowed with energy, and he felt himself getting stronger. Jean was sure that soon everything would fall into place and his efforts would pay off. The combination of study and training gradually began to bear fruit, and Jean was happy with his progress. The lessons and regular training were finally starting to pay off, turning him into a more skilled warrior. Jean realized that his path was the right one, and each day gave him strength and confidence. His teacher was nearby, and advised Jin to get some rest, because there were still long hours of study ahead. However, the teacher, freezing on the roof, did not agree to leave his student, even when sleep was already closing his eyes. After all, Jin decided to combine wisdom and fighting skills, and the mentor knew that he should be there to help him. However, since the teacher's age required a regimen, Jin insisted that he go to rest and regain his strength. The mentor understood that Jin was worried about him, and this clearly demonstrated how the boy had grown up and become more responsible. He knew that if Jin passed the exam, his heart would be filled with endless joy for his student. But Jin tried to explain that a mentor would not always be around, and his life was not limited to battles only. Learning was also an important part. However, Jin laughed and joked that his mentor couldn't even read, and that was a real irony. The teacher emphasized that this is why Jin must surpass him and become better at everything. After all, in his youth, even the mentor dreamed of learning and gaining knowledge, striving for a better future. But fate turned so that everything went awry and he could not fulfill his dreams. Jin assured the mentor that he trusted him and would do everything possible to realize what his teacher had once failed to do. The next morning, the boy had to wake up early to continue his training and studies. A new day began, filled with learning and training, which had already become his daily routine. It would seem that it was not easy, and many could think that he did not understand everything, but it was not so. Jin has been studying hard all this time and has already acquired a lot of important knowledge that strengthened his mind. His state had set a goal that led him to the ultimate goal, and he was determined to achieve it. Jin will not rest until he achieves his goal, because this has become a personal challenge for him. 
For this, he still needed discipline and endurance, but he knew that he would be able to cope. And this moment of success will be very soon. He felt it and was ready for challenges. Gene promised himself that he would exceed all expectations and achieve success in everything he undertook. Over time, his body became stronger. The feeling of strength and endurance filled him every day. His physical form strengthened, and his breathing became deeper and more confident, like steel. In both his studies and his training, Jean moved in the right direction, pursuing his goal with unwavering determination. The martial arts began to bear fruit, and Jin felt a completely different power filling his body with energy. Rumors of his abilities and success began to appear in the villages, and people mentioned his name more and more often. One day, the teacher came to Jin to talk, but his words were full of mysterious hints. He talked about the success of the young owner and how his life and path are changing. Jin grew up and did not understand why the teacher decided to come, especially after his recent illness, because he would be better off resting. The teacher, however, was offended that he was treated as if he were sick because of a cold and decided to go out into the fresh air. Jin asked him to stay close and not go to the neighboring village for fun, so as not to harm his health. However, the teacher assured him that he was in the prime of life, though Jin, of course, had some doubts. To prove his strength, the teacher even asked Jin to climb on his back, but the boy was no longer a child. The teacher joked that for him, Jin would remain a little student until his hundredth birthday, and until he reaches a hundred years old, he will consider him his little ward. The teacher jokingly began to squeeze Jin's cheeks, showing his affection and care. At that moment, Jin's father appeared on the horizon, asking what was going on. He was told that everything was fine, but his father could never have imagined that Jean would reach such heights and was proud of him. He had once promised that he would not stop until he succeeded, and now his father set before him one exam that would determine his future reputation. Jin assured that he would definitely pass the exam and happily watched the hope in his father's eyes. When asked if Nora was okay after the long drive, it was revealed that he had come for a reason but to watch over Jean. The father was infinitely grateful to Nora if he would continue to take care of his son. They exchanged pleasantries, and the teacher thanked him for his warm attitude and support. They were asked to take care of the young master and help him in training and training. Soon, the squad led by the teacher and Jin went on the road, ready for new challenges. They were about to go to an important exam that would be a decisive test for Jin. The teacher was going to visit Quanzela for the first time in many years, although he had already been there 11 years ago. When Jin expressed doubt about the master's abilities, he replied that he had devoted his entire life to raising him and making him strong. Jin was so tired from the books that his head and eyes hurt. So he decided to distract himself a bit. He suddenly jumped out of the moving carriage, demonstrating his strength and ability to act without hesitation. When his foot touched the ground, he landed softly, like a bird ready to soar. He showed his ability to levitate above the ground, moving easily as if he was not touching it at all. As he bounced and moved, Jean demonstrated his mastery of the art of movement that he had mastered through long training. The teacher didn't understand why Jin was wasting his energy when there was such an important task ahead of him. Jin admitted that after a few days in the city, he couldn't concentrate on his studies and needed a warm-up to get rid of the stiffness. The teacher, although he did not approve of such behavior, understood that there was nothing he could do in this situation. He looked at the other companion and said that Jean was very lucky to have such a friend. The teacher remarked that he wished he had had such a friend in his youth, who would have supported him in the same way that Jean is supported now. Jean said that his mentor was always there, supported and helped in difficult moments. However, the companion wondered if he could pass the exam better than Jin, because the challenge was not easy. Jin, even after jumping out of the carriage and running, continued to read, holding the book in his hand, showing his interest in knowledge. He kept moving exercising and stretching his body, combining physical activity with his studies, knowing it would help him stay in shape. Soon they arrived at one of the transfer points, where they planned to make a rest stop before an important exam. Jin, a little joking, said that he had already been here more than once with his father, and offered to go for a walk because he was tired of sitting in monotonous rooms. However, his friend was stubborn and insisted that they should study more, because the exam is very close and their preparation must be at a high level. At that moment, Jin realized that Teng Wan was completely unsuitable for his company. He turned to his teacher, offering to go for a walk. But he refused because he felt pain in his body after ten days on the road. Jin suspected that his old mentor might be looking for a way to find some alcohol, but decided he'd better leave it to him. The teacher could do without him. The boy threw a bag of money, reminding them that his father had built this town and they would not find alcohol here. They would have to walk to buy something valuable. When the teacher saw the money, he thought about it, but once again emphasized that Jin should study more. 
However, he agreed to buy a drink and get some fresh air. The offer seemed pretty good and they went for a walk. They immersed themselves in a huge evening festival, where everything around shone with lights and was filled with noise. Jin put on his festive clothes and walked confidently, looking around curiously. There were buildings on both sides, from which girls called him, inviting him to come to them, casting playful glances. The crowd was so great that it was almost impossible to move. People filled the streets and clamored. Jin noted that although his teacher said he didn't like crowded places, he seemed to like it more than he let on. Jean suggested that they go to a decent place, because they were in a nice outfit that Jean wore for the first time. It was a gift. Meanwhile, acrobats were performing on the street, performing dangerous stunts with fire, mesmerizing the crowd with their skills. The spectacle was so captivating that it was difficult for them to look away. Nearby, a little girl was collecting money for an acrobat performance, carrying a basket for donations. Jin threw a silver bar into the basket, impressing the crowd with his generosity. Although it was a lot, the boy was not sorry to donate money for such a spectacle. But suddenly they heard screams. People were attacked by robbers, demanding money and intimidating them with their cruelty. The man was on his knees, begging for mercy and asking for forgiveness, promising to return the money next month, because now he has nothing to give. However, the cruel robbers did not believe his words and kicked him, ignoring his pleas. His daughter, watching this brutal beating, wanted to help, but was powerless in front of the audacious attackers. The man repeated that he would return everything next month, asking them to just leave him alone. Bandits only laughed at his words, saying that they needed their profit and did not believe in empty promises. They demanded that the man either give the money now or they would beat him further. On his knees again, the man begged, my lord, for mercy, but his words seemed to have no effect. Watching this spectacle, the teacher explained to Jean about illegal loans known as loan sharks, where loan sharks prey on borrowers when it's time to pay. He pointed out that it is normal to pay back debts when you borrow them. But these moneylenders demand huge interest, which puts people in difficult situations. The problem is that many people take out such loans, knowing about the high interest rates, and in a hurry, find themselves in such ridiculous situations. Jian expressed his categorical opinion that people who take money at such interest rates are stupid. The teacher gave an example. Devon, although stubborn, took money on interest to save his mother, and that was his reason for taking such a step. Jin looked at the man and realized that he too was just an unfortunate person who had no other choice. However, this association did not affect Jean. He decided that it was better not to think about such things and focus on his own actions. However, he noticed that the money the man had taken from the loan sharks was now the reason for his beating. The man fell from another brutal blow, and now blood left traces on his clothes. The man, barely rising to his knees, fell back in front of Jin, his gaze full of pain. Jin looked at him and felt compassion, realizing how helpless this man was. He felt sad because the man's blood stained his new festive outfit, which he wore for the first time. The bandits decided to calm down a bit, fearing to kill the man by accident, and said that they would take his daughter as payment. The robbers approached the girl, forcefully forcing her to go with them, leaving her no choice. They scoffed, saying that if they sold her at a good price, her father would be able to live better, and if not, they would punish him. After hearing these threats, Jin firmly stated that he would rather tear them to pieces than let them take the girl. He stood before them with a confident look, realizing that they had crossed the line and had no intention of retreating. The robber did not understand who was standing in front of him, but decided that this guy, who was inflamed with righteous anger, should just go on his way. He warned Jin to mind his own business before he got into trouble. However, for his words, the robber received a kick directly in the head from Jin. The young master's leg was struck by the blow with such force that the robber's nose began to turn red, like a New Year's toy. The second robber, seeing such aggression on Jin's part, drew his sword ready to attack. He called Jin an animal and tried to stab him in the back while trying to plant his sword. But Jin was no ordinary warrior. He quickly dodged, showing his skill. Without taking his hands out of his pockets, he pointed his second leg at the robber. He, screaming in pain, crashed into the wall, moaning and exclaiming in pain. People, seeing this incredible battle, began to watch the events with interest. The injured man, who was beaten by the robbers, was lifted to his feet and helped to hold on. The robbers were already begging for mercy, but Jin had no intention of letting them go. He was angry because one of them had dared to address him so brazenly. His teacher shouted, urging Jin to finally stop. Meanwhile, warriors from all sides began to gather, asking who he was and what was going on. Seeing how the guards began to converge on him, Jin decided to act quickly and not delay. Jin began to take out the guards one by one with precise punches, 
Using his leg strength with incredible skill, his hand moving quickly hit one of the attackers, sending him flying backwards. Several enemies flew away together before they even had time to get close to him, because Jin acted with lightning speed. His uncle pleaded, Please calm down, child. However, he was also hit in the back, which made the old man cry out in pain. The old man began to scream that he was dying, and Jean, realizing that he had gone a little too far, gently let him go. He apologized, admitting that he made a big mistake and was too hot. The old man realized that he should have stopped this angry boy earlier before the situation got out of control. Jin, although he understood that the old man was fine, apologized, noting that when he swung his hand at him, he did not calculate the strength. The teacher angrily said that if his blow had been a little stronger, he might have died, as he had never met such strength from his student. A bunch of robbers were lying on the ground, and the teacher warned that this should not be allowed. Jean, feeling strong, stepped on one of the robbers, showing his superiority. However, he emphasized that these robbers were the first to attack and started this whole conflict. The teacher yelled for Jin to remove his leg slowly, or the situation might get out of hand. Jin explained that they weren't just attacking. They were demanding money and trying to sell the man's daughter. So, they got what they deserved. He asked why the robbers deserved mercy at all, since they were guilty of their actions. The teacher suggested that it was because they were people who lived by the laws of blood. However, he asked why Jin had to think like a normal person. The mentor tried to understand Jin, and explained that he was only supposed to teach them a little, and not turn the fight into a brutal massacre. However, Jin leaned over the bandits, his gaze full of determination. He said that from the very beginning it was necessary to tear them to pieces, so that they would not dare to commit crimes. Jin wasn't about to sympathize with these scoundrels who were making a mess right in front of his eyes, and also stained his new clothes with blood. And yet, this situation could not be ignored. After all, it was impossible to simply ignore the fact that Jin almost killed these robbers. However, Jin saw it differently. No one even tried to stand up for these scoundrels, and that speaks for itself. The teacher insisted that Jin had crossed the line and acted too violently, and the force with which he had acted could have backfired on him. Jin just laughed, saying that if he had been told earlier, he would have helped before the blood stained his clothes. Hearing this, the teacher fell silent, having nothing more to add to his speech. In part, he admitted his guilt because he failed to teach Jean the right thing to do, and it was his fault. Jin did not see his fault in the situation, because in his opinion, he did everything right. Guang Nora bowed his head. He was ashamed that he was the teacher of the young master Jin, and could not teach him in time. He felt that he shouldn't have looked at Jin like that. After all, he was his student, and he was supposed to teach him right, but he let his guard down. He blamed himself for this, and Jin felt a little uncomfortable seeing this. The boy tried to comfort the teacher, asking him not to take the fool to his head, but the old man continued to blame himself. Jin believed that this was an exaggeration, and assured the teacher that this would not happen again. He had already apologized, but the teacher kept scolding himself, so Jin decided to buy him some local alcohol to cheer him up a bit. The next morning, at the residence, Teng Wan sat as usual, engrossed in his studies. Young Master Jin walked over to him and sat down next to him, trying to get his attention. He looked at Ten with a harsh, serious look, never taking his eyes off him. From this look, Ten even began to get nervous and sweat, realizing that Jin was not in the mood. It was obvious that something was wrong, but Jin assured him that everything was fine, even though his face said otherwise. In fact, he wanted to share his thoughts and was looking for someone to listen to him, and he began to tell his story, trying to speak out and find support. When asked what he would do in such a situation, Ten Wan said that he would report it to the authorities as it is their right to return the money that was illegally taken. But Jin understood that this was the obvious answer and thought it best to avoid such situations. However, Jin argued that if he wanted to become a ruler, he needed to crack down on people who broke the laws. Tang Wan, however, emphasized that he does not want to live in poverty and considers petty actions meaningless because it prevents him from achieving the big goal. Jin realized that with this approach, Ten Wan would never become truly strong and great if he remained so limited in his thoughts. Ten Wan realized that was enough for today and decided to end the conversation, tired of the discussion. He remembered that Jin had asked him about something important earlier. He once knew the answer to that question, but now he felt confused and asked Jin to repeat the question. Ten Wan replied that in order to live with dignity, one must study. He followed this principle and planned to succeed, so he continued to study hard. He expressed his hope that Jean would stop showing pity for people, because in his opinion, it was not worth the effort. Jin, looking at Ten, realized that this boy was grumbling just like his mentor, the old teacher. However, there was some truth in his words. 
and Jin thought when he said, Make people appreciate you, praise you, and see you as a leader. A leader a thousand times over. To Jean, it all sounded too complicated and difficult to reach, like a goal that seemed out of reach. But Ten One assured him that everyone has the potential to achieve this, echoing the teacher's words. And yet, even if it seems impossible to others, you have to drop everything else and achieve the goal that was already discussed. The choice is always up to Jean. He said sacrifice and patience may be part of the journey, but it's the only way to succeed. Meanwhile, the streets of the city were bustling with life and people were going about their business. They discussed their everyday problems related to the sea, fishing, and other concerns. Everything went in its own way, and nothing foreshadowed trouble. The city continued to live its usual life. Peace and stability reigned around. Jin raised his eyes to the sky, admiring its cloudless beauty, and thought what a wonderful sight it was today. He was waiting for only one thing. When everything would start, when the decisive moment would come. The only question left was whether he could rise to the challenge and defeat Ten One. The organizer of the exam kept the prepared material on the table, ready to distribute it to the participants. Taking the documents in his hands, he solemnly announced the beginning of the exam. The warriors received their tickets and concentrated on the questions, some clutching their heads as they felt the pressure, and others courageously accepted the challenge, taking the pen in hand, ready to show their knowledge. They began to write, because they had been preparing for this moment for a long time and were determined to win. Jean, after carefully considering the questions, confidently began to write his answers. It seemed a little silly to him, because he thought that passing the test was like writing a whole book. The exam took a lot of time, and every minute required concentration. By evening, it was still going, and the ordeal continued unabated. Finally, when it was getting dark, the atmosphere became even more tense. Jean finished writing his answers, his hand aching from the effort. But he worked quickly and diligently. Looking around, he noticed that he managed faster than everyone else, and this gave him confidence. He even glanced at his main competitor, Ten One, whom he hoped to surpass. But, turning his head in the other direction, Jin saw something incredible. Sitting behind him was another student who also seemed to have finished his exam, as his calm expression showed. The boy stared at Jin, as if challenging him to see if he could really be better. Only one question remained. Did this boy also pass the exam so quickly? And by the number of answers and papers on his desk, it was clear that he had really finished the exam. Looking directly into Jin's eyes, the boy began to laugh, silently challenging him. There was some tension between them, even though they were sitting far apart. When it finally got dark, Jean went to meet the teacher, who was interested in the results of the exam. The teacher asked Jean how the test went, wanting to know his impressions. The young master did not like it when the teacher called him child. Because he was not a child, he was his father's son. The teacher saw that Jin's face did not look happy, and thought that he might have failed the exam. But Jean assured that the exam was easy for him, and he passed it. However, when the teacher asked why he had such a face, Jin couldn't give a definite answer. All he said was that he was in a bad mood, and that was all he could say. Jin asked the teacher for a list of examinees, stressing that it was possible, but the teacher wondered why he needed it. Jean didn't give any specific reason, but explained that he wanted to know more about one of the contestants, specifically the one sitting at number 30, because he was interested in him. However, a good reason was needed to start an investigation. Jean insisted that he just wanted the information because he did well on the test and didn't want to worry about his father. The teacher took the hint and promised that the information would be collected, but it would take some time, so he advised Jin to go home and rest. The teacher sensed that something was bothering Jin, but Jin replied that he wanted to see the person who had ruined his mood. Jin admitted that he did not feel special in this exam, as there were many capable participants. He remembered that his opponent, who appeared to him to be very talented, was actually just as special as he was. Jin assured the teacher he wasn't worried and said it was just his sensitivity to his new surroundings. He added that before anything else, he should stop worrying and go eat to get his strength up. The teacher suggested that they all drink together to relieve the tension. He emphasized that today is a special evening for them, so they should celebrate and enjoy food and drink. At that moment, a memory flashed through Guan Nor's mind of one of the evenings by the campfire when he was still a warrior. He sat then, looking into the fire, and thought about the fact that he had a feeling that he had no chance of surviving this war. He shared this feeling with his companion, who replied that if he met someone of similar strength to him, there would only be two options. They will either become best friends or mortal enemies, because the real enemy is the one who knows you best. Therefore, it is always difficult to succeed 
and lose everything. The old man at the bar got his young students so drunk that they fell asleep right on the table exhausted. But those memories did not give him peace, not allowing him to relax and enjoy the moment even now. Guan Nora was sitting at the bar and noticed the chief minister entering the establishment. He turned to him, asking what was happening in the city and why he was here. The minister replied that he had come at Jin's request to inform him of the person who had interested the young master, and promised to share the information with the teacher first. The minister clarified what exactly happened, but the teacher said that it was just curiosity because his student was unlikely to be interested in an ordinary, boring person. The minister assured that he would provide full information and tell Guang Nori everything first before informing Jin. The teacher was undoubtedly happy with such an offer and support. As Jin lay at the table, passed out after an evening of drinking, Guan Nora's only thoughts were how to keep him safe from possible dangers. He was worried because, despite the fun, danger could await them around every corner. The next day they set out on horseback for home and the road was long. Jean noticed that his teacher was riding a horse rather clumsily and even dangerously. Guan Nora, although he could handle a horse a bit, looked unsteady most of the time and rode worse than the others. Jin assumed that his teacher had only been an infantryman in the past and thus did not have much experience riding. Guan Nora became angry, noting that the cavalry always looked down on the infantry, not understanding how much effort and sacrifice the infantry put in. He emphasized that people do not even imagine how many fighters die before those with real talent are found. When Jin asked if he would accept him into the army, the teacher asked him not to bring up the subject again because his student did not yet understand what kind of place this was, full of nightmares. Jin, however, was convinced that the teacher was suffering because of his own fears, though he believed this to be a false thought. Guan Nora explained that in the army, the talented die first, followed by those without talent. This place wasn't for everyone, and the boy had a right to know that. The teacher continued that the army forces people to do things they shouldn't, and often don't even understand what's going on. Jean only became more interested, wanting to learn even more about army life. But the master warned him that if he served in the army, none of his dreams would come true, because the army changes people and takes away their ambitions. The teacher explained that if Jin joined the army, he would attract the attention of cruel commanders who would humiliate and shout at him. He emphasized that if Jin wanted to be great, he had better not even think about the army. The teacher was sure that Jin was already on the right path because he is from a wealthy family and has great talent, which already makes him special. Jean wanted to learn more options on how to become great, but the teacher explained that with his talent would come great responsibility. Nora explained that accountability means that in the army, thousands of soldiers can die because of the actions or decisions of generals. He pointed out that although many allies can survive thanks to the right decisions, there will still be losses. And this must be understood. This pain and responsibility is part of leadership. But Jean saw it differently. His view of responsibility was the opposite. The old man went on to explain that everyone in the army aspires to be a general, because generals don't die in battle. They lead troops and make decisions. He emphasized that one should always be careful in conversations with generals because they understand the price of war. A general may lead a hundred or two hundred men, but without a sense of responsibility, he can never become a leader responsible for the lives of thousands. If a person grew up in comfort, like Jean, it is not easy for him to understand what true responsibility for others is. Guan Nora admitted that he himself experienced the horrors of war when he saw soldiers lying on the ground after a battle, and the image haunted him. Many soldiers feel the pain of losing their comrades whom they could not protect. They cannot imagine the guilt felt by generals responsible for thousands of lives and constantly trying to find the right solution. It's all incredibly difficult, and not everyone can become a great leader. But the more responsibility you bear, the more you are valued and respected. Jin realized that he needed to pay more attention to the responsibility that the teacher talked about. The conversation reminded him of Chicks and Grindy, the names of his chickens and the squirrels he used to play with. Jin realized that his teacher had planned this conversation to drive home an important point about responsibility. He realized that this whole conversation was aimed at making him realize the role of responsibility in life. After some time in the mountains, Jin began to climb a steep rock, showing his perseverance. He had to overcome a difficult path to reach the top, but he continued to move forward, not stopping in the face of difficulties. Jin felt tired, like after long hours of sitting for an exam, but with each step, he felt his body come alive. His muscles, blood vessels, and heart began to work in their usual rhythm finally recovering as he began to move again. 
With a sweaty face, he felt alive and full of energy, like after a good workout. Marim's landscapes gave him strength, and he felt an inspiration that pushed him to move forward. The teacher, trying to catch up, shouted to Gina to wait, but the teacher seemed too slow and clumsy for the boy. The teacher assured that when Jean is his age, he will understand how difficult it is to perform such physical exercises. But Jin jokingly noted that the teacher should make him do what he can no longer do himself. When they reached the top of the mountain, Jin felt how different the clean mountain air was from what he was used to. Jin proposed to start the training right now and forbid the teacher to drink, arguing that he was worried about his health. And for Jean himself, it's time to take a break from books and focus on training. Because it's a good idea that won't take much time. Guang Nora asked him if it was really great to be a big man. But before answering, he noted that Jin needed to take one more exam to conquer the world if he could pass it. However, before saying such loud words, you should start serious training. Standing on the edge of the cliff, Jin pushed away from her, ready to show off his skills. He began to accumulate energy, concentrating all his strength in his body. During this time, he had learned many different techniques, and now he was ready to put them to the test. Guan Nora was proud to understand what a talented student was standing in front of him. Jin had truly become a skilled warrior. After a while, they reached the Guangdong Battle Base, one of the most famous martial arts bases in the entire region. This place was the center of the best martial arts masters and organizations that gathered here for training and competitions. However, one question troubled the teacher. The only son of the local governor wants to work in the government. This meant that he probably had no talent for martial arts, but there were rumors that this was not entirely true. The father claimed that his son was very talented and that his potential would be revealed by the age of 30. People today still respect him despite all the rumors and circumstances. This means that he has a good reputation and may actually have some talent. It's definitely not easy for his father. And it shows in the atmosphere of the combat base. If his son passed the exam again, everything the teacher understood about the situation would become clear to Jin as well. Guang Nora knows that this information needs to be communicated to the young master, but he also understands that Jin is very sensitive right now, and this could become a problem. However, despite this, he decides to go and tell him everything he managed to find out. Meanwhile, Jin achieved incredible results in training. The tree he was punching split into pieces. However, thoughts about the person he saw at the exam did not give him peace. He wondered who this boy was, if he could be his age. But Jin felt something unusual. His eyes looked suspicious. The teacher once spoke about such people, those who hide their true identity. They do this to create relationships with others and these thoughts troubled him. Jean tried to put everything on the shelves to figure out who this guy was, learn more, and eventually defeat him. The only thing he needs now is to find out who this young man is because Jean cannot allow anyone to be better than him. He found himself worrying about this stranger. He understood that these experiences had reached a dead end. Jean better calm down and continue on his way, moving further towards his goal. By the river, Chin began his training, immersing himself in nature and feeling every breath of the wind. Taking off his shoes, he bravely stepped onto the cold ground, allowing himself to feel the coolness with every step. His feet confidently touched the stones, pushing off the ground, as if he was testing his strength and agility. With each jump, he increased his speed, moving so fast that he seemed to be floating in the air, radiating tension and energy. The teacher watched, realizing that the boy would not last long because even experienced assassins needed new abilities to master this technique. When the teacher asked if Chin was succeeding, he assured that everything was going according to plan, even if it was difficult. However, the teacher knew that it was necessary to teach him the third level so that he could master the true mastery. After all, the teacher planned to explain the movement, which allowed to approach the opponent without leaving a single trace a little later. However, Chin felt that the time had come, and he demanded to continue his studies now. If the teacher could not continue the lessons, he promised to contact Devon to train at his home. Leaving the master, Chin set out for Devon, sure of his decision. But the truth is that the teacher didn't know how to teach third grade, and it took him days to learn the story from the narrator. However, how to explain this to a student? Meanwhile, the storyteller in the bar continued to shout to the entire county, telling another story. The warriors of the Master of Martial Arts listened to his stories with interest, delving into every word, and the teacher listened to gain new knowledge for his training. The narrator said that the assassin and Jin had successfully completed their mission, but new challenges lay ahead. Soon the assassin died, but remained known as one of the greatest, completing his legend. 
The hall erupted in applause, honoring the fascinating story that everyone had heard. But the narrator, seeing the delight, asked for money, because such interesting stories could not be free. Soon after, Genner presented him with some silver ingots, acknowledging his skill in storytelling. Genner thanked the storyteller and offered him a fee for his fascinating story. The boy gratefully accepted the payment. But the teacher was interested in other stories about assassins, because he liked the previous one very much. The narrator replied that he had many such stories, but would like to save them for next time, having prepared a complete story from beginning to end. In response, Genner wished him luck, thanked him for a pleasant time, and promised to return again. The narrator drew attention to the fact that Genner seemed to him an interesting and influential person, because he gave not just copper, but pure silver. After that, the narrator turned to one of the patrons of the bar to find out more. He asked who this old man was, because he sees him every time he comes here. The old man has been coming here for a long time and does not miss a single evening in their establishment. He was told that it was Mr. Guack, a regular visitor who is a member of the Lee family and often comes with the young master. The narrator realized that if this is the Lee family, then there is a lot of money and opportunity to be found here. That night, the robbers did not sleep, preparing for their new business. They moved through the streets of Murum, holding together, carefully examining every corner. One of them suddenly stopped, frowned and looked carefully around. After making sure that they had moved to a sufficient distance, he suggested that they stop and rest. They decided that they could relax now, because the danger was behind them. The job was done, and everything went smoothly, so the rest was well deserved. But he did not know who these strangers from the organization were but it was clear that they were well prepared and had come to their domain with a specific purpose. One of them, a tired bald man, remarked that they had too many enemies to count on their fingers, and they had lost everything they had. They need to find a new place and start from scratch, but the worst part is that the other members of their organization did not even have enough time to save themselves. After a short rest, they realized that it was necessary to move on, because the enemies could overtake them at any moment. The robbers ran, not knowing what awaited them ahead, but they were not going to give up. But suddenly a figure appeared on the horizon, which made them stop. They were two young men in expensive suits who looked like children from influential families. They asked the robbers to hurry, because they had been waiting for them for so long that they almost fell asleep. The robbers were confused, not understanding where these insolent boys came from. They wondered which organization they came from and why they were attacked. However, they did not admit to which group they belonged, keeping everything a secret. There were three robbers, and only two youths, which gave a certain advantage. Instead of running away, the robbers decided to take their chance and try to defeat their opponents. The leader of the team ordered to attack those who dared to block their way. Pulling their swords from their sheaths, the robbers rushed to attack the strangers. The young man watched them nonchalantly, hoping their skills were worth the time spent waiting. Without even drawing his sword from its scabbard, he easily deflected a blow from one of the robbers. With one movement, he pushed the attacker back, forcing him to retreat. One of the young men was able to stand against two warriors at the same time, and without even drawing his sword, he neutralized all their blows. As a result, all the robbers quickly learned a hard lesson, finding themselves on the ground. The boy, having touched the sword, began to pull it out, demonstrating his determination. By bearing his blade, he terrified his enemies, who already understood that they could not escape. And when he finally swung his sharp sword, a menace appeared in the air that made his enemies flinch. He dealt a fatal blow to the scoundrel who was trying to escape, quickly closing the distance between them. His face reflected the seriousness and ruthlessness of a true warrior. When the robber's companions saw this, they were struck with terror and froze. Incredibly quick sword strikes flew past them, leaving only a trail of fear behind. They did not have time to dodge, and were also severely beaten by this unknown warrior. His skill with the sword made it possible to create something amazing. He delivered precise and merciless blows. Only a single drop of blood remained on his cold blade, which slowly dripped onto the ground. Only one drop and several destroyed robbers were the result of his actions. He turned around, realizing that these men were quite famous in the area. But even that didn't save them from defeat. Hiding his sword, he turned to his partner, noting that this battle was not fun at all. The partner looked at him carefully, realizing that his master was ruthless in his power. Suddenly, his companion fell to his knees, but the reason for this remained unclear. A man in a mask appeared on the horizon with bright eyes that glowed with a mysterious fire. He repeated the words, What did you mean by fun? Calling for them to be repeated again. The man's silhouette inspired fear and made everyone present tremble, as if in front of an unknown threat. Training with the teacher continued, 
and Chin tried to improve his skills every day. The boy shared with the mentor that his Danton had now grown to the size of a child's fist. Sometimes it seemed to him that the energy was moving throughout the body, from the head to the tailbone. And this, in his opinion, indicated that it was growing. Like a person who was just beginning to walk in childhood, so his energy expanded its movement, gradually covering the whole body, from head to toe. However, this could be a problem because, as the general once noted, growing it to the size of a bean takes time and patience. However, he did not express his doubts out loud, choosing to remain silent. Watching the mentor's face, Chin decided to show a new technique that he thought was smoother. The teacher watched the boy with pleasure, realizing that one day he would be able to fly like a bird. Although he didn't know the details, he had heard that cultivation was basically internal strength. The teacher hesitated on how to start the conversation, but decided to say directly that Chin needed to slow down. The boy did not understand what the teacher meant, so the teacher explained that excessive training can be dangerous and he should slow down. Chin remarked that the teacher didn't say that at first, but at the time he had no inner strength and didn't understand the risk. The teacher explained that it is necessary to gradually prepare the body, slowly adapting it before diving into cold water. The boy was confident that he could master this power and felt determined to continue. However, the teacher warned that if the energy increases too quickly, the body may not be able to withstand it and fail. Chin asked if the teacher was sure about that, doubting his words. The teacher reasoned that maybe he didn't have all the information, and Chin couldn't fully trust him, because even the teacher didn't have his own inner strength. Chin wondered if his teacher could make mistakes like any other human being. He understood that Guan Nora, although experienced, was still a person who could also make mistakes. In fact, the master only pretended to know everything. But deep in his soul, he understood that there was still much he did not know. Guang Nora decided to admit that in some aspects, he still did not fully understand everything. But his student should at least listen to the teacher's advice a little. They approached the river, preparing for the next stage of training. Today the mentor was to teach Chin the third step in his training. After all, Chin wasn't going to slow down. He wanted to know how much longer he had to wait. The guy runs away, ready for another challenge. He pushes off the ground, gathering all his energy. The first stage, walking, is launched, and Chin executes it flawlessly. His movements made a great impression on the master, who watched closely. He seemed to levitate in the air. His every step was light and confident. The second stage was a run, and Chin displayed incredible speed and agility. The guy perfectly coped with the second stage, performing it with complete confidence. His maneuvers were so masterful that they fascinated even the most experienced. That was enough to complete the stage, and Chin handled it flawlessly. The teacher expected it to take three months, but the boy mastered the basics much faster. Chin asked to go to the third stage, but the mentor insisted that time was needed to prepare. However, seeing the student's determination, the master agreed to continue the training immediately. However, he warned that the next stage will be held in the water and it will be necessary to wait until it gets warmer. To complete this stage, Chin must fully immerse himself in water and learn to walk underwater just as he would on land. It seemed crazy to Chin. Walking underwater as if on land sounded absurd and made no sense. The master understood that this task was almost impossible, but deliberately made the student try in order to dampen his ardor. The master tried to convince Chin that walking on water like walking on land was possible. But the task was difficult and he did not explain how to do it so that the student could find the answer for himself. His words sounded simple, as if it was not difficult, but in reality, everything was not so. Guang Nora assured the student that if he was unsure, he could not do so, reminding him that he was only teaching him at the request of Chin himself, not because he was forcing him. He hoped that this task would take some time and that the student would consider his actions. He advised the boy to feel the signals from his own body first, but Chin chose not to listen. Plunging into the water, he realized that he would stop if he didn't succeed. However, he tried to perform the exercises as if he were walking on the bottom of the water in the same way as on land. At first it seemed incredibly difficult. It turned out that walking underwater is much more difficult than on the surface. The teacher was cheering from the sidelines, yelling for Chin to feel the water and move slower, when really he was just joking. Chin knew that he would rather freeze than feel comfortable in this water. However, over time, he was able to relax and let go of the tension. He began to move more slowly, using the energy of his Dan Tan to support himself. The master waited for Chin to finally emerge from the water, convinced that the apprentice would soon surrender. He didn't even notice that someone was closely watching them, secretly watching. Meanwhile, in one of the institutions where the soldiers gathered, the narrator carefully watched the old man, 
Realizing that he was not just sitting here, he found out that this old man was using his stories to entertain others, and was doing it to support some heir of Master Li. If this is really the son and heir of Master Li, then he must have a lot of money, and the old man can afford expensive tea and spend large sums. The narrator thought about taking his place, because then he would no longer have to worry about food and money. The narrator has a certain plan to take advantage of the situation. Suddenly, a girl in black appeared on the horizon in front of him, suddenly standing right in front of his face. He was frightened by such a sudden appearance and hastened to ask who she was. The girl strictly asked to say her name, without showing any emotion. The narrator nervously insisted on knowing who she was before answering her question. The woman did not show an iota of kindness in the conversation. Her tone was cold and ruthless. Suddenly, jumping up with incredible speed she was behind him, she then struck him on the head, giving him no chance to escape or resist. The narrator fell to the ground, moaning in pain, not understanding what had happened. The girl repeated the question, asking why he did not say his name. Lying on the ground in tears, with broken hopes and a feeling of horror, the narrator trembled, not understanding what was happening. In the counselor's office, the woman came with a report, transferring all the information she had gathered. She had established the identity of this person, but the counselor was interested in why the bug was circling around him, and whether she had checked everything thoroughly. The girl took the body to the doctor, admitting that the situation looked quite suspicious, but believing that it might just be a random bug. She also had to tell the counselor something important that she learned during the investigation. The next day, everyone was preparing for the famous festival, which was held in one of the famous places. Many people gathered around the palace, having fun, rejoicing, and celebrating. People ordered the most exquisite dishes and tasted the best alcoholic beverages. Everyone enjoyed the holiday without paying attention to any problems. This is how the days passed in Marima's world, where everyone was eager for entertainment and a festive atmosphere. Chin sat at his desk, hearing all the commotion and shouts from the crowd. His teacher approached him, asking why he was sitting here, because he was the main character of the holiday and had to go meet people. But Chin was convinced that he had not done anything special. Passing the exam was not of much importance to him. The teacher explained that everyone was happy because of his success, but Chin looked like he had lost the battle, not accepting the fact that someone else had passed the exam better than him. The mentor did not understand why Chin was reacting like this because he should have been satisfied with his achievements. The teacher could see that the boy was questioning his abilities, even insulting himself in his thoughts. Hearing these words, the mentor could not hold back and remarked that Chin was judging himself incorrectly, because he passed the exam on the first try, when even the most talented pass on the third attempt. The teacher emphasized that only ten people out of a thousand successfully passed this exam, and Chin should be proud, not self-critical. Despite this, Chin continued to doubt himself, feeling that his performance was not good enough. The teacher saw that the boy was going through a psychological crisis, and decided to support him. He took the student's hand, assuring him that he did a great job and deserved recognition. Guang Nora remarked that Chin might be a little behind, considering he was overtaken by Zhong, who had the whole family's support, but it's just an exam. Huan's exam is just a stage to go through, and the real results will be visible later after the trials are over. Despite his doubts, the young master turned out to be very intelligent, even surpassing Devon. In these words, Chin saw a certain motivation and encouragement for himself, which gave him new strength. Guang Nora explained that the most important thing was how his father would react to his success, as he had already organized a citywide celebration for Chin passing the exam. Guang Nora understood that Chin had many other problems to focus on instead of worrying too much. He advised Chin to better aim to improve his score in Zhang's next exam, which would help him deal with his problems. Guang Nora was convinced that Chin's father was truly interested in his studies and proud of him. Chin doubted that his father was really interested in him, but the teacher assured him that he was his father's pride. The words sounded believable, and Chin began to believe them, feeling supported. Guang Nora said that if Chin doesn't believe him, then let him talk to his father in person. He assured that his father would definitely be proud of him before the next exam. Guang Nora was sure that the clan leader would be pleased to know that his son was wielding a sword with such skill. Chin decided that the right step would be to ask his father a personal question to ensure his support. Guan Nora continued to insist that it was important to put in the effort and raise one's reputation at such times. After this conversation, Chin's doubts disappeared, and he finally decided to go outside. He went out not alone, but together with his father, feeling supported. After telling his father about Chong's exam, he felt his full support. His father was always worried about him, 
worried that he didn't like studying and wanted to know if he could count on him as a son. Jiun was surprised by such a sincere answer and his father's deep feelings. He replied that he would always be his son and would follow his father, promising to do whatever he said. These were pleasant words for the father. He felt joy, considering this day to be one of the happiest in his life as a ruler. When Chin asked about other happy days, his father recalled the day he married his mother, calling her a true angel. Until now, Chin had only heard about his mother from his grandmother, but he had never talked about her with his father. He asked what kind of person she was, and the father repeated again that she was beautiful, like an angel, with a kind heart. Chin had never seen her. Not even a portrait of her mother was in the house, which seemed strange. The father assured them that they did not need such things, and asked them to imagine the most beautiful woman in the world. This is his mother. He was sure that if she had not left them, their life would have been completely different, happier. Chin saw the sadness in his father's eyes and realized that something had happened in the past that his grandmother had never fully told him about. He was too young then, and the grandmother's words were confused. She said that his mother had died of an illness. Guan Nora decided to interrupt their conversation and turned to his father. Father thanked Guang Nora for helping Chin pass the exam. However, the mentor replied that he had not done anything special because Chin had handled everything himself. The father assured that the teacher can turn to Minister Chong at any time who was always ready to help. It was an act of loyalty on the father's part, showing his respect for his son's mentor. In the evening, Guan Nora found a mysterious letter on his desk. The letter lay right in front of him as if it had been specially left there for his attention. It was clear from his reaction that he had received something significant. Chin guessed that with this letter, the mentor would be able to carry out his plans without any restrictions. However, the teacher didn't look pleased, and Chin asked why, since he deserved the gift. Guan Nora calmed down, agreeing that the land he had been given was indeed valuable and that he had the right to do with it as he pleased. Guang Nora was even glad that he now has land, and it's not about the money, but about the opportunities it gives. Before this age, he could not settle anywhere, but now that he has his own land, he can stay and develop it. Chin understood that his father was an excellent manager of resources, and it was evident in his confidence and actions. But Guan Nora didn't care, because now he had his own land. And although human greed is limitless, he wasn't going to claim more than he deserved. Chin asked what the teacher was planning to build on this land, but Guan Nora replied that all that mattered to him was that Chin pass the exam. If he does, maybe the clan leader will build him a house. Chin categorically stated that he will not allow others to build for Guan Nora because it is his duty. The mentor only joked that he too had a sense of shame. Chin promised that he would build a house for him himself. These words shocked the old mentor who did not expect such an act. But Chin was convinced that he should build this house because it was his promise. He promised Guan Nori that he would build him a large and magnificent home worthy of his mentor. For the teacher, these words sounded like a balm for the soul, because Chin's dedication and diligence were of great value to him. The young master was ready to do anything for his teacher, sparing no effort, because he understood how important this support was. The day of practice continued and Chin worked hard to improve his skills. With a training sword in hand, he mastered new techniques that included fighting bone opponents. He needed to master completely new practices, which required high concentration and dedication. All these exercises required considerable effort and patience to achieve the result. A whole season has passed imperceptibly for everyone, and autumn has already come into its own. Sitting under the tree, Chin continued to learn new techniques and prepare for the challenges ahead. However, his studies quickly exhausted him, and he dropped the book, feeling tired. He realized that he needed to combine mind and body training to achieve harmony. This became his new goal, to strengthen both mind and body at the same time. During this time, he made significant progress. His body became lighter, and his movements more agile. Soon he saw his teacher, who had come to visit him after a long break. Chin was glad that the teacher remembered him, hoping that the new night training would bring even more success. However, Guan Nora wasn't just here again. He had prepared a new challenge and a new training point for Chin. The teacher aimed to teach him a new martial art that required even more effort and skill. Guang Nora understood that it would be difficult for Chin, but he decided not to stop until he passed the John exam. They approached an old building that looked dark and abandoned. When the door was opened, the building was found to be empty inside, which gave the place an even more mysterious look. At first, it seemed that there was no point in training in this place, but Chin trusted his teacher even if it looked strange. He warned that this time, the training would be particularly difficult. Chin remembered the master's words. 
You won't know until you try, and was ready for whatever challenge lay ahead. Guang Nora pulled out a small bag containing something unusual and announced that it was time to start training. A mouse suddenly jumped out of the bag and quickly ran, hiding somewhere among the boxes. The boy was surprised, and the teacher meanwhile began to close the door of the building, making everything even more mysterious. Chin thought this was complete madness, but Guan Nora explained that it was vision training. He had to catch a mouse in the dark. Chin began to shout with indignation, because he could not see anything in the dark and did not understand how to catch a mouse at all. The only thing he asked for was at least one candle, but the mentor emphasized that this was part of the training and there would be no help. The teacher jokingly said that if Chin couldn't do it, he would bring two more mice next time, and if you don't catch two, you will have to catch three. To complete the training, Chin had to catch ten mice. Even so, Chin firmly stated that he could handle even a thousand if necessary, and asked the teacher to wait. Laughing, Guan Nora left him, hoping that the next few days would be peaceful, and decided to go out for a drink. Meanwhile, the young master visited one of the nearby villages. The local people gladly met him and congratulated him, because his visit was important for them. Chin brought medicine for his friend Devon's mother, who was at home. Devon looked out of the house, and was surprised to see Chin in his yard. Chin pointed out that if Devon is so sick that he can't attend class, he'd rather focus on his recovery than his reading. He warned Devon not to waste time on nonsense when there are more important things to do. But Devon replied that he wasn't going to stop. Devon hinted that if it bothered Chin, he could leave, but he wasn't planning on giving up himself. Despite his illness, Devon continued to practice, ignoring the obstacles. Chin asked if Devon wanted to eat, as he was visibly exhausted. Devon promised that he would start eating soon, although it was obvious that he was barely able to stay on his feet. Chin began to tell Devon about the vision training his master had prepared for him, and although it looked difficult, he was confident. He explained that Guan Nora had expected the task to take several months, but Chin decided against it and planned to catch ten mice in one day. Watching his friend, Chin remarked that if Devon continued to ignore his health, he might not make it to the exam. He reminded him of the medicine and the need to eat. He asked Devon to listen to his advice because he only gives useful advice, adding that his stubbornness is starting to annoy him. Not long after, the mentor came to visit Chin to check on his progress. He was surprised to see that Chin was very quick to catch the mouse managing to do so almost immediately. Chin just tried, and he succeeded, which pleasantly impressed his teacher. The master stopped Chin, telling him not to go, because he wanted to prepare another mouse for him, but he knew the result would be the same. The old man understood that the training was just beginning, and he was going to make it more difficult. These words caused a lot of questions for Chin, because he did not know what was waiting for him next. One evening, by candlelight, the mentor prepared the next task for Chin, he put together several objects and held them in his hands, explaining that Chin had to catch them. Swinging, he threw the objects towards Chin with all his might. The boy stood in the dark while the mentor threw bricks at him to test his reaction. He had to learn to catch objects in flight, developing his vision skills and reaction speed. The master threw objects with all his might to make the task as difficult as possible. In the dark, these objects were not so easy to spot, and some of them hit Chin directly in the forehead. Chin felt that it was a difficult test for him, but he understood that it was part of his training. He noticed how some objects hit painfully, leaving bruises, and it seemed like the master was just mocking, but Chin knew it was for his own advancement. Guang Nora explained that the rice cakes were just the beginning and the next phase of training would involve throwing stones, but Chin was not intimidated by this. He was ready to take this training and show his determination. Soon, a meeting was held in the clan leader's office, where the master discussed Chin's training. The teacher told the leader about the different types of masters and the necessary skills that Chin must learn. The leader remarked that maybe Chin didn't need this training because he still had plenty of time to prepare for the exam. However, Guang assured Nora that there was nothing to worry about, as Chin is very intelligent and multitasking at the same time, which will only benefit him. The Lord was sure that the Chan exam was a difficult test, and one had to be prepared for it. Guang Nora agreed, noting that as an only child, Chin has to maintain her health and fitness. The Lord promised that he would try to help, but asked the master to focus on guiding his son to study and not just martial arts. The master agreed and promised to carry out the assignment, assuring that he would prepare Chin in all the necessary aspects. At this moment, Chin's father had a mixed feeling in his heart, as he was worried about whether his son had chosen the right path and whether he would be able to overcome all the challenges. After a while, an exam was held at the Academy of Mindfulness, and all the candidates gathered to take it. The candidates took their seats, feeling the tension and preparing for the challenge. 
The master conducting the exam suggested that they rest for a while before continuing. Chin felt tense as he understood that Devon had learned a lot from the teacher, who had a special way of learning. They had come a long way and with only two weeks to go, Devon was eager to get home to see his family. He was aware that the exam required a lot of effort and preparation, and this was exhausting him. Mr. Dia appeared behind them and announced that someone had come from the house. It was rumored that Mr. Beck's mother had died four days ago. It was extremely sad news and Devon was shaking with excitement. He didn't know how to calm down and he couldn't even breathe calmly, feeling the pain of loss. Devon decided he needed to get home immediately. He understood that it was impossible to stay here in such a situation and he might not have the opportunity to return to Mr. Ban again. Chin could see how hard Devon was but there was nothing he could do about it. The lecture continued and the room filled with material that the students had to learn. The young master, along with the other students, listened intently, trying to concentrate. However, the thought that his friend Devon had left the building troubled him. He looked at the questions before him in the exam and tried to concentrate. But he realized that he did something wrong and missed something. This thought did not leave him, constantly haunting his consciousness. He suddenly closed the book, attracting the attention of other students and the teacher. The teacher asked Chin what happened, to which he replied that he might have misplaced his priorities. It wasn't clear to the teacher, but Chin suddenly jumped out of his seat and rushed forward. He did not pay attention to any obstacles that might be in his way. He dropped everything and ran away. It was raining heavily outside, flooding everything around. Master Guan Nora was enjoying this atmosphere, admiring the rain. However, he suddenly heard the voice of his student, and it surprised him so much that he almost choked from surprise. After all, Chin was not supposed to be here, and the master asked what he was doing here anyway. Chin replied that he had some urgent questions, but first he would need to go in and dry off. However, he insisted that this question was urgent, and he did not have time. He asked the master to answer immediately. Chin said that during class he heard about the death of Devon's mother and wanted to go with him, but his stubborn friend said that it would be better if he stayed and studied because it might interfere with his studies. Chin wanted to know if he had done the right thing and if he really should have stayed or gone with his friend. The master replied that everything depends on circumstances and relationships. If Devon really is his only friend, maybe it was worth going. Upon hearing this, Chin realized that this was exactly what he had been thinking. He realized that he was already a little late, and now he had to go to Devon. Guang Nora came out in the rain to Chin, supporting his decision. He said that if Chin felt it was necessary, then he should definitely do so. Master assured him that if Devon said that, he must really hope that Chin would not let him down and study hard. But Chin couldn't help but berate himself for not going with his friend. Understanding the situation, Guang Nora emphasized that if it is not too late, Chin should go and do his duty. He added that there were things Chin had to do himself, and he, the master, would take care of the rest. The words sounded like thunder out of the blue to Chin, forcing him to make a quick decision. And then, under that rainy sky, Chin realized that his next step would be a test and an important stage in his life. Everyone gathered at Devon's house to support him at a difficult time and express their grief. Everyone was grieving the loss of his mother who passed away and tried to share that pain together. His brothers and sisters also gathered to honor her memory and say goodbye. Soon, Chin also came to show his support and pay his respects to the deceased. Despite the difficult feelings, everyone understood that it was necessary to complete the farewell ceremony to the end. They were preparing to escort her to the afterlife, performing all the necessary rituals. People started unfurling sheets in the middle of the rain to create shelter. They made something like a tent, raising the sticks and covering them with a cloth to protect them from the rain. A fire was lit to keep warm and maintain an atmosphere of coziness in this sad event. It was an incredible sight and Chin watched it all, soaking in the moment. He saw Master Guan Nora emerge from the crowd, heading towards him. The mentor advised Chin to wear a raincoat so he wouldn't catch a cold in the rain. After that, everyone lit candles and incense to honor the memory of the deceased, conducting a farewell ritual. The old man approached Devon, saying he was a little late, but was grateful that he had waited for him and thanked Chin for coming. The master told Devon to focus on seeing his mother off to the other world and assured him that he would take care of everything else. He noted that they needed to hurry because they were planning to start the funeral the next morning. The next morning, the rain finally stopped. The sky became clear and calm. Everything was ready for the farewell ceremony and the people gathered in preparation for the mourning ceremony. Some people could not hold back tears, experiencing the pain of loss and trying to find solace. However, others tried to accept it philosophically, understanding what life is, although it was not easy for everyone. The atmosphere was heavy, and everyone's hearts were sad and depressing. 
Master Guan Nora walked past the set tables, watching the gathering. He saw Chin supporting his friend Devon standing next to him. The master understood that this should be enough. The presence of a friend at such a moment is very important. Everyone gathered here to honor the memory of the deceased and show their support to the family. However, Chin still doubted if he was doing the right thing, if there was any way he could have supported Devon better during this difficult time. After some time, the ceremony came to an end, and all the formal rites were performed. All who came paid their respects, and the event drew to a close. Devon quietly thanked Chin for coming at such an important time, and supporting him. Looking around, the young master realized that they had completed everything they had to do. Devon also thanked the master, promising to never forget his support and to be grateful to him always. The master wished Devon to take care of himself and his health, and to look after his brothers and sisters. He assured him that a wise child will always find a way and everything will work out for him. Walking along the lawn with Chin, Guangnora noticed that the boy was holding up very well. He offered his condolences, but noted that one should not spend too much time grieving, as Devon did. He reassured Chin by saying that now they need to focus on preparing for the exam, and not to worry, because everything will be fine. Chin admitted that he was very lucky to have such a master. Guang Nora just nodded and gave Chin a grateful look but said nothing. They returned to the place where they were supposed to continue their studies, but Devon did not return to classes for a long time. It was hard for him to recover from such an ordeal, and Chin didn't know if he should cry at that moment. But he couldn't pretend. He looked at other people crying and asked himself why he couldn't feel the same, chastising himself for it. He even wondered if he should practice crying, but he couldn't. And suddenly he decided to distract himself and pay attention to something else, important. Chin headed to the kitchen where Grandma was making porridge. She was engaged in usual affairs, trying not to think about the sad. Chin came up behind her, needing her warmth and support. Chin decided to ask his grandmother about his mother because he was interested in how long ago she died and what exactly happened. The grandmother did not understand why he suddenly asked, but the boy wanted to know more, so she began to tell. She said that her mother was always sick, and her father tried to cure her by all possible means, even bringing in the imperial physician, but her condition worsened and eventually she died. Chin was then only three years old, as he knew from the words of adults. He asked what kind of person she was and how beautiful she was, trying to restore her image in his memory. The grandmother replied that his mother was extremely beautiful the most beautiful girl not only in the city, but also in the whole kingdom. She recalled that even when she was sick, her mother would not let go of Chin, and her father had to forcefully take him away from her. Grandma gently put her hands on Chin's head, trying to comfort him. She remembered that he was very young then and could not understand what happened, so he does not remember it. Chin couldn't understand why he didn't remember her face at all, even when they played together. The grandmother again explained that he was very young, and because of that, he could not remember these events. However, it seemed strange to Chin that he did not remember even his mother's face at all, because he always had a good memory and felt that he could not forget something so important. After these words, Chin noticed that an expression appeared on the grandmother's face, as if she was not saying something. She assured that there was no reason to hide the truth, because she had always been his devoted nanny. The grandmother began to make excuses that she was not lying, but the situation remained strange. She admitted that once when the servants called him crazy, she couldn't help but defend him. She insisted that no one had the right to say such terrible things about her boy, and if someone did, she was ready to defend him to the end. She said she had nothing to hide, and if he didn't believe her, she would be disappointed. It could be seen that the grandmother may be pretending, but she does it very convincingly. Chin began to suspect that perhaps the grandmother herself was hiding something, or convincing herself of something and realized that he had to find out the truth. His grandmother insisted that his mother loved him very much and always took care of him. But Chin felt that something was wrong. If she was as kind and beautiful as her grandmother described, why couldn't he remember her face at all? However, even trying to understand, Chin could not understand why he did not remember his mother's face, because he had his own, which he inherited from her. This misunderstanding did not give him peace, and he even tried to express his grief, straining to cry, but the tears did not come. After returning to his studies, Chin began to spend more and more time there, immersing himself in the learning process. Soon, Devon, his friend, also returned to his studies, although he was still depressed after the loss. He thanked Chin for his support in a difficult moment and offered to continue their studies together. The young master agreed, because there was no other choice, and both went back to work. Studying took up an enormous amount of time, and Chin felt behind schedule. He realized that he had missed ten days and now he could not afford to rest even a day. 
He had to read under any circumstances, regardless of the conditions. Chin did not stop, constantly read and worked, dedicating a long time to it. Winter soon came, and the cold covered the city. Together with their friend Devon, they continued to practice writing and discuss important topics. They memorized the material, checked each other, devoting all their time to studying. Learning became their constant work, and they met difficulties head-on without retreating. One evening, the young master went outside to practice a little. He went to the tree and decided to practice his strokes, feeling that he needed to strengthen his skills. Placing his hands on the tree, he began to accumulate energy within himself. Breathing in the cold air, he felt power fill his body, as if each breath added energy to him. In an incredible way, he began to emit an aura that grew stronger every moment. Power emanated from him, and it seemed that his Dan Tian began to manifest, revealing new levels of power. After that, Chin refocused and began to concentrate his energy, trying to achieve new levels of control. Something incomprehensible, invisible, seemed to be hanging over him, but he felt its presence and wanted to know what it was. Chin tried to release his energy and spread it, but he ran into some kind of obstacle that was blocking him. Each time the process became more and more difficult, and he could feel his efforts becoming more and more strained. He had no idea that he was being closely watched by a mysterious woman who was hiding in the shadows, closely watching his every move. It had been a long time since Jean had started his hard training, and every day brought him new challenges and discoveries. His strength has increased significantly, energizing him to the limit and pushing him to new achievements. Energy overflowed him 100%, covering every cell and prompting him to incredible achievements. His Dantian level began to explode within his body, releasing hidden power and potential. He tried to release this power and show his power to the maximum in front of himself, overcoming the limits. But he still felt weak in his arms and legs. So he couldn't stay in one position for a long time, which annoyed him. Before, there was no reason for this condition. But now everything had changed, and he could not explain it. But now, for some inexplicable reason, he suddenly wanted to do it, despite his doubts. The chakra within him concentrated into a fist-sized sphere, preparing for a powerful release and the demonic account of the young master began to manifest itself, changing his appearance beyond recognition. His eyes were bloodshot and he seemed to be going beyond his limits, losing control. However, on the horizon he suddenly saw the silhouette of a person slowly approaching him. The figure stood directly in front of him, looking at him with its penetrating and mysterious gaze. He looked at this woman with his red eyes and warned, If she is a bandit, she should leave. And even if you're not a thug, get out of here anyway. He snapped at her not hiding his hostility. But she suddenly rushed at him, rushing towards him like the wind without the slightest hesitation. The boy, overwhelmed by his own power, instinctively went on the defensive, preparing to fend off the attack. But she, like the wind, swept past him, deftly dodging his blows and counterattacking. Jin realized that there was an extremely strong martial artist in front of him, and this intrigued him. However, he tried to catch her with his palm strike, hoping to overpower his opponent despite her skill. His pinpoint strike was instantly blocked by her, further impressing him with her skill. She circled around him, playing like cat and mouse, testing his strength and endurance. Jin, trying to maintain his self-control, could not understand who she really was and where she came from. This had never happened to him before, and this mysterious person, who appeared on the horizon, confused him. She possessed an incredible power that surpassed anything he had ever seen or felt in his life. But in the battle with her, Jin felt surprisingly good as if he was discovering new facets of his own capabilities. The girl opened her eye, and her hand began to glow with chi energy, ready for a devastating attack. She charged forward like lightning to strike the young master, leaving him no chance to prepare. Thinking quickly, he made a plan to counter her, so as not to fall under her crushing blow. Bringing both arms against her one, they collided in a powerful duel that shook everything around them, and the entire forest was enveloped by an incredible flash of lightning from their collision forcing nature to freeze. The boy suddenly began to fall, feeling his strength leave him under the pressure of this heavy struggle. He saw that nothing had happened to the girl, and realized with bitterness that perhaps he had been defeated. After some time, he woke up in his room, confused and not understanding what exactly happened. He tried to remember the events and couldn't figure out if it was a dream or reality intertwined. As he began to put everything together, he tried to find a logical explanation for what had happened that night. His master woke him up saying it was time for school and asked him how he was after his long sleep. What does a long sleep mean? After all, it was not a dream for me, he thought, but the master did not understand what was being said. Jin asked the master how he got home yesterday, 
to which he replied that he didn't know because Jin usually came home late. The master did not understand what Jin was talking about, and advised him to wash himself and go to study without delay. He realized that something was not clean here, and something mysterious, beyond the ordinary, must have happened. During classes, he could not forget that moment that constantly popped up in his memory, not letting him rest. The event that occurred was too real to be a dream. He was sure of it and could not do otherwise. But why did he wake up in his room as if nothing had happened? It confused and worried him. Devon noticed that the young host was acting strangely and asked what was wrong, hoping to help. Jin replied that it was nothing serious and suggested that they work separately because it would be better for both of them. In his mind, the boy knew that the silhouette of the shadow was stronger than him and he just watched until nothing happened. And the fact that the enemy did not use his advantage annoyed him even more, causing him anger and irritation. Master noticed that Jin looked tired and out of breath and advised him to rest and regain his strength. The boy told the master that he felt as if he had been running all night without stopping, and he did not understand why. Guan Nora believed that it was only a dream, and under no circumstances could a master carry someone else's burden for him. But Jin couldn't believe it. What was going on then? Guan Nora suggested that the inner strength was too weak. But what does weak mean? After all, I'm doing quite well, thought the boy in surprise, not understanding his words. This was not enough for the master. He believed that Jin was still far from true mastery and needed more effort. Jin remarked that the master should lie less, because he was tired of lies. And he himself felt an incredible power inside himself. Guang Nora left, saying that the boy should not take it too seriously and worry too much. After all, he tried and already used his inner energy before, stopping to rest while climbing the mountain. And all these are manifestations of inner strength, which is not easy to use and requires time to fully master. Guang Nora remembered how he had trained him to increase his stamina, and soon Jin was strong and able to withstand the surges of Qi. This meant that he should have been using his swordsmanship all this time, but he had wasted too much energy chasing the unknown boy. Now he must learn to use physical force and asks his master to help him in this difficult task. However, he did not fully understand where he could get the necessary information for his further studies this time. It was necessary to talk to the father, although he had never done anything before and did not want his son to learn martial arts, but it was absolutely necessary. One day when he was drinking in a bar, he had an opportunity to learn more about something that interested him and could help. He invited one guy to have a drink with him and inquired about his services, hoping to get some useful information but he explained that he is not such a strong master and is not going to show off his strength. However, Guan Nora believed that he had good potential. If he tells, I will buy him a good drink. This man was using physical force, and it wasn't that difficult. But if it is about the training of a young master from the Li family, he can get into trouble with one word. Guan Nora begged him to tell with all his might, promising a reward for valuable information and complete confidentiality and he decided to simply explain the meaning of these words, without revealing too much and keeping the secret. Thus, if he tells, the master will be able to explain to the boy, and then he will cope with everything himself, using new knowledge. It was necessary to continue practicing with the sword, improving your skills every day. Each day the training became more and more successful in the hands of the young master, demonstrating his growing skill. He was closely watched by members of Devon's family and were amazed at his agility and maneuvers. It was immediately noticeable that this young man has incredible talent and potential. Jian, noticing his friend's reaction, suggested that he try it himself. To keep Devon's brothers from distracting him, he asked them to prepare food. Jin asked Devon how he was doing with Dan Tian, if he had increased in size since Devon couldn't heal him. But how is that even possible? The boy was surprised, because all this time he helped him to improve his weak and frail body. Devon tried, as he had practiced meditation before, it was easy for him to control his energy and sit still. But if he tried, something should have appeared. Where is she? There was no warm energy. And if he really tried, then there would already be some result. The feeling of warmth during meditation is not bad. However, Devon kept trying because if he gave up, it wouldn't help him in his studies. Then the young master had an idea. He realized that Devon was missing something and he needed to try it under the waterfall. Just believe me, said the young master. Soon you will have grain. After all, cold water does a great job of awakening that grain, although it seemed rather strange to Devon. One night, the drunken master, Guan Nora, came back from the bar, singing songs. He was sure that the information received would take his student a lot of time, and therefore it was necessary to teach him more slowly. Jin saw him from a distance and noticed that the master had drunk a lot. 
Guan Nora noted that his student had grown up and was now worried about him, but he wasn't just late. He was very late. The drunk master began to molest him because he came with a new idea, and in any case, he can teach him right now. Guan Nora felt that his student should learn this immediately. They would be learning a new one-inch punch. The strange name seemed like a drunken raving from the master's words, and Jin didn't know whether to believe him. However, the master did not stop and continued to talk about this blow connected with the release of internal energy. That's how you have to activate it, said the master. And if you look, you'll see what I've done. Jin noticed that the master just touched the tree and understood that he was very drunk. Guan Nora claimed that he didn't just touch the tree. He hit it and it was shaking now. He repeated it again, causing laughter from the young master. Jin reacted to this with some regret because the master really drank a lot. He decided to play along with him and admitted that it was great. The master continued to teach him. He was forcing him to use his inner strength to master a new technique in order to properly learn how to release energy. He needs to master this one-inch shot. This technique is applied at a finger-length distance, which makes it unique. That is, the master meant that there was a way to use internal energy at a distance of one inch. Exactly, confirmed the master. And this is a real secret technique for me. But Jin believed that if he used this technique, he might lose. After all, his fist was much more effective than he thought, and hitting with a finger did not bring the desired result and seemed useless. It was clear that more practice was needed, although he roughly got the point. Looking at his master, who started dancing drunkenly, he couldn't help but smile. It was clear that he needed to be looked after, because he could barely stay on his feet. The boy, lifting the master in his arms, felt that he was very light. Guangnor was pleased that he was being cared for, but he was worried because the master still had a lot to teach him. It is said that humans are selfish by nature, so let the master remember to take the medicine and we will discuss the rest later, Jin said. And you can't take alcohol with medicine, Jin pointed out. But the teacher didn't hear him because he was already asleep. Therefore, there was no choice but to take him home. Fortunately, the master was a little lighter than an elephant, and Jin was able to carry him. At the place where the young master struck his blow, a trace of his energetic influence remained, the existence of which he did not even guess because it was incredible. The next morning, both of them and their friend actively plunged into their studies. However, they were planted separately because they believed that this would be more effective. Soon, a loud sound rang out on the street, attracting everyone's attention. When Devon turned, he saw the young master's face, focused and determined. When he came closer, he noticed that the boy was tapping his finger on the table. Gene made this sound with his finger as he tried to practice the one-inch punch. However, when he struck with his fist, the energy almost broke the table in half. Devon, watching Gene, decided to try to practice this stroke as well. Not understanding the reason, he could not perform this technique successfully. Therefore, he decided to continue his studies, despite the difficulties. Despite the intensive training of his friend, he did not give up. All this time, he was thinking about only one thing, how to perform this difficult stroke. It may be a one-inch shot, but it takes a lot of practice. Punches were effective and brought the desired result. However, the effectiveness of the finger strike was not noticeable and seemed to be ineffective. He felt that sooner or later he would succeed and continued to practice hard. Unbreakable faith pushed him not to give up and move forward, and he was sure that one day his efforts would bear fruit and he would master this technique. Boring lessons continued without change, plunging Jin into the monotony of everyday life. So Jin decided to go outside to get some fresh air and relax. Suddenly, behind the door, he saw a silhouette similar to the figure of his father. The boy asked, Father, what brings you here? The father noticed that the son studied hard and kept many books in his room. Although Jean doesn't understand everything the first time, he studies diligently, and this pleases his father with his determination. Having invited his son to sit down, the father noted that preparing for the exam is not so easy if he understands what it is about. Jin replied that even if everything is not clear now, he will master the material in time, because there is still time before the exam. The father hopes that the son will study successfully because he is the only heir, and after passing the exam, he will get a position in the administration. Jin thought about it. He had never had such conversations with his father before, which meant his desire to see his son as an official. He promised his father that he would do everything possible to meet his expectations. Since he decided to study, he does not think it is bad to become an official. He also wants to inherit the business and will do whatever it takes to do so. The father only wants his son to live the way he wants, enjoying life and doing whatever he likes. However, Jin insisted that he wanted the same as his father and would not disappoint him in the exam. Hearing these words 
Mr. Lee got up from his chair with a slight smile. He told his son, It doesn't matter what the outcome is. I still believe in you. Jin understood that if he became an official, he would have to postpone martial arts for later. One day, while walking down the street, he accidentally bumped into a certain peasant. He, apologizing, seemed very upset by this accident. Jin was eating rice and felt that he was not getting any energy from it even if he continued to eat. He needed to eat well, but they brought some worthless food. Because of this, he lost his appetite and could not eat anymore. Suddenly, a grandmother appeared, who emphasized that the boy needs strength so he should not skip a meal. Jin hadn't expected to see her here. He said he had already eaten a little, but she insisted that he had a lot to do, so let him eat properly. She asked the maid to go and prepare the food again. But no, she herself will come and prepare meals for the young master, and let the maid tell the cooks to gather and go home. Jin asked Grandma not to worry or make things difficult for herself, but she was sure that he would only continue to eat when she started cooking herself. When she asked if he would eat what she prepared, he of course agreed. It was obvious that the young hostess was having a hard time, but what exactly was bothering him? Jin admitted that he just wasn't in the mood. The grandmother replied that she would do anything for him. She assured him that she would continue to believe in him as a young master and asked to eat everything while it was hot. Watching him eat, she understood that this had not happened for a long time. But why did it suddenly happen? What is he busy with at the moment? What worries him so much? Meanwhile, Guan Nora was at the head of the clan and told him some important points. Hearing this, the clan leader was furious and wanted to solve this problem immediately. The owner, stopping him, asked, What do you want anyway? Guang Nora replied that he wanted Jin to not be prevented from practicing martial arts. However, the Lord claimed that he always supported his son and never stopped him, even in martial arts. Guan Nora did not understand the reason, but it seemed that the Lord did not like that his son was learning martial arts. He tells his son to focus on the exam, and that's why his son immersed himself in books. The owner should know how his son needs attention and love, and he only uses him for his own purposes. Mr. Lee realized that this insolence was already crossing all limits. Guan Nora insisted that he was not mistaken. After a conversation with his father, the boy refused to study. And if you are wrong, you will receive the punishment you deserve, added the Lord sternly. At this point, a bitter argument broke out between them, and tensions grew. A confrontation that could turn into unpredictable consequences. Their keen eyes met like lightning bolts filled with tension. But the owner decided to reduce everything to a joke, diffusing the atmosphere. He just stood up from his chair, showing calmness, and thanked the master for taking care of his son Jin. The master understands that his son is full of enthusiasm. And if such a situation arises, then the master wants to teach him to use his physical body and focus on it. But when he becomes an official, his passion may fade, and now he can achieve incredible results. And a father should not stop his son. Lee understood what the master was trying to say and took it into consideration, realizing that there was no reason to interfere. Lee told Master Guan Nor to just go about his business, and there's no need to ask or demand. Just go, he added. However, the master decided to say the last word and ask for one last favor. Jin slept in his bed, unaware of any impending trouble. Nothing portended trouble and the night seemed peaceful, but suddenly an incredible thought dawned on him that changed everything. He did not understand how he had not thought of this discovery before. Taking the sword in his hands, he quickly got up from the bed, full of determination. It had been so obvious to him all this time that he wondered at his own blindness. But only now he finally came to this idea, and it inspired him. On this moonlit night, he went deep into the forest in search of answers. With his sword at the ready, he arrived at the very place where it all began. He wanted to meet the person who appeared before him then. Get out! I know you're here! He shouted, breaking the silence of the night. But no one answered his words, and only the wind rustled in the branches. He continued to exhort, Come out if you want to have fun! We both know that I will be the next boss. He suspected that the person who attacked him was a bodyguard hired by his father. And at that moment, a woman appeared on the horizon, like a shadow emerging from the darkness. Turning his head, he saw her silhouette, mysterious and attractive. Jin looked at her playfully, realizing that this person was not his enemy. He asked, When did it start? All this time you were watching me and reporting to my father? Why are you silent? Are you dumb? He continued, receiving no response. Or maybe you're just crazy? But what's the difference? He added without holding back his emotions. He pointed his sword at her and asked, Fight with me! Disappointed to the core, he couldn't believe that he had just lost to her earlier. But now things will be different, he challenged, challenging her. It was noticeable that she was not moving towards him. 
He supposed he might hurt her, but that didn't bother him. It would be their secret, and his father would even like it, he thought. After all, if Jin can defeat her, then he will be able to focus on his studies. But the woman replied, What if the opposite happens and I win again? Okay, Jean agreed. If you win, I'll focus on studying. But if I win, I will devote myself to martial arts, he added with a smile. On this night, their duel took place, full of tension and passion. The boy swung his sword trying to corner her. He wanted to inflict significant damage on her to prove his strength. Tried to break through her defenses, overcoming each of her blows. He directed all his strength and hope into his sword, believing in victory. Now he understood better how to use his inner energy. His sword strike was so powerful that she felt its power. Jean assured himself that today would be different, and he would get over her. He was full of incredible chakra, and everything seemed under control. But the woman remarked, Jean, you are terrible. You don't even think that one strong attack can weaken your sides, and after blocking, you'll open up, she said. And suddenly, she kicked him in the sides, forcing him to retreat. By this, she forced him to step aside, losing his balance. The boy turned to her. Why are you behaving like this now? I've never fought anyone stronger than me, not even at this level, she replied. And that's why I keep attacking, even after everything that's happened, she added. For her, Jin was a real reckless fool, but at the same time an interesting opponent. And he was energized because it had worked once, and he wanted to try again. He was going to seize the initiative in his own hands without losing a chance. And when she swung her leg, he suddenly sat on the splits, wanted to use my inner strength to touch her. With one snap of his finger, he pushed her aside, surprising her opponent. With such incredible force that she felt real pain. Pushing back, she moved back, trying to regain her composure. She couldn't believe that he had mastered this skill and was trying to use it. Until this moment, it seemed to her that it was impossible for him. This guy got stronger right in the middle of the fight, and it looks like he made it up himself, she thought. The woman decided to attack him again, wanting to test his new capabilities. And when her sword swept past him, it acted like lightning. He successfully blocked the blow and held it without giving up. It felt like two strong martial artists looking into each other's eyes. But the incredible happened. The power of the young master began to put pressure on her sword. Her guess turned out to be completely correct. This guy has mastered this seemingly unattainable technique. This made it clear that he was an incredible martial artist. Pushing away from his sword so as not to hurt him, she moved away. It wasn't clear to Jin what kind of attack this was on her part. She said, Every single one of your moves is perfect, but the combos are terrible, and I can lose if I'm not careful. That's why I will be more careful from now on, she added. Pushing sharply off the ground, she flew towards the young master. She delivered a lightning strike that almost cut his sword in half. Feeling this power, the boy even became nervous, realizing the danger. The flurry of blows on his body were inflicted incredibly quickly without giving a break. He could not even dream that such a thing was possible, and at one point, he woke up again in his room full of surprise. He realized that he was lying beaten and exhausted in his bed, and he lost to that girl again, angry with himself. What is wrong with me that I allowed this? The intense training was making itself felt, and Jean could feel the growing strength in every movement. Every day his power grew, and his sword strikes became more and more powerful, causing significant damage. He couldn't forget that moment of fighting with a warrior whose skills had left an indelible impression on him. Despite Guan Nora's words about his lack of strength, the teacher noticed that the boy was angry. Approaching him, he asked, What happened this time? To which the young master replied that it was the teacher's fault. It's stupid to say that without an explanation, said the teacher. But Jin was convinced that if he had been taught properly, he wouldn't have had to humiliate himself. Jin was hiding something, realizing that his attacks were powerless against the opponent, and admitted that it wasn't a dream, but didn't say who he was fighting. He continued, If Guan Nora was a good teacher, he would teach me useful things, and I would never lose to him. Guang asked Nora to just tell the story. But Jin twisted himself. I know the techniques don't work, even if you use inner strength. And then he began to talk about what happened to him, revealing his experiences. That his apprentice, Guan Nora, had come back after being defeated, and he found it quite funny. The teacher did not laugh. Now he understood what he was being taught. He had enough experience and knowledge of strength and skill. Looking at the wooden sword, the teacher noted that the techniques worked at the beginning of the fight, but then stopped. All because the receptions were not quite receptions. You put your life on the line, he said. A single blow from Jin would be enough to defeat an ordinary warrior. But against a more capable one, he would become easy prey. Just like in his dream. But Jin kept repeating that it wasn't a dream. 
and the teacher just smiled and said to think about the next step during the fight. Rookies cherish their first time in combat, he added, stressing the importance of strategy. When you act out of fear, your vision and concentration weaken and you try to hit the enemy. If your blow is not lethal, the enemy will counterattack and you may lose your life, the teacher warned. Blows made thoughtlessly are worthless because the enemy will try to kill you. If you fight without a strategy, you will get hit back. In order for the strikes to be effective, you need to think about all the possibilities. Jean realized that he had to take into account not only his actions, but also the movements of the enemy. The teacher admitted his small mistake. You have learned to put yourself in the place of others in certain emotional states. Take that into account when fighting, he advised. At first, the teacher was worried about him, but he knew that the student studied his surroundings well and that he would be fine. You need to make quick judgments about ordinary people, just like in battle, the teacher added. Everything I say sounds simple, but in practice it takes a lot of energy, he noted. Guang Nora asked his disciple, The main thing is not to be too self-confident. Confidence is a good thing, but overconfidence can turn into arrogance, which will hurt you. But the boy is not naive enough to act like that. And this brought hope to his master's eyes. This instilled hope in the eyes of his master, who saw the potential of the student. Meanwhile, the peasants in the field tried their best to get a good harvest working from dawn to sunset. The owner watched the workers, and strange thoughts about the future swarmed in his head. His advisor talked about quite interesting and intriguing things that worried him. Perhaps the father assumed that the son was worried about the growth of inner strength so that he would not be worried about him. The advisor did not believe immediately, because none of the warriors he knew could develop inner strength in their youth, but his son could. According to Han's report, the young master was already greatly developing his inner strength, and the master noticed this. I think that the master was suspicious of him from the very beginning, but now everything is clear. He said that he will start teaching if he loses the battles, the advisor noted. He easily defeated the young master because he used simple punches and did not perform combos. But each move was so powerful that an ordinary warrior would not be able to withstand even one hit. If he trains, he uses his inner strength expertly. The father had only to decide what to do with it, considering the situation. The owner realized that it was better to do nothing. He just wanted to personally look at it and draw conclusions. The next day, in Jin's room, where he was studying diligently, his master appeared. His master came and looked through the window, watching the student. Guang Nora remarked, Why are you pretending I'm not there? We need to go to training. But the more the young master thought about that fight, the more unpleasant it became for him, and he avoided the subject. Jin decided that it is better not to start a battle if he is not sure of victory, doubting his strength. But it doesn't work like that. Even if you are sure of victory, you can lose, said the teacher, emphasizing the unpredictability of the battle. Sounds interesting. You should read about it. Winning without fighting is the best way to fight, he added. In unusual situations, you can win without a fight. But it would be a lie to say that you can win without a fight at all, Jin remarked. There are no battles that can end like this. And I know that from my own experience, replied the master. Jin noticed that his teacher was driving the point that the situation didn't matter. If a fight started, it couldn't be avoided. But what did you mean when you said victory without a fight? These are the conditions before the battle begins. You must make sure that the battle does not start at all, explained the master. You have to influence the enemy so that he doesn't even think about starting a fight, he continued. This is the strategy of the generals. Even the infantry thinks about what the generals above decide, the teacher added. It is the same in war. Look at nations with mighty armies. When they wage war, the others do not even fight back. That is, you have to show how all-powerful you are to scare the enemy into not even thinking of fighting you. Of course it doesn't always fit, but it's the best way to explain it, he concluded with a smile. Here, the owner appears behind him and says, The informant was right. The hostess's lesson was very good. Jin asks to accept the mentor's words as they are. But the father understands that his son's power is great, and he can take the place of many people. For me, war is a way to achieve what I want. It's like winning without a fight, the father admitted, revealing his thoughts. That's why I didn't want you to learn martial arts, he continued with a hint of sadness. It sounds harsh, but it's true, he added, looking his son in the eye. When a person has no power, he behaves differently. When power appears, she wants to use it. Lack of strength causes anxiety. People are selfish by nature. And when they get what they want... You have to be so powerful that the enemy doesn't even dare to fight. But it requires great sacrifices. 
That's why I thought it was better not to learn martial arts, even if there was such an undeveloped potential, explained the father. Do you think you can beat someone without a fight? He asked, testing his son. Looking at the master, he saw sparks in his eyes, realizing that his son had no equal. He realized that his son has no equal, and his potential is huge. Of course you can win the fight. Master always told you to be a great man. You will pass the exam, you will become great, and you will also become a master of martial arts, supported the father. The father did not understand what the word great meant, but Guan Nora repeated, He must learn the heights of justice and learn the martial arts. Then your student will achieve what he desires. Jin was confident that he would become a wise and strong man, and it was clear that Mr. Guan Nora was successfully mentoring his son. He is actually a good master and is channeling Kang Jin's desire in this direction. But it is too dangerous, father thought. Although the boy was self-confident, his father had no choice but to lead him on the right path. If he decided to do it, let him do it. But before he did, he held out his hand in support. I believe in you, as I always have, he said, squeezing his son's hand. The boy was moved by such words. If his father supports him, then everything will work out for him and he will be successful. Then the Lord decided to leave, leaving his son with his thoughts and goals. He understood what he had been told but words were not enough to accurately describe the situation. As his son tried to spread the power through Kang Jin's meridians, it caused concern. This person does not know martial arts, but he knows about the danger and even makes it possible. How to explain it? Does he instinctively know this, this teacher? Thought the father. Anything martial arts can't be put off any longer. We need to solve this now, he decided firmly. After some time, the young master met Master Song, full of expectations. His full name was Kyung Seong but he had not yet fully agreed to take the boy as a student. So just call me master for now, he said. The young master expressed his respect for him, because his father had done everything possible to invite this person. He trained in martial arts in the mountains, so he was not familiar with Gang Ho. The minister spoke about his abilities. When asked if he has good skills, the minister replied that he accompanies them when delivering goods for production, and they heard that he is stronger than the leader of the escort. Mr. Nora stood behind. Master Song asked who it was, but he hurried to introduce himself. My name is Nora. I'm from the Guac family, and I was watching over this boy before you came. He introduced himself. He felt the incredible energy of a great warrior from this man. He asked what kind of martial arts master Sun possesses, because Guac Nora had heard that there are two types of masters. Internal and external. The concept of a master is subjective. You need to separate internal and external energy said Master Sun. It's all about distinguishing between martial arts and maintaining balance. Nora couldn't quite understand it, but he taught the boy to run every day. That is, of course, good. Even in the Shaolin Temple, students fill their vessels with water, the master added. And it will take time for the young master to climb the mountain, and that means he is well trained, he continued. Master Sun said that martial arts are a master's secret, so Mr. Nora should not stay here. Feeling shameless, he apologized and left. As the master left, he waved Kang Jin to try, but he understood that this master was no stronger than the previous one. The two of them were left alone, and Song asked him to show him something. The boy, standing on the training ground, began to emit an aura. Only his new master watched him silently. He began to combine punches, showing off his skill. Then he showed a lightning kick. The main thing was the generation of Kui energy in the hands. This sight was quite interesting for Master Sun. And then, during a duel on swords, the master dodged his blows. Analyzing his position, he had time to turn and counterattack. Some of the sword strikes penetrated his defenses, but the combat experience of the master made itself felt. Some of Master Sun's defensive techniques made an impression on the young master. He noted that the master is a real expert. Despite this, looking at the results of the young master, he wanted to take him as an apprentice, but only for a few days. After training, you had to have a snack. Master Song went to Mr. Lee where a table was set for him. He braced himself, and his father couldn't help but wonder how he managed it. Then Master Song, having finished milking, showed his hands. Hard burn wounds were visible on them. Given his inexperience, there's something missing, but he's got a pretty high level of internal strength, he said. The master explained that he should be approached with a special approach, because the boy has an incredible talent. If you train him and help him properly, he will become an outstanding specialist, he added. His father rudely forbade him to do so. He had invited him precisely because of his yin channeling skills. He must charge his inner energy, and then the son will consider him a master and trust every word. But how can a master limit his talent instead of developing it? asked Sun. 
But the father was convinced that he was the only one who could be trusted, and asked not to refuse his son. Master Song could not accept this decision. He looked into Mr. Lee's eyes with a hint of pity, but he still agreed. If the internal energy exceeds my yin direction, then nothing will work, and there will be consequences. We need to make sure that Kang Jin doesn't find out that his power is being suppressed, he added. The master agreed that he would accept it anyway, and apply yin channeling to Kong Jin, forcing him to resign. But the master does not know whether the boy will accept it, because he has achieved certain results. At that moment, the father thought of one person. There is one way to solve all this, he said. Jin, hearing this information the next day, was amazed. Master Song said that he had better not train anymore, especially when it comes to inner strength. You take a risk, and you should always be careful when you use inner energy, he warned. When you learned it, you were reckless, which is why your inner strength is so fierce. But Jin understood that this was some nonsense. He had not had any problems until now. I tried to train, and Master taught me how to develop it properly, he countered. And I don't agree with that at all, and I can explain why, added Zhang. But Master Song explained, It is dangerous. There's a big difference when you do different things. If you were training inner strength under a waterfall, maneuverability in the river in the winter, and all the while I was training calmness lying on the bed, then I had the feeling of wandering on impassable paths over and over again, he said. This seemed absurd to the young master, but this is a completely new kind of training that Master Song was trying to convey to him. To demonstrate what he had been through, he showed his scars that were proof of his training. If you feel a strange pulsation in your body, it's a sign of key blockage, he explained. Jin couldn't agree with that because when his energy was the size of a grain, he was able to build it up on his own. But Master Song could make such a power disappear with just one finger. The genie, looking at him, began to get angry and said, Just try it. It's my body and my decision. And then, when they faced each other, the master wanted to prove how much greater his power was. He focused his energy into his finger to break it. Pressing the acupuncture points, he wanted to block her. An incredible feeling of pain passed through the young master, forcing him to clench his teeth. The sensation was excruciatingly painful, piercing through every cell in his body and leaving behind a searing trail of agony he had never felt before. It felt as if something inside him was starting to tear apart, tearing him apart from the inside and causing an indescribable pain that was hard to put into words. He couldn't tell if it was a sharp pain or a searing heat that engulfed his entire body, robbing him of the ability to think clearly and concentrate. But everything around him seemed to be failing, falling to pieces before his eyes, and he felt himself losing control of himself and the situation. Master Song thought to himself, this boy had reached heights he had never even expected. An extremely talented young man, capable of surpassing all his predecessors. He partially understood his brother, but with such a talent, it was better to let him continue to learn martial arts, because it would be unfair to limit him. And he extended his hand, using the one yin direction fifth technique, hoping that it would help in this situation. Activating the wave, he pierced the boy's energy core with a powerful force, trying to affect and stabilize his internal energy. He had no other choice. They have gone too far. And what will happen next, only heaven knows, and fate itself will order their paths. After a while, the young master asked with concern in his voice, Are you finished, teacher? Trying to understand what was happening to him. But he did not feel whether the teacher had finished or not. His senses were dulled and his consciousness seemed vague. Squinting, he realized that his energy core had greatly diminished, and this caused him worry and doubt. Now it would take him a long time to grow it back, but why did it decrease? This question troubled him. Master Song believed that the student would now realize how sluggish his training had been, and it would teach him a valuable lesson. The guy felt out of sorts, embarrassed and confused, not knowing how to react to the situation. Master Song promised to teach him his inner energy from A to Z so that he could defend himself and use his abilities properly. But it was all wrong. Of course, it's not so bad that the core is gone. He'll just concentrate on studying to restore it. It was time for him to go to work. He said goodbye to the master, deciding to take matters into his own hands. As he walked, he was surrounded by numerous thoughts that did not give him peace. He thought about the future and what he should do next. If he starts practicing with this person, enhancing his inner energy, what will happen to his previous master who taught him everything? After all, it was he who taught him everything he knows, and to refuse him would be treason. In those moments, he supported him when it was most important, and was there when everyone else turned away. Motivated and encouraged to do more and more, overcoming the limits of own capabilities and opening new horizons. Even if his learning was at times useless, 
crooked, or dangerous. What his master taught him should not be so devalued, for it is part of his path. And it doesn't matter what others say, he knows better. He had reached a level where there was no Dantian at all, and that was not bad at all. Even though it's completely gone, it's only a matter of time before he can start the process all over again. He's been through it before, so it won't be difficult to do it again, and he'll prove him right. Just like his master who always believed in him. Near the residence, Master Guan Nora was pacing back and forth. Unable to find a place for himself, anxious for his student. He could not calm down, hoping that everything would be fine with the student and that his fears would not come true. But why did everything happen so suddenly? Even his father knew. And what he thought he understood, but that didn't make it any easier. Then the young Master Jin appeared and asked, What are you doing here, Master? Surprised by his behavior. The Master was worried that Jin might be in danger. But he replied that nothing was in danger for him, except perhaps the school. The boy walked, holding a book in his hands, immersed in thoughts about future exams and tests. But suddenly he stops, as if he remembered something, and turns to look at the master, to see how Master Nora behaves, watching him with anxiety and worry. This is rather strange. And he turns to the master, trying to understand the reason for his concern. I am your student, and if that is the case, you don't have to think about who will teach me, he said, with confidence in his voice. And, of course, he should think about it because the responsibility for learning lies with him. At this point, the boy continued on his way, deciding not to delve into this conversation. A wonderful place for studying is on the banks of the river, where silence and tranquility help to concentrate and deepen knowledge. Many books were read, opening new horizons of knowledge and expanding his horizons. Numerous tasks were solved, strengthening his intelligence and preparing him for future challenges. Devin reads the books over and over again, not wanting to do what the young master tells him, showing a certain stubbornness. Jean states that there are times when even he doesn't want to do anything, and that's normal for everyone, of course. But Father provided us with a good place to study, and we should take advantage of this chance, he stressed. The exam is only a few days away, and they need to work hard to achieve the desired results and not let down expectations. But these were the words of his master. He always said that Jin was very lucky, and advised him to hope for luck. But you have to think before you say things like that, Devin pointed out cautiously. But this was the whole meaning of his master, to trust fate, but not to forget about efforts. After a while, the carriage arrived, ready to depart, and this marked the beginning of a new stage. And the young master, together with his friend, returned to his father, where he wanted to thank him fully for his kindness and support. Father understood that they were both trying, and regardless of the results, he would be pleased with their efforts. He accompanied his sons, wishing them success and blessing them on their way. The young master wanted to tell his master that he was being treated and did not go out into the cold taking care of his health. But he felt better after using Mr. Chong's ginseng. The genie told his master, If you're going to drink, at least buy expensive alcohol, he jokingly advised. Nora covered his mouth. Enough talking about your master. But it was obvious that he was just worried about him. It was clear that the boy was genuinely worried about him, and it was touching. They promise that they will come back with a good result to live up to all expectations. The carriage leaves, the boys go to the capital for the exam, full of hopes and excitement. With a look of hope, Master Nora sees off his student, believing in his success and possibilities. He believed that he would try to put his mind at ease and he looked forward to his return. For a long time they rode in a carriage, contemplating the scenery outside the window, which changed one after another. And already in the evening they felt tired from the road, wanting to rest and gain strength. They needed to pitch their tents to spend the night and prepare for the next day. And the next day, set off again. Getting closer to your goal with every step. All this time they were reading books in the carriage, immersed in learning and repeating the material. And they tried their best to prepare as best as possible, not wasting a single moment in vain. Soon they arrived in the provincial city, which was to become the place of their trials. They really liked the place, enchanting with its beauty and atmosphere, even watching the hustle and bustle of people. You could see that it was wonderful here, and it inspired them. Rumor had it that you could have a good time here, take a walk. But Devon insisted that it was better for him to look out the window and not be distracted. But we're here and we might not be coming back, so we'd better just take a walk, Jean suggested with fervor. But Devon replied that he would rather rest here. He doesn't want to walk the streets and offers to invite someone else if Jean wants company. He simply waved his hand and refused to leave, remaining true to his decision. So John decided to go on his own, despite his friend's dissuasion, and set out for new adventures. Going out to look at the coast in the evening, Jean enjoyed the view. 
It was clear that many beautiful people were strolling through this city. They came for a reason and shared their impressions with each other. The city was huge, but despite this, he had no particular purpose for walking. Walking along the coast, he heard the cry of one of the boatmen. He offered him a boat ride. For a small fee, he will be able to enjoy various views of the city. Jean wanted to ride a nice boat and decided to give it a try. The boatman said that he usually accepted payment in silver, but he would make a discount especially for the young master. The genie took silver coins out of his pocket. The boatman realized that he was the son of a rich man. Seeing the money in his hands, the boatman was amazed. Finally, they set sail and moved forward. The boy looked around, admiring the scenery. He noticed a boat of rich people nearby. There, on a nearby boat, were courtesans. The boatman said that compared to other cities, their skills are different. If the craftsman bargains well, he can bring the price down to a few silver coins. But there are girls who can demand a hundred gold for time with them. It does not depend on beauty or charm. If the young master wishes, several can be invited to the boat. Not only will they be with him during the swim, but they will also stay afterwards. The boatman offered to invite them now, but the boy did not think it necessary to pay women for such a thing. He saw only shame for their behavior. It was clear that the young hostess was not interested in this, and he invited musicians to spend a moonlit night with beautiful music. The word exquisite sounded attractive, so the young owner even thought about it. The master once told him that when he was young, he wanted to become a refined person, but life was cruel to him. For Jean, the word fancy meant being rich but lazy. Perhaps the master will like it when he tells him about it. So the boy was generous and gave the money to the boatman. He was very happy to see this money and a spark lit up in his eyes. The boatman decided to quickly find the best musician. They were already sailing with music on a bigger boat. The young master waited for a long time and did not understand where the boatman had gone. He switched with another boatman because of this man's status. Some people were riding with him and discussing something. It was clear that he did not invite them. Jean noticed that the boatman's eyes changed when he saw his money. After that, the crew changed and many young men entered the boat. Now, they were sailing where there are fewer people. It is probably clear what will happen next. Everything develops according to the trip, and this is not how the master taught him. He realized that these guys had decided to rob him. There's a big difference between when he does things he's good at and when he doesn't. And this is wrong. He will belittle the tower that he and the master have been building for decades. The young master decided to say to these guys, even if you say this is an expensive place, 10 silver is too much. If you could invite the courtesans, why didn't you do it sooner? Why are you here? Besides, we sailed far from the shore. Then the boatman realized that the fish was beginning to worry and assured her that everything was fine. But they are already very far. How long does he have to wait? It was clear that the young hostess was not brave enough, and they got up from their seats. They told him bluntly, If you give us all your money, we will bring you back to land safe and sound. But it was quite funny for Jean, because it would have been easier to drown him. And behind their smiles, they did not see a normal opportunity. Jin understood that it must be because of their recklessness. They have a lot of confidence, because they can kill or pardon someone. Or maybe they haven't decided what to do with him yet. Then this stout boatman said that he decided to make a porridge with him. This guy must have lived a long time off his parents' wealth, so he can't just die without giving his elders what they need. But the young master often listened to the master's stories that thieves are smart, and he only meets stupid ones. He understood their plan from the beginning, but he did not run away and did not react in any way. The bandits realized that he was trying to deceive them, but it was already too late. Even if he knew everything, this guy was no match for them. Jin realized that their intentions were simply ridiculous, similar to the crying of a child. The boy had always known that people are greedy creatures and cannot be underestimated. But after hearing it, I realized that they didn't do it out of greed. It was clearly their job as far as he knew. Then they attacked, determined to answer him only after his death. One of the bandits swung his sword. The master deftly dodged this blow. Dodging, he hit him back, and flashed past them as if nothing had happened. Looks like luck has deserted these boatmen, and I promised the master to return safe and sound, he said. The blows of these people continued, although they lost one fighter. He simply evaded, because he promised not to harm people. But this did not extend to those who tried to kill him. Then he swung his leg and neutralized several participants of this adventure. They fell on the boat, and one of them gathered his strength. He wanted the boy to die sooner. But Jin's eyes lit up as he looked at them. After some time of battle, these scoundrels lay on top of each other, smashed to pieces. Jin just went for a walk, but he didn't think he would have so much fun. That boatman looked at him and screamed in pain. 
The boy put his foot on him and began to press so that blood came out of his mouth. He looked at him like a maniac who had finally experienced what he loved so much. He had waited so long to feel this feeling. These boys were crying and begging him to stop, but the boy swung at them with their own weapon and wanted to deal a devastating blow. But the moment the boy waved his hand, the bandit began to cry and beg for mercy. The guy didn't seem to pay attention to it, but he remembered the words of the teacher who asked him to keep his promise. Although the blow passed by the bandit's head, he fell on the deck of the boat. The boy looked at these scoundrels and understood that he had done something wrong. Since all these guys were trying to kill him, it was an excuse to fight. It was absurd to sympathize with them, because they tried to destroy him. All that remained was to deal with them. But if the master finds out about it, he cannot pretend that he did not know. He does not want to deceive the teacher, but he does not want to leave these scoundrels alive either. He wants to find an excuse. How, for example, pigs are killed for meat. He must find a reason to destroy these villains. But then he realizes that if he leaves them alive, they might try to kill someone else who won't be able to defend himself the way he can. Who knows? Perhaps several of their victims are already lying under the water. Then the teacher will have no reason to judge him when he finds out. And he swings the stick again. But the master's words are in front of his eyes. These words protect these boys, and he has only one choice. He must stop hesitating. Jin felt somewhat uneasy. He stops and does not continue his actions. He sees that these miserable scoundrels are already in a terrible condition. But all the same, a thought grips him. Evil penetrates his soul and he swings the stick again, but stops again without striking. He does not understand. This is a kind of battle with himself. His hands are shaking. It was necessary to solve it somehow and finally get out of this boat. The next day the carriage moved forward. The boys did not miss a single book. They drove through the city and the boy looked around. It was clear that people paid attention to these gentlemen. But in front of their mail, everyone ran in different directions. No one noticed that the boy returned from a walk with a new object. It looked like something stuffed. For a boy, she seemed quite unique and unusual. To Jean, she was beautiful and had a perfect shape. But looking at her, he felt the taste of victory, the taste of blood. Devon takes her from him, saying you need to read. The boy is trying to take this club from his hands. When Devon gets angry, he pushes the boy aside. Devon knows him better than anyone, and seeing something suspicious in Jean's eyes, he focuses on these silly things. Does Jean want to fail the exam? But Jean just wants to look at her and hold that club in her hands. Devon claims that Jean is the only person he can trust and asks him to choose between battle or the end of their friendship. It was a difficult decision, and it was clear that we had to stop. Devon decides to stop the carriage and tells Gina about it. The carriage stops abruptly. When Jean asks what he's doing, Devon explains that he didn't think their ten-year friendship would end because of one thing. Jean stops him, saying he's completely out of his mind and agrees to do as he asks. Devon looked at Jean and believed him. Then they closed the door of the carriage and continued their studies. Although Jean was not feeling well, he continued to read the books. Soon they arrived at one of the best hotels in town. Arriving, Jean asks his friend why he did this. How could Devon talk about the end of the friendship and forget about it? In response, Devon explains that when Jean was walking around the city, he went to see a fortune teller who told him that he was in for a lot of trouble. He thought that Jin was acting this way because of this club that was the problem. John doesn't understand how a friend believes in such things. But still, according to Devon, he read a book called Twists of Fate, written by an unknown swordsman, and became very interested in it. When people learn something good about their future, they are in a good mood, and if they learn something bad, they live in fear for the rest of their days. And what are you going to do here? Such people exist. But they have finally arrived at the place, and this is their new beginning. The next day, everything started with the exam. People concentrated to take these exams because it was an incredible test. Many students sat at their desks and wrote tests. There were not hundreds of them, there were tens of thousands of them, and one of them was the young master, Jean. They did this for several days. It was a very difficult exam, and many will not pass it. That's understandable. Devon had learned a lot, and it wasn't that difficult for him to answer the questions. And it was very difficult for some people. Sheet by sheet, they performed the exam tasks. The evening has already come. It was necessary to finish writing. When they wanted to relax, they said to the waiter, bring all the dishes you have. And after a while, they started the meal, because there were many dishes. And the boy wanted to try all the local cuisine. Devon argued that it couldn't be. There were only two of them. But Jean wanted to taste something delicious and find something new for himself. Devon insisted that they should take it philosophically. 
be grateful that they passed the exam and order as much food as they could eat. The waiter assured them that they would be served all the food available in the kitchen. Soon, everything was laid on the table. The guy decided to drink a few drinks, and Devin was not against supporting him. Different conversations started between them. After some time of feasting, Devin fell asleep. Jin realized that it would be better for him to go with the master, and the two of them would try the local cuisine. Suddenly, the boy heard screams nearby. It was obvious that some kind of situation was unfolding right in front of his eyes, and this time it was unclear what was happening. The soldier asked why he was not allowed into the hotel. The exam was already over, but the facility was booked and there were no seats. This guy called himself a high-ranking person. Even if it's the best hotel in the world, you're not allowed to talk to me like that, he said. But the waiter replied that there were no seats and asked to postpone the banquet until later. The master did not hold back from such an answer and hit the servant. How dare you? Why should I change my plans? Because it cost me a lot of effort to invite these people. He was indignant. Let him go and tell these men to vacate all the seats immediately, he ordered. The servant didn't know what to do, but he saw Mr. Jin nearby. He apologized to him and asked for forgiveness. Jean booked this place because he was told it was quiet, but there was a bit of a commotion at the moment. The waiter explained that after the exam is over, many people are looking for a place. At this point, the waiter asked them to leave the establishment, releasing them from all payment, and asked for understanding and cooperation. Jin understood that there was no reason to be angry with him because he was a simple worker. Then he addressed it insolently. A request should not come from a person who himself needs it. The guy replied that he had his reasons and hoped for understanding, because they had finished taking the exam. He didn't think they needed a place that big, but Jin was sure that it was up to him to decide whether or not they needed it. Mr. Gam was amazed at his answer. Where did he even come from? The boy explained that he wanted to pay all the expenses for Mr. Jin's stay here, but apparently they will not allow it. Then the boy asked the waiter to take Jin to a special room and he would pay for everything. But Jean explained that if they didn't use the backyard, they'd have to evict everyone, because he wanted to be in a quiet place. But if that was not possible, the whole building would have to be cleared. If this man does not want to enter through the backyard, then the building will not be vacated. The servant found herself between two fires and did not know what to do. Mr. Ham understood that all this would be very expensive. He tried to be polite with him, because he is a scientist and not a local. But this gin is too rude, and people who decided everything without asking others are now talking about manners. He asked if they would pay for what he wanted and they promised to do it. But it's not just rude, it's free. Then the boy called him a scoundrel, and Jean forgave him for his rudeness and asked him to stop humiliating innocent people. And if you do, you'll have to pay me. You have to pay for me, I guess. Since you rent the building and the rest of the hotel, I will not stop you. Just don't disturb my rest. The boy was indignant and attacked him with his fists. The genie told him that if he took even one hit, he would never be able to move his arm again. The guys behind Gammon stopped him. They wondered what he was doing, but he had a problem and he was solving it. Gammon notes that Jin is high-minded, and this is his final warning. He won't just keep quiet. Jean didn't care whether to be silent or to speak. Gammon decided to take a chance. Even if it disgraced him, he would fix Jin's face. His hand flew towards the young master's back. He stopped and immediately wanted to counterattack. He pushed Gaiman aside with his back. He had heard that some people enjoyed emotions, and this boy showed it. Gaiman was amazed because he thought he was a scholar, and this guy was studying martial arts. Then he drew his sword, wanting to show this brat his place. Jin laughed. Raining your sword at an unarmed person is proof that you're worthless. The guy screamed out of anger and attacked. But as he approached it, his hand was stopped by some unknown force. What is this man doing? Why did he raise his sword at Jin? Someone thought. The boy realized that this man had met him somewhere. They met in the preliminary exam, and he stopped this guy's punch. He stopped that punch and told Jin that he had seen it before. He introduced himself as Kang Jin, and he also remembers him well. And this guy's name is Jin Ho. It can be seen that they have a very good memory, because they remembered each other at first sight. Jin Ho asked the young master if he was also taking the exam like him. It certainly is. Jin Ho said that Jin did well in the preliminary exam, but the results are not yet known. Didn't you know? He asked what happened. Why did they use martial arts against each other? The boy realized that he would not be able to resist two high-ranking people and immediately retreated. Gu Meng said that they argued because he was asking them to leave the establishment. But the word argued is not to call it. Jin Ho explained to his friends that this young master had passed the exam and now wanted to take John's exam. 
The people who came with the gentleman were happy to see him, because it was an honor for them. Jin knew in his mind that he didn't really want to meet them, but he pretended to be interested. Jin Ho reported that these people were all famous sect heirs, and acquaintances with them might be necessary. He understood that this was a good way to get to know each other. There were many famous girls from various influential sects in this company, and they noticed that Jin was quite handsome. Jin Ho didn't stand still and offered to go somewhere to have fun. In such a situation, his friend will stay here, and he will go to another place. Of course, one could not agree with this. But the young master ordered the servant to bring Devon a bed so that he could rest. And Jin went with these guys, masters of martial arts. Since it became more interesting for him to live, maybe they are stronger than him, and he will have something to learn.